started. Mic check, mic check. Silence, please. Mic check, mic check, mic check. Please take a nap, play aloud. नहीं माइक पे फर्क पड़ता है ना अप अप माइक चेक my check my check my check rolling silence please good morning everyone this is dr mamta sharma organizing secretary for the international short term training program isttp2 with a chosen topic on impact and panacea of environmental pollution the past present and future scheduled to be held from 28 to 26th april 2022 signing in from the campus of raj rishi government autonomous college alwar which is popularly known as rrc on the behalf of our patron and principal and from the organizing committee i welcome you all to the 6th day of isttp2 welcome every morning with a smile look on the new day as another special day from your creator another golden opportunity to complete what you were unable to finish yesterday be a self starter let your first hour set the theme of success and positive action that is certain to echo through your entire day today will never happen again don't waste it with a false start or no start at all you are not want to fail aap sabhi ka international short term training program ke chhote din बहुत बहुत स्वागत है अभिनंदन है माँ सरस्वती ज्ञान और चेतना का प्रतिनिधित्व करती हैं, वे वेदों की जननी है माँ सरस्वती को समस्त ज्ञान साहित्य संगीत और कला की देवी माना जाता है माँ सरस्वती की आराधना करते हुए हम इस ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम की शुरुआत करते हैं या बिगनिंग दिक्स डे ऑफ आई एस टी टी पी टू बाई रिमेम्बरिंग गॉड एस सरस्वती एंड वर्शिपिंग हर एंड सीपिंग ब्लेसिंग फ्रॉम हर a small and fast recap from the fourth and the fifth day of isttp2 recap of the fourth day it started with the 14 key note address which was delivered by dr subhash chandra who is head of the department zoology mds university ajmer rajasthan india after that we had 15 key note address which was delivered by dr ajay kumar gandhi who is assistant professor of chemistry in government college of arts and science orangabad maharashtra india after that we had 16 keynote address which was delivered by dr satin vinod head department of environmental science and nlm college of forestry shu ats prayagraj uttar pradesh india this was this was then followed by 17 keynote address which was delivered by dr rajendra pohit who is presently head of the department of zoology at government nugar college bikaner rajasthan india this was then followed by 18 keynote address which was delivered by dr yahya bakhtia who is a associate professor in the field of fish biology and mammalogy research laboratory department of zoology university of kashmir shrinagar jammu and kashmir india This was then followed by 19 keynote address, which was delivered by Dr. Shankar Subramaniam Iyer, who is a senior faculty and business development manager for the institutional business Westford Group, United Arab Emirates. The fifth uh, day, the fourth day was then concluded by free forum and feedback conducted by the organizing secretary of ISCT. The day fifth was a home assignment day, and the home assignment for the training program was provided to delegates on respective WhatsApp and Telegram group to be completed and sent on the email envtoxicall at the rate gmail dot com. 
I'm so delighted to share with our delegates that we organizers and our judges for the assignment are very happy with your response and sincerity with which you have responded to the home assignment. We are very happy to have you with us as our delegates. Human kind must learn to understand that the life of an animal is no way less precious than our own. There may be days when I can't help an animal in need, but the day will never come when I will say I won't try. Wildlife in the world can only be protected by the love and compassionate hearts in the world. And that is the reason we are here and initiated the dialogue. With the extension of human habitation here and within natural habitats, fragile ecosystems are increasingly exposed to artificial night lighting. The natural light the natural night skylight comes from starlight, zodiacal light, that is sunlight scattering from the dust in our solar system, and air glow in roughly equal quantities. Even a small amount of artificial light interferes with this delicate balance, changing the color of the sky, and overwhelms the starlight. Light pollution has become a worldwide problem as it is gradually diminishing the capacity to observe the stars. This is a new kind of waste, originates cultural, environmental, even energy impacts with unforeseeable consequences. Light pollution is usually divided into two main categories, annoying light and excessive light. Light pollution can also be divided into indoor and outdoor light pollution. The official light pollution definition comes from the International Dark Sky Association and states that light pollution is any adverse effect of artificial light, including sky glow, glare, light trespass, light clutter, decreased visibility at night, and energy waste. Light pollution is usually occurring in large urban areas and has been shown to reduce the visibility of stars. Light pollution also disrupts ecosystems and can even have negative health effects. Some scientists even argue that ever-increasing light pollution could lead to the disruption of food webs and affect entire ecosystems. This is because the light pollution causes screening of celestial compass for many nocturnal animals such as beetles, moths, crickets and spiders, which can totally disrupt their navigation ability. Light pollution can be decreased with more efficient use of light. More efficient use of lightning would require changing the habit of much of our society. Sky glow over the last city is a major issue for many astronomers across the globe because it obscures stars even in perfectly clear nights. The scientists have calculated that the sky brightens is at least two to four times more normal in large parts of the urban areas in Europe and North America. Light pollution can have Adverse health effects such as frequent headaches, fatigue, increased stress, decrease of libido, and increased anxiety. There were also several studies which claim that there is a link between light pollution and a breast cancer because of the suppression of the normal nocturnal production of melatonin. Light pollution is also believed to contribute to smog. According to the study by the American Geophysical Union light pollution destroys nitrate radicals, thus preventing the normal night time decrease of atmospheric smog. Measuring the total amount of light pollution in such an area is very difficult and complex procedure because the nocturnal atmosphere is not completely dark. Light pollution can be defined as an introduction by humans directly or indirectly of artificial light into the environment. Avoidable light pollution refers to the light flow emitted at night by artificial light sources which are inappropriate in intensity, direction and or spectral range unnecessary to carry out the function they are intended for or when artificial light is used in particular sites such as observations, natural areas or sensitive landscapes. Among all cause causes having a negative effect on night sky quality, light pollution shows the highest immediate risk but at the same time, it can be reduced through viable solutions. Irresponsible lightning includes oval illumination, which makes an excessive and unnecessary use of artificial light, as well as poorly designed luminaries, which cause glare or sky glow. 
the starlight saving time takes into account the time when artificial lighting is strictly necessary dark time saves energy saves our heritage and promotes life quality as well as cultural and scientific investigation the common factor this phenomena is a loss of the capacity to observe the stars together with the unnecessary impacts on people life quality waste energy habitat deterioration and negative effects on wildlife so this was the consequences and uh, effects of the light pollution and why we have so much of light if we talk of legislature and everything and the protection the police say that light stops 80% of the crime so light is a very important factor when it comes to the crime for the safety of the women for the safety of the children for the safety of the society so again we are at the edge we have to decide where we are going to we are saving ourselves and we are ruining our environment so now in the series of environmental pollution disaster today we are talking about another one this let me tell you my dear friends the list is endless i will be sitting here and every time when i'm seeing you i will be coming with one more disaster and when i'm talking to you about one disaster too many are happening around the world so today i am going to talk about the three mile island nuclear disaster at approximately 4 am on march 28 1979 the main feed water pumps in the non nuclear cooling system of reactor 2 of the three mile island near power plant near harrisburg pennsylvania failed this caused cooling water to drain away from the fact from the reactor resulting in the partial melting of the reactor core operator errors a stuck via wall faulty sensors and a design error together resulted in the release of approximately 1000 as much as radiations as during the chernobyl explosion it was so dangerous and it happened in pennsylvania one of the most developed cities of the most developed country united states of america fortunately about 18 billion thuris of radiation that could have released were held by the containment structure around the reactor this caused some advocates to think that serious nuclear accidents will not occur in united states of america however many experts have claimed that only luck kept the accident from being worse the reactor core according to them was only just short of becoming hot enough to totally melt down complete meltdown was only prevented by immediate implementation of safety measures uh it is a very uncertain how much radiations was exactly released at the nuclear accident it is estimated that this was about 2.5 million curies a few days after the accident had occurred all children and pregnant women were evacuated from an 8 km radius of 3 mile island as a safety precaution radiation from 3 mile island reactor has contributed to the premature death of some elderly women that lived in the region dairy farmers reported that many animals have died consequential to the accident and local residents have developed cancers some studies suggested that the premature deaths and birth defects also resulted from the nuclear meltdown the reactor cleanup started in august 1979 and officially ended in december 1993 at a cost of around 975 million dollars from 1985 to 1990 almost 100 tons of radioactive fuel was removed from the site reactor 2 had online only 3 months but now has ruined reactor vessel and was unsafe to walk in therefore it has been permanently closed in pennsylvania reactor 1 was restarted 1985 but many plans for building new reactors of the same type were dismissed later so i leave this question to you all do we really need this kind of situation and thank god it was america who had millions of dollar to to spend to clean up the site but suppose if this happens to developing countries how much loss to the human value and to the uh, animals or the plants would have happened so do uh, write your views to me on env toxicall at the real gmail.com or dr mamta at the rate env toxicall.com the only way forward if we are going to improve the quality of the environment is to get everybody involved 
water and air, the two essential fuels on which all life depends, have become the global garbage cans. What we are doing to our basic needs? What will happen if, if we are just left with one tree and one drop of water a day? So now it's time for our 20th keynote address, which is to be delivered by Dr. Meera Shivastav. Dr. Shivastav has superannuated as a principal government college moon cancer, Bikaner, Rajasthan, India. She had served in the Department of Zoology, Government Dugar College, Bikaner. She had served in the Department of Zoology, Government Dugar College, Bikaner for over 30 years, has and put in over 38 years of postgraduate teaching and research in the field of zoology, especially entomology, besides sheep and camel. She has been convener, board of studies in zoology, member academy council, Maharaja Ganga Singh University, Bikaner, and presently is a member of academy council, IAS University, Sardar Shahar, member academy council and research board, Chadia University, Sri Ganganagar, in the panel of examiner at a number of universities, and vice chancellor's nominee in the selection committee of different colleges. 24 scholars have been awarded ANFIL and 18 PhD degree under her supervision, and three are presently working with her. She has contributed to over 190 research publications published in journals of national and international appeal. Ma'am, this is, this is an amazing figure. Heart is congratulations to you, ma'am. And um, uh, she has represented more than 100 conferences and has visited United Kingdom, France, Scotland, Italy, Thailand, Dubai, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Mauritius, Nepal, Las Vegas, Bali, Indonesia, Paris, and Rome to deliver invited talks, chair, or to co-chair technical sessions, and acted as jury. She has also been online keynote speaker at international conferences organized at China and Bangladesh. She has shouldered the responsibility of being joint organizing secretary, international conference on advances in ecological research, co-chair president of the international conference on emerging frontiers and challenges in radiation biology, co-convener fourth international science congress. She is a fellow, life member of different academic bodies and is a member of editorial board of 22 different national and international journals. Besides, she has been recipient of over 22 distinguished awards and honors. Ma'am, aapka bahut bahut swagat hai, abhinandan hai. And with a lot of gratitude and respect, I welcome Dr. Meera Shivastha and request her to start with the ninth keynote address of ISTP. Ma'am, stage is all yours. Thank you, Dr. Mamta. Uh, I would first like to... <laughs> and... Uh... Before I start with anything, I would just first like to share the screen so that, you know, it becomes easy. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, are you facing any technical issue, ma'am? Yeah, I'm not able to go back to the slides. Ma'am, uh, you have sh uh, you have opened them at the like bottom. Are they yeah, in yeah, your yeah. taskbar? So One what you have to do is you have to click on the arrow at the bottom of the screen on your meeting on your meeting screen. Bottom of the yeah, an arrow and upward arrow, small upward arrow. Yeah, you have to click on that, then you have to select share entire screen. I'm able to do that now. 
is it coming no ma'am not right now share entire screen then select the screen and click share full screen right yes, yes ma'am first screen. Correct. correct yes ma'am and then select the screen and click on share yeah has it come now no ma'am not yet it says you are meet google com is sharing your screen but ma'am we can't see it right now okay uh, ma'am what you can do is you can try and rejoin and maybe then it will work because uh, it's showing from your end but it is not coming to us ma'am Is with me. Ma'am, you can either mail it to us and we will display it for you. You just have to tell us next and we will do that. Don't worry about that, ma'am. arrow is actually not depicting anything uh, am i audible muskan hello yes ma'am you are audible and you can see, yes ma'am you are audible and you are visible as well when you will click on that arrow it will show three options it's, it's, actually, it's, it's not highlighting itself right now Hmm? Ma'am, it won't highlight itself. You just have to click on that. It won't highlight. Yes, when you will click it, then it will start working. It's not working right now. Is there any other option? Uh, Ma'am, you can send. Uh, you can mail your uh, presentation to us, and we will display it for you. Ma'am, your voice is breaking. I think I'll rejoin and then do that. Okay. I'll, okay, I'll ma'am. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Yeah.
Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? It was, yeah, yes, ma'am. You're audible. Yes. Yes. Sharing. Is it come out? Does the screen come? Uh, no, ma'am. It's not coming. Uh, ma'am, you have to click on that arrow. It will show three options: your entire screen, a window, or a tab. You have to see, click your entire screen, then select that screen and click share. But ma'am, it's not it's not showing to us, ma'am. Yeah, that's the issue. Ma'am, you can WhatsApp okay, me or mail us. Neither way is fine. I'll have to, I'm trying to, I'll, I'll mail it to you, yeah. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am, uh, right now we can see a screen that shows that you are presenting, but there is nothing coming on that screen, ma'am. Okay. Is it coming now? No, ma'am, it's not. So I go back to the mail. Maybe you can.
ma'am you can mail us the uh, presentation ma'am Ma'am, your mic is muted. Ma'am, kindly unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Hello? Yes, can you yes. hear me, Dr. Mamta? Is there yes, anyone else who can speak by the time, you know, because I'm taking a much time, maybe if anyone else is ready with the presentation? I'm trying to. Ma'am, our speakers will come at the at the scheduled time, of course. Ma'am, don't worry. We are going to like wait for you definitely. Kindly don't worry about that. You can take your time. We're just going to do something. Yeah, please, Ma'am, to carry something. More than 30 years on from the disaster that made its name infamous, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant still holds an uneasy fascination for many. The events of April 1986 have recently been dramatized in a HBO series. But what really happened? And why did it send shockwaves throughout the world? The Soviet Union invested heavily in nuclear power after World War II, and the VI Lenin nuclear power station, 10 miles to the north of Chernobyl, had become operational in 1977. There were four RBMK nuclear reactors at the site, each capable of producing 1,000 megawatts of electric power. On the night of the 25th of April 1986, sleep-deprived plant workers ran a series of tests on Reactor 4 during a period of routine maintenance. They wanted to see whether the reactor could still be cooled if the plant lost power. But they violated safety protocols and several power surges occurred inside the reactor. It led to a chain reaction of explosions powerful enough to blow off the steel and concrete lid. With the reactor's core exposed, radioactive material spewed into the atmosphere. 
Official reports claim that two plant workers died in the initial explosion, but some estimates put the number closer to 50. Dozens of firefighters called in to extinguish the flames were also hospitalized with radiation sickness. With the Cold War still going on, the Soviet Union did all it could to avoid the disaster gaining international attention. It was 36 hours until orders were issued for the neighboring town of Pripyat, built for plant workers in 1970, to be evacuated. By the time airborne radioactivity was being picked up at Swedish monitoring stations, the Soviets Uh, Ma'am, we have received your presentation and we are playing it from RN. You just tell when to show the next slide, okay, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, kindly unmute yourself. Okay. Is that okay now? Shall I start? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Am, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You're audible. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Mamta, for a very nice introduction. And once again, I'm really, my apologies, and I'm very sorry for the technical issue. I must say that, yes, I'm overaged and not into the modern technology. Uh, so, to start with, the respected dignitaries, my co-speakers, delegates, faculty members of Farrar College Alva, participants, a uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, first and foremost, once again, I would like to uh, thank the organizing uh, committee, including Dr. Mamta Sharma, who's been taking great pains and has put up all her efforts towards organizing this kind of uh, uh, short-term training programs and uh, I know I hats off to her the way she's working day and night so I start with my presentation the topic of uh, this time that is the second uh, short-term training program is impact and panacea of environmental pollution the past present and future and actually because I'm an entomologist uh, not an entomologist but a student of entomology and uh, in my previous uh, talk in the part one uh, ses uh, session, I spoke on pesticides. Actually, uh, my because I'm a um, student of entomology, I'm mainly concerned with insects and pesticides. So if you talk about the major pollutant of the environment, I think the pesticides are one of the major pollutants which is contributing uh, to environmental hazards. So I chose this topic uh, uh, to speak on this, that. Uh, insect pest management timeline and newer technologies because it said past present and future so what has been what have been we using for the insect pest management in the during our earlier times what actually has occurred during the past which has resulted in such an enormous hazard to the environment through the pesticides and what could be the newer technologies what could be the suggestions for this so i would be uh, emphasizing on this may i have this insight please So just talking about uh, the estimated that the, when did the insects originate? So they originated on Earth about 480 million years ago in the Ordovician and about the same time the terrestrial plants appeared. Many of the early groups became extinct during the mass extinction at Permo Triassic boundary, the largest extinction event in the history of the Earth around 252 million years ago. And mod most modern insect families appeared in the Jurassic around about 201 to 145 million years ago. If we talk about the origin of the insects, may I have the next slide, please? And uh, very, you know, it's very 
amazing that this is an amazing fact rather the pests have attracted human attention from the birth of civilization and plagues of locusts caused devastation in the ancient middle east and were recorded in tombs in ancient egypt from as early as 2470 bc and in the book of exodus in the bible and if we talk about the mention of insects in the bible uh, there have been so many mentions of insects if we say locusts 46 mentions grasshoppers 9 cricket 1 flies 13 gnat 7 maggots 4 moths 10 bees 4 hornet 3 ants twice flea twice and a caterpillar once so these are the citations the mentions of the insects in the bible we find may I have the next slide please so the best known examples of god punishing people with insects are found in the bible in the form of plagues sent to punish early egyptians as many as 5 of the 10 plagues in the bible are directly or indirectly attributed to insects such as flies lice or the locusts next slide please now just a glimpse of the biblical plague i could get this photograph next This again is a plague of locusts in ancient Egypt, so in depicting that uh, scenario, you can see the locusts all around here. Next slide, please. So, in the biblical tale, Moses is a prophet and the leader of the Hebrews, whom the Jewish people consider to be their ancestors, warns the Pharaoh, uh, who is the term the ruler, term called as Pharaoh of Egypt that his kingdom would be ravaged by plagues if he did not free the Israelites and allow them to go back to Canaan Moses warned the Pharaoh that God will send so many locusts that they will cover each and every tree of the land and eat all that is there to be eaten next slide please again i could get a photograph showing that Moses prays away the locusts uh, next slide please So, given the impact of agricultural pest on human lives, people have prayed for deliverance. In the 10th century, Greek monk Typhon of Constantinople is said to have prayed, "Snails, earwigs, and all other creatures, hurt not the vines, nor the land, nor the fruit of the trees, nor the vegetables, but depart into the wild mountains." This is how they prayed in the earlier times. The 20th century prayer against pests, including the words. by your power may these injurious animals be driven off so that they will do no harm to anyone and will leave our fields and meadows unharmed this is uh, uh, cited in the rural life prayer in about 1956 next slide please so as with locus different gods in different cultures have been prayed for the control of flies in greek mythology the expulsion of flies was credited to zeus heracles or apollo and zeus has been nicknamed as fly catcher the well known example of mormon cricket miracle took place more than 150 years ago when mormons in the valley of the great salt lake planted wheat however the crop was threatened with destruction by wingless catadits now known as mormon crickets california girls from nearby marshes came to the rescue and ate the insects this is how it has been said that they came to rescue actually birds uh, we know we all know eat insects so it was because they found their food in large numbers but earlier it was thought that yes they have come to our the rescue of the mankind in japan fire is considered to have been used with prayers for divine help in controlling insects next slide please just talking about in a single slide significant insect insect pests in history so we know the plague which was infected by fleas again an insect malaria and yellow fever caused by the insect mosquito and of course the cotton boll weevil is one of the most important invasive species and in agricultural production of cotton the pest migrated into the us from mexico in 1892 and by 1920s the pest had infested all cotton growing areas and devastated the industry and the people working in the industry in america so this was the scenario so early as 1892 to 1920 every each field of cotton was damaged next slide please so talking about actually what my uh, main top major topic is methods employed by pest for pest management in the timeline so i would be talking about the earliest to the details uh, next slide please so the ancient greek civilization used fire to chase away locusts to the sea the greek mathematician pythagoras drained the marshes of a cilician town to near clear malaria 
by 300 BC. The Chinese, now see so early, the Chinese also discovered the relationship between climate and periodic biological phenomena and started planting crops at specific seasons to avoid pest attacks. Now, what this is what in our recent term, we call it as cultural control practice, farm practices. So it was so early that the Chinese started planting crops at specific seasons. Next slide, please. Records of natural pest control date back to even before 2000 BC when humans have used pesticides to protect their crops. So it was as early as 2000 BC when these were introduced. The first known pesticide was the elemental sulfur dust by ancient Sumerians around 4,500 years ago in ancient fertile crescent of Mesopotamia. Rigveda, about 4,000 years old, it refers to the use of poisonous plants to control pests. The Romans used sulfur from the fumes from combustion as an insecticide to purify a sick room and to clean the air from evil. So these practices of using uh, substances which are chemicals of uh, to kill or to ward away insects is an old practice. In 1000 BC, the same uses of sulfur were reported by Homer in, Homer in the Odyssey. And uh, today, if we talk about, there are various sulfur compounds which are used as pesticides. Next slide, please. Now, plant extracts such as lemon oil and wormwood and chemicals such as arsenic and sulfur have been used to repel insects since very, very long. Scientists discovered that nicotine, certain herbs and arsenic repelled insects and these substances became major pest control instruments. The Victorian free trap developed in about 1840 was a popular instrument of the times and Franz Bruckmann, I, uh, I, could, I did skip that line, but it was Franz Bruckmann developed the earliest mechanical insect trap in early 1700. So see the traps and the mechanical uses have been, uh, they've started using very early. Next slide, please. Just to, yeah. Next slide. So Franz uh, Ernest Bruckman, he used fly traps. It consisted of a wooden box baited with sweet attractant and equipped with spring loaded lid. That's the details of the trap. He also designed a flea trap. Next slide, please. I could just this, this get, get this photograph of uh, Franz Ernst Bruckman with that uh, in his hand, he's got the trap and the Victorian flea trap. So these are the depictions of those earlier traps. Next slide, please. As time advanced, experimentation and sometimes good fortune also led to the discovery of other chemicals with pesticidal activity. Early insecticides were plant derived and included nicotine to control aphids, uh, hellebore to control body lice, and pyrethrins to control a wide variety of insect pests. Substances such as Paris green were being used as, as an insecticide to control the highly destructive Colorado pot potato beetle while the copper lime mixture were used to control grave diseases in France. Next slide, please. Actually, it was a vital event, if we talk about in the history of pesticides, which represented the discovery of initial modern pesticide, that is dichloro, diphenyl, dichloroethane, DDT by Paul Muller in 1939. At that time, we considered it to be very good. Everyone was so enthusiastic about it. And his revelation granted him years later the Nobel Prize in Medicine because of the decrease in the damages caused by this pesticide in agriculture and likewise related health. And, but what happened? In 1962, the book Silent Spring by author Rachel Carson elaborated the harmful effects of DDT. And today, we all know what has been the effect of this compound of uh, this chemical and but see although it has been banned because immediately after that numerous states banned the use of ddt in favor of low risk organophosphates and carbamates but what happened later on but still ddt was banned but we still continue to you know discover more and more chemicals and organophosphates and carbamates thinking yes these are of lower risk we have still and the search is still going on we are still contributing more towards the synthesis of organic compounds to be used as insecticides and pesticides. May I have the next slide, please? John Bean, a California almond farmer, invented a precious sprayer uh, for the efficient application in crops. In the later parts of the century, steam, mechanical, 
and horse driven pesticide spray equipment were developed by the 1900s the first pesticide legislation the federal insecticide act fia was enacted to protect farmers and consumers from the fraudulent manufacturer setting standards to ensure quality pesticides uh, so that these pesticides quality pesticides were produced so we have been using pesticides we have been inventing chemicals but yes to make use certain sprayers certain instruments certain equipments were also in uh, they were invented but the federal insecticide act also was framed in 1900 which was a very firm step towards conserving and saving the environment next slide please now this is G john bean with his sprayer next slide so horse driven sprayer were used earlier and this is a horse driven sprayer next slide up until the 1940s chemicals derived from plants and inorganic compounds were the source of pest control during world war ii the synthetic compound ddt played a significant role in saving allied soldiers from insect transmitted disease and subsequently was hailed as the insecticide to solve all insect issues what in Hindi we can call as Ramban, Ramban Milyada. At this time, synthetic pesticide production increased significantly and the modern day chemical industry was launched, thus starting a new era of pest control. And this was this era which has contributed significantly to the indiscriminate use of synthetic chemical insecticides which are causing the harm and which have caused the harm rather which has really affected the environment all around the globe. May I have the next slide please? So the DDT pesticide used in the world war second. May I have the next slide please? the 1940s saw the availability of German synthesized organophosphate. Now, this was the time in 1940s that organophosphate insecticides came into existence. Then malathion was introduced at a later time in 1950s and is probably the safest of all the organophosphate insecticides. It still continues to play an important role in mosquito control programs and the US government's eradication programs. Another significant compound synthesized in the post-World War II era was 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid. Now, actually, this is a herbicide, not an insecticide, but it is of great significance uh, as a pesticide, of course. The, its first uses were reported as a growth regulator and was an effective control agent for dandelion, plantain, and various other broadleaf weeds in a blue grass lawn. Next slide, please. Now, later on, a biological insecticide. Now, this is very important. Bacillus thuringiensis, that is what we commonly call as BT, hit the market in 1960 for insect control in lettuce and cole crops. This is a bacterium that is pathogenic to the larvae of some pests, especially Lepidopterus pests. Lepidopterus to which belongs the butterflies and uh, moths. The bacterium contains endotoxins that can paralyze and lyse the insect gut, causing mortality through starvation. So this is how it works. It affects the uh, individual uh, insect. Several generations of BT products have evolved since introduction, its introduction in 1960. Yes, next slide, please. Now, I'm just going to show you slides showing the chronological list of selected significant events involving pesticides. I would be just highlighting. You can just have a look, have a glance at it. Uh, next slide, please. So 12,000 BC, first records of insects in human society. 8,000 BC, agriculture begins. And since 2000 BC, first reported use of sulfur as a pesticide by pre-Romanian civilizations. 1500 BC, individuals practice with different cultural control techniques like manipulating planting time to control insect pests. 1200 BC, first reports of non-selective herbicide individuals in China use botanical insecticides as fungicides for seed treatments. AD 300 then, earliest recording of biological control. Chinese use predatory ants and citrus for control of destructive insects. As early as 300 AD, they started using predatory ants for the control of destructive insects. So biological control started as early as AD 300. Next slide, please. 
In 1649, rotenone was used to paralyze fish in South America. In 1690, nicotine extract tobacco for insecticide use. In 1750, scientists discovered that darius and pyrethrum work as botanical insecticide, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So a list, a long list of since 1880, but in 1892, Canada creates a law that makes spraying blooming trees with chemicals that are harmful to bees as illegal. So here it was in 1892 when spraying blooming trees with chemicals was uh, said to be harmful and was uh, a law was created to say that it is illegal. This should the spraying should not be done when the trees are in their full bloom. Next slide, please. In 1910, passage of Federal Insecticide Act. Now, this was very important. Precursor to today's Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act. Which is, uh, so, this is a very important act. And uh, this was uh, introduced in 1910. Later on, in 1930, farmers started using synthetic organic compounds as pest control substances. So, it, was, it has been since 1932, 1970. And 80. This was the 50 years time when we have been since the, uh, during this time we, during this period we have been using the synthetic organic substances for controlling the insects. Next slide, please. In 1946, organophosphate insecticides developed in Germany was made available in the U.S. 1956, carbamate insecticide carb carbazyl was first introduced. Next slide, please. In 1970, formation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Now, this agency was created, which was responsible for pesticide registration, and which is a need for, of the day because until you don't have an agency, uh, you know, actually to make a law so that which chemicals or which insecticide should be used, what are they harms, so how they should be used. So this was in actually 1970 when this agency came into existence. In 1972, the Federal Environmental Pesticide Control Act was passed and DDT used was cancelled by the Environmental Protection Agency, that is EPA. In 1978, P EPA releases first list of restricted use of pesticides. Even though it released this list, still we are carrying on the use of so many restricted pesticides. In 1980s, EPA cancels many uses of chlorinated hydrocarbon pesticides. There's a long list which has been given by, has been provided by EPA. Next slide, please. So what has happened in recent years? The disadvantages, disadvantages of heavy dependence of pesticides we have suffered. Development of pesticide resistance is one of the most significant disadvantages of their widespread use. The first resistance was found in 1908 when there was a case of Je San Joe Joseph scales resistant to rind sulfur compounds. And since then, hundreds of insects have become resistant to one or more pesticides worldwide. Only a few years after the introduction of DDT, resistance was confirmed in houseflies in Sweden. Within 20 years, more than 224 other insect species were reported resistant to synthetic pesticides. Every class of insecticide has had resistant issue. Today, more than 500 insects, 300 weed biotypes, and numerous plant pathogens have developed pesticide resistant, which is very unfortunate and sad state of affairs. Next slide, please. Just to depict how the pesticide resistance develops, is if anyone is interested, actually, there are res resistant and susceptible strains. When we use the insecticides or the pesticides, the susceptible strains uh, are washed off from the uh, environment. And what happens is the resistant strains are there and they keep on multiplying and reproducing. And that is how uh, their progeny remains and the resistant strains survive in the uh, ecosystem. Next slide, please. So environmental and human health concerns have also become significant challenge to this pesticide use. A major contributing factor to DDT's effectiveness was its long residual activity, but this persistent contributed to bioaccumulation or their ability to accumulate in the fatty tissues of animals. It was found in some situations that the biomagnification of insecticide occur. 
this is when organisms such as birds of prey accumulate chemical residues in higher concentrations than those found in the organisms they consume so as a chain initial consumption is low but they go on accumulating in the organisms and through the food chain they biomagnify or bioaccumulate next slide please just to depict this uh, biomagnification uh, the, the you can see the arrow so uh, the food chain uh, going from the lower level to the higher level showing a ddt concentration in biomagnification next slide please The US Environmental Protection Agency, that is EPA, was created in 1970. The task of EPA was and remains today to implement by regulation the laws passed by Congress in order to protect the environment and the health of humans and other animals. In 1972, EPA banned DTT use in the United States and further regulatory action has been taken against many other pesticides thought to pose significant environmental and health hazards. Now, public concern has paved the way to more stringent regulation of pesticides and changes in the types of pesticides produced. Although this has been because public is more concerned, each one of us should be concerned. After all, it's our health. Next. In 1972, a significant revision of FIFRA and the Federation, Federal Environmental Pesticide Control Act came in. This amendment transferred regulatory responsibility to the EPA and changed the emphasis of the law to protect the environment and public health. In 1988, Congress amended registration provision and required re-registration of many pesticides that had been registered before 1984. Again, the act was amended in 1996 by the Food Quality Protection Act and the Pesticide Registration Improvement Extension Act of 2000. 12. Now, all these acts I'm talking about in just uh, just to give you an overview of what has been in the past, what have been we doing, we've tried to implement uh, laws, we've tried to uh, regulate and uh, uh, talk about uh, the laws to protect the environment and public health. But unfortunately, uh, we are not that strict or maybe, uh, you know, we take some other uh, different uh, attitude towards uh, use of pesticides. Next slide, please. And uh, we, we need to be very responsible. Now, these insecticides which have been used since the past have been given generation, name of generation, generation of insecticides. So if we talk about the first generation of pesticides, these include the toxic inor inorganic compounds like lead arsenate and mercury, toxic organic compounds like nicotine, the plant-based nicotine and pyrethrins. The second generation included chlorinated hydrocarbons, which were synthetically created, for example, the DDT. The third generation pesticides, although the orga uh, organic compounds, but these are organophosphates and carbamates, which are less persistent in environment and more lethal in low dose than organochlorines. The fourth generation pesticides are basically the modified forms of insect hormones that show a greater specificity to the pest or insect targeted. For example, the juvenile hormone analogs such as methoprene, hydroprene, phenoxycarb, which do not kill the insect directly but prevent the development. So see, earlier we used to kill the insect and because we were indiscriminately using various target insects which were not at all the pest were also being killed. Now here we try to save the insect but yes, we make juvenile hormone analogs which prevent the development. So partially helpful. Chemicals resulting in sterility are also a part of a part of fourth generation pesticides. Next slide, please. So just to show you a glimpse of this is a pesticide cycle in the ecosystem. The pesticides are uh, being, you know, the um, you can see a person who is spraying the pesticide. Now this pesticide, it enters the soil. It is through runoff. Through, it goes to the lakes. By absorption, it goes to the lakes. The, uh, aquatic organisms are harmed and through photo decomposition, vaporization, it goes into the environment, it goes into the atmosphere and from the atmosphere through precipitation, it comes back to the earth. So this is just a simple representation, the pesticide cycle. Next slide, please. So major environmental impact of pesticides, if we talk about, would uh, include that the once the pesticide enters into the environment, we have impacts uh, and rather the negative impacts on air, water, soil, animals, and of course, the human beings. Next slide, please. 
there's impact on water, the water quality is harmed, its properties are changed, it has a negative effect on the process of oxygen formation by the phytoplankton, it is, um, uh, the impacts are transmitted along the food chains, they accumulate in the food products, they are, of course, uh, the quality of water, as I talked about, its chemical composition, ex extermination of water insects, and of course, overall, the aquatic ecology is disturbed. Next slide, please. The similarly, it has an impact on the soil. They get into the soil in the form of the residues that can, and then depending on the condition, poisonous chemicals remain in the soil unchanged and retain the toxicity for more or less prolonged time. Persistent use of pesticides can, can th uh, thoroughly undermine the productivity of the soil. And uh, the microorganisms are destroyed, the nutrients are destroyed, and this decreases agricultural productivity of land and makes it vulnerable to desertification. Next slide, please. Definitely, this is very important because we are more concerned out towards our health, our health. Okay, if we are concerned our, towards our health, that also is okay. So now, take care. We to you know uh, to minimize the use of pesticides, or rather, stop the use of pesticides. They can broadly their effect can broadly be classified under two categories: acute effects, which appear immediately or very soon after exposure. Chronic effects, which may manifest themselves many years later, carcinogenic, carcinogenic effects, neurobehavioral effects, and reproductive deficits. Uh, next slide, please. This is just to give you a, uh, what are the impacts. The effects on animal life, the fish kills, and the bird die-offs. Next slide, please. Who can forget the Bhopal gas disaster? in December 1984, methyl isocyanate. This was the methyl isocyanate, the chemical used for the production of uh, uh, carbamate insecticides. So see, you know what, I think no one can forget. So this is a disaster. Next slide, please. Not only this, but in inadequate safety measures have also led to several issues. What happens is most farmers in a rural area are ignorant about safety measures which are very necessary when they apply pesticides on their farm. Next slide, please. I can just show you a glimpse of what actually is and what it should be. Next slide. See, you can see the first photograph. This is how we're using insecticides. Second, parallel to it shows how it should be. Similarly, in the second, you see face to face. They are spraying the pesticides. They don't know the harm. They are so ignorant. So this also is very important for human health. Uh, you see on the right side, then that is uh, depicting how it should be done. Next slide, please. So undoubtedly, the pesticides have been affecting, uh, they have been an effective weapon of man for the management of agricultural pests. They have increased the agricultural production, have led to a drastic reduction of insect pest disease and weeds. Yes, on the one hand, they have done this. Definitely, we can say. But the continual and discriminate utilization of pesticides has increased the issue of which we are concerned. Environmental pollution, poisoning of animals and wildlife and livestock, ecological imbalance, health hazards to human result from direct or indirect uh, exposure, which I have just talked about, development of resistance um, among insects, biological amplification of biological magnification, I talked about, creating resistant pests, super pests, new pests, and what not. They have, you know, the whole of the globe has been harmed by the, this important pesticide or a pollutant. Next slide, please. The rise of Munich. Now, this is a recent uh, development. After DDT was condemned, other synthetic pesticides, organophosphates and carbamates and pyrethroids came into use. And now, until neonicotinoids arrived on the scene, these are shortly termed as neonics. Neonics offer some benefits over the other pesticides. They don't bioaccumulate. They are less toxic to mammals and birds. They break down relatively quickly and are amenable to more efficient application methods that use less pesticides than traditional polio sprays. And these are commonly used as pesticides in the world nowadays. But then, after all, they are insecticides. These are toxic to bees. Now we have come to know that they are toxic to bees. And mind you, bees are the most important uh, insects because they are the insects that are used in pollination. So if we talk about the agriculture, because we are dependent on agriculture, the food we get to eat is from bees produced. And if the bees, they are harmful to the bees, then one day we are going again 
later on after a few day a few years we would know that oh we started because now we are facing the problem of ddt which is still uh, continuing and later on we would then think and then we will repent that oh why did we use neonics at all but yes uh, this, this is the scenario next next slide please so talking about the new newer methods of pest control now what are the newer methods of pest control because uh, we have been using what can be done uh, even i came across when i was trying to you know uh, prepare for this lecture that there's such new methods which have now come into existence next slide please the pest control industry is continuously examining novel technologies and products that will improve the way to manage and prevent pests. One method is the integrated pest management. Here, various methods are brought together and then used uh, simultaneously for controlling the insect pest, which is really good. Here, we can use the crop rotation method. We can use resistant varieties. We can use biological control. We can use mechanical and physical control simultaneously. And of course, not making the use of chemical pesticides. Uh, so, uh, and we can get an effective control over uh, the pest insect. Then the biorational control. These are the challenges of pest control for the 21st century, such as biological and control con uh, con controls, use of pheromones and biopesticides. Now, use of pheromones and biopesticides are method of biorational control. I'll just talk about in my next slide. Bacillus thuringiensis, that is BT based. Uh, okay. So, Identification of new insect targets for discovery and development of novel insecticides. Now, this is another method. Development of novel insecticides with selective properties acting on biochemical sites or physiological processes present in specific insect groups but differ from other organisms in their properties. Developmental processes such as the insect growth regulators I talked about, Eggdyson agonists, juvenile hormone mimics, and chitin synthesis inhibitors. Now, these developmental processes can be restricted by identifying these target sites and targeting directly on these uh, target sites. Neonicotinoids. This again is used uh, by the targeting the site. Transcription factors belonging to the basic helix loop helix family play essential roles in a wide range of developmental processes of higher organisms including insects so these are actually the sites transcription factors which can help in uh, use of insect growth regulators or the synthesis of insect growth regulators which can uh, be used as a novel insecticide next next slide please other receptors that could be used as target sites for insecticide discovery are the G protein coupled receptors, which are termed as GPCRS, GPCRs. These receptors are involved in different functions of insect, including metabolism, development, and reproduction. One of the ways to identify GPCRs pesticide target is by RNI screen screening. Now, the RNI screen has was identified quite a few GPCRs that could be useful as target sites for insecticide development. Fursicon is an insect neuropeptide hormone that regulates various processes of cuticle tanning and hardening, that is sclerotization, wing expansion, and the maturation process in different insect orders. Fursicon could be used as a potential target site for the design of novel and environmentally friendly insecticide so what is more important is of course a novel but now this again we say that it's a pesticide but it is environmentally friendly insecticide so this needs to be highlighted next slide please non-toxic heat treatments new methods of pest control are based on low toxic solutions that can be more sustainable and effective than harsh chemicals one such method is to use heat to eliminate insects rentocles endotherm this endotherm system kills insects from the inside through dehydration and damage to essential physiological processes another benefit is that the heat effectively kills all the life stages of insects that is egg larva pupa and adult without needing to go over 56 to 60 degree which is high enough to kill the insect pest rapidly next slide please Not, uh, next slide. CRISPR technology. Now, this is clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. 
Now, this gene editing tool is a method to alter key genes that regulate the fertility and sex determination of insects. This technology has allowed researchers to invent a new effective control technology which can be sa safe, self-limiting and scalable genetic population for a specific species. Now, because this is for a specific species, the non-target insects uh, would be saved from their attack. It has the potential to be developed and utilized for a plethora of insect pests and disease vectors. This technology can be safely used in the field to suppress and even destroy other species. Next. Optical manipulation for reducing sucking pests. Now, specifically for sucking pests, this optical manipulation. Why so? Because many insects are attracted to plants following a series of events, initiating from far orientation and ending with landing on plants to feed and lay. Eggs, how, how they are attracted? For forced finding and flight orientation, insects are mostly optical. You, they use mostly optical or vision cues. And thus, manipulation of these cues in uh, insects can interfere with their orientation and impede insect plant communication. This approach is suitable for areas with high intensity of sunlight during the seasons when sucking pests are, act uh, are active. Optical manipulations can be performed by repelling, attracting, and camouflaging of vision cues. Next slide, please. Progress in management of insect pests of stored products. Of course, this has been mainly conducted by fumigation with organophorous toxic and phosphine. Besides optimization of phosphine fumigation, workers have evaluated various alternatives to conventional insecticides for controlling stored product insects, such as essential oils as botanical fumigants and diatomaceous earth as grain protectant. Next slide, please. nanotechnology we have always been talking about nanotechnology and the utilization of nanotechnology uh, for the development of potent insecticides this is a very new method it is a notion in the field of science and technology that has been greatly developed during the last decade the studies of nanotechnology exploit the unique behavior of materials and structures which are termed as of course the nanomaterials with dimensions of approximately 1 to 100 nm Many of the insecticides are organic compounds that are poorly soluble in water and hence large amounts of environmentally contaminated organic solvents are usually added to the insecticides. So preparation of insecticides as nanoparticles can solve the problem because their utilization allows significantly reduced use of organic solvents and the production of this material as nanoparticle results in substantial increase in water solubility dissolution rate of dispersion uniformity and their efficacy in the field may be considerably improved. So this is a, a newer technology which is being developed. Now, how far it is good can only be known later, uh, years later. Next, next slide, please. Now, the second generation of green products. Since la earlier, it was around uh, 4000 BC in Rig Veda, we came to know about the use of botanicals. Then later on, not many... Uh, insect plant-based insecticides were seen these were all the first generation green products and now since last few years the major focus has been surrounding uh, green products has been from a public health perspective we're trying to do this the demand of green products is increasing and shifting to eco protection nowadays the second generation green products are emerging as they are naturally occurring chemicals the exploitation of such products may be useful for developing ecologically sound pesticides and uh, why I am emphasizing on this is, next slide please. I'm just going, yes, I'm just going to end up my deliberation. Uh, so with this concept, our laboratory also undertook some work related to botanicals for their efficacy as grain protectant against a specific insect pest that was Calosobucus chinensis, which belongs to order Coleoptera and the family Chrysomelidae. We, we used uh, uh, various plants in the form of different extracts, uh, uh, aqueous and organic solvent. solvents, yeah, we, as well as organic solvents. And uh, we studied various aspects of its life cycle. Uh, next slide, please. And we concluded from a study that there are certain plants, because of their biological activity, they have a potential and can be used for pest management. Uh, they can prove to be an alternative, cheap, eco-friendly and non-hazardous uh, substances. And of course, they can be a substitute as against chemical insecticide, especially in the household and storehouses to minimize the infestation. And because we have worked on the brookie, we can say 
that especially to the brocade callus or brocus chinensis. Next slide, please. So, in the end, instead of focusing on whether one chemical or another should be banned, what we need is we should focus on which option is safest to use in the given situation and how to use it responsibly. Uh, responsibly. So, I would like you all to stick to responsible use of insecticides. We may use insecticides. Various novel methods are also using insecticides, but responsible use. If we are using, be responsible. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was so amazing that lecture and uh, like I was spellbound. Being the pesticide toxicologist myself, nothing can be better than that in a, a treat in the morning to hear you. That was just amazing, Neera Ma. Uh, if any questions, please raise your hand so that we can unmute you from here. There's one question I can see in the chat box, ma'am. Uh, we are forgetting uh, the large scale production is needed. Uh, do you agree? Yes. Then what is the solution? Like he wants to say, we are forgetting our original for only large scale production. Do you agree, ma'am? You can see this question and answer. I think he's talking about the yield production, which we cannot um, reduce because we, we need uh, food for every mouth. Yeah, yeah, because that is what I've said. We have, we ourselves are responsible. We ourselves, each individual is responsible. It is not only the farmers which are responsible. Each individual is responsible. If we see something wrong is happening, we should come forward. We should talk to the administration. Why aren't we just taking that responsibility? Why the sole responsibility should be uh, shouldered upon the, the government? The government is doing such. Why don't we come forward, talk to the farmers, uh, make them literate, Try to you know give them the information. This is harmful, and uh, of course, beekeeping and uh, this should be you know uh, we should bring forward these the such things. It's really important. Yes. I think I, because yeah, I can't get the question. Mm. Yeah, it's another question to... like this that we cannot uh, if we stop the use of pesticide, the yield will go down, and we cannot afford that. Yeah, of course. That's yes. what we, we need to That's stop it. That is what I've been talking about, and I don't know how many, but because I didn't repeat the, the things I talked about in my previous lecture, it was also based on this, and I just tried to you know deviate from that and change the whole topic uh, in this present lecture so that it's no repetition. Uh, definitely, we need to. It's a major concern. That is what I've been talking about. Pesticides are the major pollutants, major pollutants. Whether they may be from well, industries, so maybe they were they are from the farmers, whatever. But these are actually which are uh, coming into the atmosphere, coming into the water, coming into the soil, everywhere. These are the, actually the agrochemicals. So, uh, ma'am, I would like to tell you that during your uh, session, there were around 220 participants from 29 countries who were listening to you. And uh, the chat box is full of uh, uh, nice compliments for you. You can look yourself in the chat box, and it is so amazing. And so it's now time to formally thank Dr. Shivastra. Thank you, Dr. Mamta. Thank you so much. And once again, my apologies. <laughs> I think I must have big uh, computers heavy now so that I can give you more deliberations. No <laughs> matter, like very much fine. You can always send it to us. So you spoke about insect pest management timeline and the newer technologies. You so correctly mentioned that pests have attracted human attention from the birth of civilization. Uh, very nicely you made us acquainted with how insects have been an important factor in the ancient history. You spoke about the most miraculous and dangerous compound DDT and mentioned about the world's greatest of toxicologists, Akel Carson. Now she is my hero too. You made everyone understand about my magnification, buying concentration, and what makes pesticides so dangerous compound, and how and what laws are brought in by our legislature to monitor the use of these toxicants. I really like this slide of the pesticide cycle in the ecosystem. It was very, very beautiful, self explanatory. And another slide in which you have shown that what safety precautions should be taken and what we are doing now was very, very dangerous and eye-opening to all of us. You also spoke about new era pesticides, which are acting as a replacement to the organochlorines and your method of pest control. Ma'am, I must congratulate you for a wonderful lecture. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time to be the 20th keynote speaker at ISTTP2. Your presence and wise words help to magnify our cause in the best possible way. Question from Mira, ma'am. 
someone with a question. Yeah, I'm I'm Dr. Rashmi Tiyagi. Uh, ma'am, ko pin karo Rashmi Tiyagi ma'am ko. Ma'am, there's a real Mina. Mina ma'am, there's a question from Dr. I Rashmi. just want to ask one question because it was such a an informative uh, discussion today, and uh, I feel that uh, you are giving us information that there are so much pollution in the plants and uh, all these eatables. So what is the solution right now? We are, we are eating this these things. So is there any remedy which we should take monthly or uh, fortnightly that whatever is the effect of uh, these pesticides in our body after taking the food at home, in hotels or anywhere? Is there any remedy? I want to ask you, Meera Madam, and it was awesome. It was really so much, uh, you know, information to us. That we should. Uh, right. Right. Thank you, right now, I don't, uh, right now, I don't think there is anything of that sort. We can go and test the milk for its purity. We don't have any check for you know checking all these things. We don't have anything of that sort. But uh, yes, awareness uh, should be there so that at least we are whenever we are buying vegetables or we are buying things, we should you know clean them properly with the uh, hot water and rinse. I mean, proper usage should be there. But of course, if you're going to a hotel outside, we cannot uh, assure that what can, how they can, okay. you know, that, that sort of thing is not available. So, uh, because uh, one of my students did a research on the, uh, the uh, farm uh, here, and local farm here, on the residues of pesticides and on brinjals, on uh, lady's finger and so many other vegetables. And we could find them, you know, in good amounts. So... Uh, we know that they are there. Actually, we being because in the same field of science and uh, biology, and we know that they are there. We could only talk to those farmers which are rearing them or cultivating them, saying that please don't use, make use of these pesticides. But you know they won't uh, listen to us. It should. It is from the uh, from the administration that they should come in, uh, uh, and they should you know make some legal. This that they go on for a check every week or every month and see that they are not using pesticides and uh, so that then the consumption is is in that proper way no antidote not uh, not as such not as such <laughs> but thank you we are really thankful to mamta man so and to you that you are uh, my pleasure. My pleasure and and them. Them. we are the educators and i will try my best to just thank you so much thank, thank you so much thank you if uh, if there's one there would be more than you know one will create uh, awareness uh, to so many. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Ajay Prakash has raised a hand. Please, Dr. Ajay Prakash. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to ask any question. I just want to reply to Rasmi, Rasmi, ma'am, I think Rasmi Tyagi. Yes, sir, yeah, please uh, go yeah, yeah, I just want to tell you, uh, there is no solution for pesticide. But one is, ma'am said that Mira Sirvastro, that uh, your awareness, but awareness by yourself is not sufficient. So go, whenever you go for, go to the market, please try to search the organics. Nothing more. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, 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 you can go for that uh, kitchen garden. Otherwise, you don't have any solution for that. Thank you, sir. We'll go for this part. Yeah. Surely. And yeah. even farming. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you, Meera, ma'am. That was so wonderful session. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank so you. So now it's time thank for... You, ma Bye, ma'am. So now it's time for our 21st keynote address, which is to be delivered by Dr. Ajay Prakash Gupta, who is currently working as Associate Professor in CSIR, Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine, Canal or Jammu in a drug test laboratory. He has more than 30 years of post MSc experience in the area of analytical chemistry of natural products and pharmaceuticals. Expertise in method development, identification, validation, quantification of bioactive constitutions of microbes, medicinal plants and tissue culture samples using sophisticated equipment like GCMS, UPLC, HPTLC, LCMS, MS, LCMS, TOF, and HPLC. Area of expertise also include analysis of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic samples, drug metabolites, and their mechanistic study. Published more than 110 research papers in the journals of national and international repute, 10 best paper awards, 31 invited lectures, 
attended 26 conferences, national international, and 11 book chapters. Attended several accredited courses and workshops of awareness program to mention a few. He has worked on the projects to improve the efficiency of production plants and recovery of fallible alkaloids in process helps development of process of manufacturing value added specific derivatives of morphine, codeine, etc. Ma'am, uh, I think uh, this is this is sufficient. I will. Uh, uh, this is one of the. Last time is left. Experience has placed in several committed positions as technical expert committee member. Dr. Gupta, आपका बहुत-बहुत स्वागत है अभिनंदन है हम बहुत खुश हैं आपका अभिनंदन कार्टर. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Actually, uh, problem is that ki today, the, after that uh, day before yesterday, the, you, uh, yesterday there is a uh, PM meeting is there in Jammu. So that is most of the uh, big dignitaries in uh, Jammu from CSIR, including the Director General of CSIR Lab. And today, one of the hands-on training is going on in my institute. I am one of the part of it. That is why I am little bit in hurry. But I know that professors are very, uh, very well known for speaking, and they are very, uh, very good speakers also. So I am also listening. But uh, due to some electricity issue, I am giving this presentation from my home because I have that uh, uh, that is backup system over here. But in the office, there is a there is a uh, it, there is connectivity issue. So I am going to present my. Uh, I think I am going to share my uh, uh, one minute. I am going to share my presentation. One minute. Uh, Uh, I think you you check it. Ma'am? No, sir. You, you can see my slide? No, sir. No? My slide is visible or not? Yes, sir. It is now. It is now. So, uh, whatever, uh, so, uh, I will be a little bit in hurry, but I will try to uh, convince the pupils what we are I'm going to be present over here. Thank you, Mamta ma'am, and thank, thank you, Hukum Singh, also for giving me this opportunity. Uh, because I don't have a chair in the uh, in the in the room, so I am giving this presentation by standing. Okay? So uh, this is my topic is environmental pollution. I know we everybody knows that everywhere is the pollution, but what are the remedies which is nearby us and how we can protect our ourselves? So uh, whatever my slide is changing or not? No, sir, it's Hello. not. No, sir, it's not. It's not changing. Uh, no, sir, it's not. You can uh, click on the slide and you can manually change them. No, no, I am changing manually, but it is changing or not, I just want to know. Though. No, no, sir, they're not. No? No? So I already shared this uh, presentation. Please, uh, ma'am, please load it. Now, now they're moving, sir. Now, now we are on the second slide. Oh. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, oh, sorry, there is uh, some inter uh, internet, maybe some issues there. So, uh, okay, one minute. So, my second slide is there? Yes, sir, your second slide is visible. Okay, yes. so I'm not going to tell anything about it, but I was just tell, uh, tell you that I'm last 30 years, around around 30 years, when I was joined in a private company at that time, I was in the, involved in the very, uh, in the waste treatment plant. So, you can understand that we are talking about the environment. After that, I joined my PhD degree, I joined an inter college for the lecturers, and after that, I joined my PhD degree. After joining PhD degree at that time, I was working the number of the medicinal plant. How medicinal plants helps in the daily day to day life in our our system. So this is my. Uh, uh, there is no need to tell about this slide because ma'am is already told more than this. So uh, uh, just uh, uh, we talk about the what are the health issues with the pollutions. The exposure to high level of air pollution can cause a variety of adverse effects. It increases the risk of basically effect on the respiratory system, heart disease, and the lung cancer. There is a maybe exposure may be short or the long. If the short exposure is for a uh, for a long time, this is also and the, if the long term exposure in a short time also is a very dangerous. More severe impact affects the people who are already ill or suffering from the age-related disease, like heart-related disease, blood pressure, and the diabetes. What are these pollutants? Are the, these are pollutants are nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, volatile organic compound, which is generally called VOCs, dioxin, polycyclic, aromatic carbon, pH, and alkacid. All are these are air pollutants. Carbon monodioxide is also one of them. 
there are so many times to listen then we some people, some uh, poor people are sleep, uh, sleeping in their hut and then suddenly they uh, morning they die because of uh, increase in the winter basically because of there is the increase the percentage of the carbon monoxide once the carbon carbon monoxide is increased in a certain area it replaces uh, oxygen uh, in the hemoglobin so that is why there is a respiratory uh, restrict uh, over there heavy metal is also one of the major issue regarding the human health and then what are the effects of this uh, what are the effects in our uh, among the health issues like the if you talk about the, the child inside the uh, mother womb is the neurological problem including the slow reflexes learning deficiency delay or incomplete mental development in the case of uh, lung disease it's asthma bronchitis lung cancer cardiovascular central nervous system dysfunction as well as if the your skin is very uh, exposed to the that polluted area then there is a cutaneous diseases also so my slide is changing or not anyone no, response no sir they not no sir they not we are on the second slide only oh, one minute no Uh, no sir so anyone can load uh, because i already shared in the mail now they are on yeah now we are on fourth sir oh oh uh, there is just some gap between that uh, there is a gap between the uh, trans uh, changing over okay yeah. so uh, okay now this is the uh, uh, new slide now this is the fourth slide yes sir this is the okay. fourth slide yes okay so uh, what are the more uh, four main sources of the pollutant if you we'll talk about in normal cases in the surrounding that is a power station refinery petrochemicals chemicals and fertilizer industries metallurgical and the industrial plants municipal incinerations in the field talk about the domestic the domestic cleaning activity how much we are phenyls we are using how much rpp we are using how many how many chemical sources we are using are cleaning our houses as well as our class and all, uh, all other things and the, in the mobile if we we'll talk about that the auto mobile car railways airways and other types of vehicles in everything is creating a uh, issue of the environment uh, pollution and the, in the in the case if we we'll talk about the natural sources then the physical disasters such as forest fire volcanic eruption recently you saw that picture i think day before yesterday or yesterday there is a fire in the poland and there is a some fire in the uttarakhand also so these all are the factors which in, uh, create the pollution issue my slide change uh, no sir Hello. no no sir no so if you want we can play it for you from here ma'am actually there is a, there is a some gap between the yeah. during the transmitter yeah it's yeah. lagging yeah sir it's not any uh, maybe but we are lagging. using i am using the optic fiber but still because we are still in india so we cannot do but still if somebody can start playing over there so just want to save time for yeah, yeah. all the so audience so you have sent it to us you have sent us the yeah already sent it is very long back i okay, think sir. half an hour please use uh, last means uh, last uh, ppt uh, means mail because i sent it to three then i corrected something over there so last mail please open last okay, mail sir, i'm sorry just give us a minute, just give us a minute yeah, to because... continue Va and okay. meanwhile we'll play it okay so uh, i'm sorry again uh, i don't know uh, i am not a very good in the it person but i love this but still i am i don't know what to say okay so uh, what whatever ma'am is talking i will add it something more because uh, meera ma'am is talking in action will have a serious situation for human animal plant and environmental health my slide are still visible or not yes they are sir yes they are so this slide is whatever i am speaking this is the same slide no sir in action will have serious situation yes sir no. that 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 is the concept. okay so ah uh, yeah yeah okay so till ma'am uh, mamta ma'am will uh, upload my slide till i will continue okay, okay so sir. in action is yeah, okay what are the issues the serious situation is not only for the human for the animals and the plant as well as well as well as environmental health 
antimicrobial drugs you know everybody that whenever you will go to the any doctor for the fever or for headache for any small uh, issues related to your health what they are they are generally immediately they prescribe in the antibiotics what are the effect of that so these are the what are the antimicrobial drugs these are antibiotic antifungal antiparasitic antiparasites used by the human not only human we will use in the veterinary also not in india in the all over the world used to treat the prevent diseases in human animal and sometimes the food production to promote growth in healthy animals like they use the oxytocin injections in the uh, buffaloes for increasing the milk production antimicrobial pesticides are also used in the agriculture to treat and prevent the diseases in the plant but in the plant but this this uh, means pesticide is from plants is going to the food grains and then the soils and in the water and then directly going to the human affecting the human health also by uh, food chain antimicrobial drugs used in human animal and plant is leading to be the concern rise of drug resistance what was missing in the previous slide is uh, means the previous lecture is that because being a chemist i what are the issue is the drug resistance one of the one of the biggest issue or the biggest challenge in india not in india in the all over the world what are the reason behind that in last 30 years there is no new drug antimicrobial drug discovery is here and every microbial drug take around 20 years to come into the uh, uh, for the market so now from last 30 years there is no new drug is available in the in the market so what are the what are the big concern over there the drug resistant diseases contribute nearly 5 billion death every years the world is rapid, rapidly approaching a tipping point anti antimicrobial needs to be treated infection in human animals and plant and we know will no longer be effective means if you are going for the treatment of any type of infection there is a no drug because if you are in drug resistance and then what will happen we will reach back to the 100 years old medical situation the imp impact on local and global health systems economics food security and food system will be devastating so my slide change or not? Uh, no, I sir, it's not changing. Sir, we have found uh, my, one my presentation place. sent by you, which is on environmental toxicology. This presentation we don't have, sir. We have searched. No, no. Uh, I sent it to this mail. Uh, I will tell you that. Uh, I sent it this mail on? to... One, one minute, ma'am. Uh, I sent it this mail to uh, MM College. No, no, one no, nine sir. five four. No, 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 sir. 5. That is that is not our sir. That is not our mail, sir. Okay, okay. Just tell me that I will forward it. Okay, sir. E N V. E N V. Okay. In V toxic call. Yeah, E N V toxic call. Yeah. Correct, sir. Yeah. Okay. I am sending. Sending. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. So till I am again trying. Uh, now my slide is visible. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. yeah your slide is okay. visible. It is on number six. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is now the this is the new uh, I, when I was making this presentation, I came to know this. This is some new new uh, new issues arising all over the world. The nitrogen level on a decline in a nitrogen rich world. Plants and animals may face consequences. An imbalance in the nitrogen availability has been reported across the globe, with some places having access and other shortage of availability. There is a both too much nitrogen and too little nitrogen on the earth at the same time. And what are the effects on this? Without nitrogen, plant grows slowly and produces smaller flowers in the fruits. What are the effects of this? The leaves turn yellowish and the less nutritious to the insect, birds, and the animals. In human, high level of nitrogen in the groundwater are linked with the intestinal cancers and miscarriages and can be fatal for infants. And researchers are very cautious about this. Sir? Sprinkling nitrogen, yeah. Sir, should we play your slides now? We have received them and can we share them for you? Which slide number? Yeah, yeah, please, 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 please. Okay, sir. And go to seventh slide. Oh, this one, this one. Oh, yeah. No, no. Go back. Yes. 
No, the question is that where is the in the, in the environment around more than seventy percent of nitrogen is there, but still we are facing this issue. So sprinkling nitrogen fertilizers in a region facing a shortage of nitrogen supply may not be the answer. We do not have a good track record for adding nitrogen in the right places in the right amount. Next slide, please. So importance of medicinal plant. Importance of medicinal plants is sustainable. Sustainable human health can cannot be overlooked. Plants have healing therapeutic both the properties, healing as well as therapeutic properties in one or any other organs. Used in several conditions to maintain human health. In sustain sustainable human health management, medicinal plants play a vital role. It is very cheap in comparison to the synthetic industrial form of the medication. Here we'll talk about the drugs which is required for the some serious diseases, not for lot uh, lot not for fevers and something like that. Medicinal plants are threatened as a result of human impact and the uncontrolled wild culti- collections. It is recommended that efforts towards the domestication and the cultivation are essential for continuous supply of supply of uh, these plants. Plants are used in medicine, maintain a good good health. Physical as well as mental. Actually, some uh, notifications are coming in in front of slide, so I am not able to see it on my slide properly. So I can uh, okay. So I will read my slide. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, you you I will say that change, then you will change it. Okay. Yes, sir. Because uh, because notifications are coming, so I am not able to see those slides properly. Okay, so okay. that last line, importance of medicinal plant is that the plants are used in medicine to maintain not only the good health, healthy physically, mentally as as well as especially, as well as treat specific condition and the ailments. Next slide, please. Change. Okay. Yes, sir. We have changed. Yeah. So this is for Mamta ji. Uh, this is Delhi and the surrounding areas are living under. Not only for Mamta ji, for others also. Delhi and surrounding areas are living under a terrible burden of the toxic air, enveloping their lungs as well as day-to-day life in general. So what to do? We do apart from pancaking or apart from limiting to your exposure to the hazardous out outdoor airs or or installing the home air, air purifiers. There are some Ayurvedic that. Way that you can prepare your body to fight air pollution, hazards. So herbs you should start consuming daily to fight pollutions. Number one is aloe vera. Contains helpful, helpful plant compounds, antioxidant, antibacterial properties. Accelerate wound healing, reduce dental plaque, help treat cancer sores, reduce constipation, improve skin as prevent wrinkles and lower blood sugar. Next slide, please. Yeah, no. This is amla, rich in vitamin C. In amla is a powerful antioxidant and help build resistance against air pollutant. Vitamin C provide essential shield from hazardous environmentals, help in regeneration of the vitamin E level in your blood stream. With the degrading air quality, important to build our immunity stable and strong. Amla helps in the boost our immunity naturally. Promote immune function. Amla juice, great juice for vitamin C because vitamin C is a water soluble. That is why this is very good for us because it is easily go to the your blood stream. Support help health digestion. Promote health uh, heart health also. Increase hair growth and improve the kidney health also. Next slide, please. So here is the combination. This is the combination of uh, that is below as well as tulsi. Tulsi is everywhere. Below is everywhere. But people, you have to identify that the wonderful benefits of the tulsi are not unknown. However, the below is relatively lesser known, but ingredients equal to the equal effect. This fortification combination is effective anti-allergens, which is very common in the air pollution and the other type of pollutions. That helps. Look after element arising due to the air pollution. Tulsi protects our respiratory tract, but its anti-inflammatory, anti-bacterial properties help minimize the effect of air pollution on the environment as well. The combination of these two herbs help protects the internal organ and tissue against the chemical stress of the industrial pollution. A sort of this, a sort of uh, this juice. This sort you can take it in a in a in a this way, not in a other way also. A sort of this juice twice a day is a good for the boosting immunity also. Next slide, please. Yeah, now this is also again we have come to the, the, the that is healthy, which is 
uh, everybody is using that not only for the cosmetic purpose and, and for the as a spices as for the uh, uh, means for there you everybody knows that in the marriage there is a healthy rasam is also over there so uh, i think mamta ji also go through it so turmeric are healthy, healthy all around tonic for the almost every health element with the it open wound and the common cold it it means as a super to combat all pollutant related hazards health in the protection of the toxic effects or inhaling pollution air polluted air great choice to cleanse your respiratory tract a mixture of of two potent herbs is sort of this combination take in the morning would be help neutralize the harmful effects of the smog is very common in the winter times okay go to next slide please so those uh, this is uh, not for the everyone this is only for those who are suffering from uh, with the uh, the weight issue uh, they, they have a overweight or they are suffering from the diabetes or they are pre diabetic or are very cautious uh, Uh, for the calories, so this this plant, which is called is which is called uh, oh, stevia. This is called the stevia rigoriana. It is very common now, and now uh, is the substitute of that sugar. Uh, that is sugar tablet, which are all already coming in the lot. As per mate, is already in market from last fifty or hundred years. Stevia is an intentionally sweet testing plant that has been used for sweetening the beverages and the milk tea since sixteenth century. but because of some uh, political issues in the world this plant cannot be as a alternate of the cane sugar so natural sugar uh, this is the this contains the natural sugar which is called the stevioside as well as ribotioside which can which is 200 to 300 times more sugar than the table sugar 200 to 300 times more sugar means how much quantity is required for one cup of tea and the stevia is classified as, as a zero calorie Sugar is the alternate. Uh, sugar is the alternate for the people who are suffering from the diabetes. And the US FDA is already appear as a for the risk to use a moderate moderation. Stevia leaves is also the anti-hyperglycemic, anti-oxidative, hypotensive, nephroprotective, hepatoprotective, antibacterial as well as anti-bacterial. Next, uh, are you going to shoot? Uh, oh, okay, no, it's okay. Bro. Oh, it's okay. 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 Now this is one of the uh, 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 when you will you vis visit to the US FDA website. This is mentioned over there is a, which is the highest uh, means the fiber containing seed which is called the flax seed. Flax seed is a reliable source of vitamin B. Vitamin B, a group of nutrients that known to to making your hair grow stronger and healthier and more rapid rate. Eating flax seed daily helps your cholesterol level low. Label me seek it will protect. Flax seed is one of the world's oldest crop. Flax seed rich of the iron, fiber, proteins, omega-3 fatty acids, and everybody knows that omega-3 fatty acid the source is the cod liver oil. Those who are uh, vegetarian they do not take their cod liver oil because this comes from the fish. Okay, magnesium and the phosphorus is also present in the wheat, very good quantity. And this uh, that is one table uh, table spoon of uh, means flax seed contains around 1.8 grams of omega-3 fatty acids. Benefits protects against the cancers, rich in fiber, reduce blood sugar, and manage your weight also. Next slide, please. So this is chia seed. Again, this is more or less equal to the flax seed. This is not from uh, very common in India, but it also contains the omega-3 fatty acid. Contains lot of minerals, boosts immunity system, uh, immunity system, improves bone health, improves health, means heart health, rich in oxidants, and also in, uh, very helpful for the reducing that your chronic inflammation. Next slide. Broccoli. I think this is uh, we we know this is a green uh, cauliflower. Now you can see that what are the benefits over present over there. Carbohydrate only the six gram in the hundred grams. Fat is only point three gram. Proteins in two point six gram. Don't go with this all. What is present over there? Go to thinking in the this way in the right side of that is skin that it prevent cancer, promote hair growth, stop premature aging, regulate blood pressure, help. Promote health bones, heart diseases, brain power, weight loss, support detoxification as well as eye health. Next slide, please. This is saffron. Why I am talking about saffron? Saffron is now uh, is a very old spice, but uh, the costliest spice in the world. 
the cost is around two to five lakhs rupees per kg. And nowadays, this is uh, uh, is a natural source which is used by the most of those who are suffering from the Parkinson disease or memory related uh, related issues. So, saffron is a golden color pungent stigma of the atom, the cocos, which is only in India, very only the one area which there is going in the Srinagar, which area is called the Pampo. Only that area where you can get it a good quality of uh, saffron only. So, what are their what are these benefits over there? This fight the cancer, this use in the memory loss, is in the hair growth, treat the cold, and is also used for that that uh, for the means you can say that. As a cosmetic, people are using as a cosmetic by putting this small uh, stigma into the uh, milk and put it uh, place into the face, and this will affect give you that uh, good skin also in the face skin. Next slide, please. So this is uh, again the everybody is know about that dalchini, uh, cinnamon. This is also have a very good nowadays. This is used as an anti uh, This is used as an anti cancer. Uh, the cinnamon is used as an anti cancer. And the second most popular spice in the United States and the Euro. And what are the benefits of over here? Around six gram of cinnamon daily have decreased the triglyceride, LDL, cholesterol, as well as total cholesterol, which is very common in now India because we are used, we are generally have a food habit of the fried food habits are very common. We are using the puri, we are using the chole bature, and lot of oils we are using. And that is increasing about the cholesterol also, and because of the bad habit, because uh, the food habit is also increasing about cholesterol. So this also not only this control the cholesterol, this is also uh, maintain your blood pressure also. Next slide, please. So this is a plant which is very old, but uh, when uh, uh, that is uh, Daren Modi visited to the Ladakh at that time, we talk about the Tutor handle where this is. Booty, which is card is in the Ramayana, is the uh, means you can say that is Sanjeevani. But so many uh, contradict over here because this plant and the so many plants is called it as a Sanjeevani. But this is the plant which have a future. And uh, in the in the Euro, they are doing the captive farming also. And the what are the molecule present over there is the tyrosol is the molecule which is potential, which is called the Rudolia root. And what are what are the uh, means? What they have this plant have is that this have the property of anti anti stress, anti depressant, neuroprotective, nerve tonic, antioxidant, adaptogen, cardioprotective, anti fatigue, and the cardiopulmonary protective also. Next slide, please. So this is another one of the food uh, which is very common in the lay lay area. Uh, this is a high altitude crop, so it, it is grows only in that area. And uh, so many people listen about that. The real is also launched on leberry juice over there. What are the beauty of this plant is that this improves the blood pressure and lipid control, the improve the quality of blood pressure as well as the lipid. This is the cardiovascular, and this is the this is the food which contains the highest one of the vitamin C is around four to six hundred milligram vitamin per hundred grams. And this is also the this fruit is also this skin of this fruit is also the radio protective also, and this is very good in cosmetics. So not only these leaves and flowers are used for the treating arthritis, gastrointestinal ulcer, gout, and the skin rashes, kind of the infectious diseases such as the measles. Next slide, please. Oh, silaji, this is very old uh, means. Uh, 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 Ayurvedic uh, in the medicine, which is not actually the a plant, is not a fruit, is not a root, is coming out from that, from the blackish brown powder excluded, obtained from the high mountain rocks in Malaya mountains. This is generally we call the vitality. This is used for the vitality only. Not this is not only used for the vitality. This is used for the some other have a very good medicinal effect other than vitality because this contains the humans and the humic acid and pulveric acid. What are these are these? This is contains on more than 84 minerals, which includes the silver, copper, zinc, as well as iron. Next slide, please. 
what are the benefits now you can see you can use in the as an anti anemia you can use a male reproductive health you can use the muscle fatigue you can use for the cardio protective is a anti ulcer anti inflammatory anti oxidant used in the alzheimer disease also and the, this is very good for the people who are living here in the high altitude like in the le and ladakh what are the issues arises over there the high altitude problem is that that is retention of fluid in the lungs and this protect from this and not only this this is uh, this is prevent from the hypoxia and the tiredness chronic fatigue overcoming lethargy like this so lot of medicinal properties uh present over here but the question again what are the question arises all these medicinal plant go to next slide with i will tell you so so now that is the integration of scientific and the traditional land if the people are able to contribute their local resources and practices into the process of change the develop development become not only sustainable but also get accelerated combined traditional and the scientific knowledge is called the community knowledge indigenous knowledge is also is a potential source for the conservation of the biodiversity significance of traditional knowledge has been recognized in india through the initiative of so many programs next slide please so there is a plant which have a various part where uh, there is a, especially those molecules are present not only the all part sometimes molecules are present in the all parts or somewhere are located in the root somewhere sometimes they are located in the leaf depends upon the uh, metabolic part where they present in the bud they present maybe stem maybe flowers so when you are going to select anything please take care of this the the the, the, the uh, compound which is as a have a medicinal value present in the which part of your plant next slide please so why this is this is everybody know that low cost side effect availability permanent relief increase resistance and the high profitability take a fresh or dry whatever you wants to there it depends upon you next slide please so this is the share where we are now lacking is a little bit old 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 slide but now our share is little bit increasing in last 5 or 7 years in the top 10 herbal exporters next slide please so issue is over here whenever we are collecting any plant the what are the issues the issues is there when we are taking the root or rhizome or whole plant or the bark or the stem or the wood this is type of collection is called the destructive disc destructive collection and this means this is this means this dis disturb your biodiversity because we are killing your the plant for the collection of your benefits so how we can protect our this this type of issues arises in the future next slide please so this is over exploitation is a common problem all, mostly all of the medicinal plant which is very good in the uh, very good have a very good health benefits next slide please so what are the alternatives there there is a two alternatives are there one is the cell culture cell culture means when you can grow your plant in a lab in a where there are there is a no distinction between the stem leaf and the root and this is called the cell culture this is one of the substitutes when you can protect your plant or you can reason uh, means you can uh, from lab to you can shift it to the uh, field also or the active molecules you can directly take it from this cell sus cell suspension next slide please our cell culture this is one of the technique which is used for now it is very common is called the tissue culture where you are growing your plant in the lab and from there you can control all the formes uh, all the all type of oh, molecules you can control over here what they are producing and what are their quantities present there from here you can take it this plant to the field and you can get the uh, reproducible um, uh, secondary metabolite which is responsible for your medicinal properties next slide please So, so so many drugs are now the question is that from where you can buy these drugs or where you can get it these now so many you can see that how many products are available in the market with the same same medicinal plant what the issue what are the issue when you can buy the uh, leaf goat you buy the kutki or you can buy some kutki from a use you can buy the imle or which one is the best this is the issue which we are facing because that there is a no regulation over there ki when you are when we are talking about any plant 
which is present in the use mode and available in the market you are not able to know that which plant is which product is the good in the market so the one of the study which was conducted 10 years back i think 10 or 12 years back by uh, by myself and the what are the results next slide please we'll go to next slide yeah you can this is the study whenever we will talk about the natural or medicinal plant or any plants this depends upon their where they are these plants are growing actually this is one of the most important factor that is why we are not getting whenever we will talk about the herbal whenever we we'll talk about anything which is is in a natural we always have a questions why is this question arises we don't know whatever we are taking over there they are beneficial or not like if you are taking the bottle uh, guard this mean the loki if you are taking the loki in the market you don't know so that loki the bottle guard is looking very good but you don't know this is this is good because of the natural or there is some some injection or the oxytoxin toxin is injected in that so this is the biggest issue where you can see that the list is given over here in the bottom side that I think the one, two, three, four, five. Around the eight products are available in the market when we tested over here. So the, you can see the variation of their active molecules. It started from point zero zero one percent to the seven point four two percent. Now imagine it. More than one lakh times of oh, that is a uh, active molecules is a uh, uh, varying from point zero zero one to the seven point four two. This means if you are taking a product from the Wim lab. which contains only 0.001% of active molecules is means you will not get relief with the one capsule or two capsule so this is one of the biggest challenge in this area next slide please next slide please so now the our habits are also one of the factors which are affecting our day to day life you can see it when the the upper side fixture this is when we are living in a this way and now we are living in a this way five person are sitting and but they are all living in alone next slide please so now you can see we forget that when we are enjoying like this next slide please no the bicycle which is earlier you can we are uh, using bicycle for our purposes nowadays we are using the bicycle for the exercise not for day to day life next slide please we forget these moments when we travel with your family as well as your grandparents next slide please yeah yesterday i was clever so i wanted to change the word today i am wise so i am changing myself thank you next slide please so those who cannot come to uh, jammu for amarnath or vaishno devi they can visualize over here thank you very much any questions please if uh, any questions please raise your hand so we can unmute you from here chat box ko band kar yeah as such uh, the yeah. questions are not there but appreciation is there because you have told us about the treasure treasure of good things the nature's basket so i am really thankful to you sir that you told us about turmeric and aloe vera and what not and sanjeevni beauty so i just want to uh, say thanks to you and thank to mamta ma'am also again because she has arranged such wonderful you know conference thank you very much uh, uh, thank, thank you so rashmi ji chat box pe dekh ke so yeah if any questions is lot of appreciation i don't see any questions but there are lot of uh, ma'am at least you you may ask at least one question <laughs> yes i want to ask yeah anything uh, you just uh, because what we are thinking actually our thinking our uh, our ambitions our goals we are focusing on that and we forget to living actually this is the biggest so we are not enjoying the moments where we are living we are thinking about something which we don't have that is the biggest so that is my challenge is very big 
we are not happy with my car we are happy, we are always worried about the nearby car who is in, uh, living or is just the neighbors have a big car then there is a so we are always in tension that we have to buy a big car because we, whenever we don't need it also but still we are thinking about what they have and whatever we have we never enjoy that and this is the biggest so we start forget the things how to live we are waste or not we are running actually not living you know what doctor okay. you know, while i was listening to you and meera ma'am and whenever i look into my own research the only question one question comes to my mind because since we we all are here you yes. are here i am here uh, we talk so much about the environment and uh, like i've been saying don't use pesticides you have been saying go back to organic and so many things we are talking but are we implementing it somewhere kahin pe kuch implement so, uh, mamta ji mai mamta ji aapko jab mai was listening that uh, rasmi ma'am lecture so i tell you very frankly aam public are very aware about that what are the issue with the pesticide i think uh, this point was not addressed when the ddt was discover and when the others are you know, this is the miracle i think you can remember my last presentation will will say that is uh, that is uh, due point is the company who first is, uh, discover that pesticide so that uh, that uh, that was the company is we got the miracle from the chemical something like they have their slogan that line so but the issue is something different we are actually in india we are generally talk more and implement very less or we never implement never implement. i will i will give you the example of pesticide when i am going to buy for the my kitchen garden to the market i was asked that i need a, i have some issue with the plant like this so give me this if my uh, if the uh, means uh, myra mali agar mujhe bolta hai ki ye leke aana so when i am going to the market i am asked that please give me this pesticide or this particular drug so he said no don't buy this sir you buy this one this is very effective okay but the what are the regulation in india you everybody know nobody knows about what are the regulation in india if you are if you are buying anything in from the jnk they limited only 5 or 10 pesticide for testing but the how much pesticide different kind of pesticide in the market nobody knows in the same case in the punjab also the government is restricted for if you are anything is going for the export you can test only for 10 or 15 pesticides only but what farmers are using nobody knows because whenever because they all are not very well for qualified or they are not really very well aware about this they are going to the market and the biggest issue is this not only the pesticide how much quantity we have to use nobody knows in the medicine it is mentioned you can take one tablet or two tablet and when a person is going to the market for purchase of the pesticide the the person who is telling the how much matlab telling that he is also illiterate he is also don't know anything about pesticide even he cannot explain the name of those pesticide also so this is the biggest so and government is talking so much so much so much i i i tell you one i will take only 3 minutes more i was in the i was with the chief guest one of the one of the uh, conference over here on the, on the anti diabetic and that time one of the dm came for the one uh, as a chief uh, as a guest so he was telling one story that he was going in the civil desk in the is around 10 or 30, 10:30 in the uh, passing through the markets so he saw then one food person was spraying something on their food like apples and uh, pomegranate and bananas so because he was in a civil desk so nobody knows it who is he he came down he went to him and asked him what you what you are doing aap kya kar rahe ho so he said that i am i am spraying the rat repellent you can imagine or god no, you can imagine or no no you can imagine it he is he is thinking about his food not about the health to the who will come next day morning in the same case in the milk we are putting lot of urea and lot of things over there because just for the profit only means we are not there is no value of life in the same case when we are going to buy the vegetables nobody knows the how much industrial waste is put in their field how much heavy metals is coming in the field from the field 
but we just want that if that is why sometimes we uh, some food or the vegetables looking very fascinating so i generally avoid to buy that i don't know there is a lot of risk over there and i tell you one thing uh, i was talking about aloe vera i tell you one thing ramto is selling the aloe vera everybody knows it in the lot of in the market is also available but you can imagine it when you are taking that aloe vera and you are directly taking from the uh, leaf if you have a plant in is in your home the what are the difference between they are still using the stabilizer over there they are miss miss they are still putting something more to protect that gel so aloe vera is is good but for the stabilizing does not to uh, there is a growth in the fungus or bacteria they are putting something over there we should include some advocates also in this conference i will request mamta yes. ma'am for the yes, legality yes. and that is the need of the art thank you very much yes ma'am i have taken your input and definitely we are going to work on that there is one question what are the prospects for medicinal plant growth in india and what are, what is the support of this prospect is very good i i tell you one thing after yeah the support from uh, is... institutions Uh, a support from R and D institution. Because you yourself is from R and D, so you can answer. Yeah. The okay. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Not. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, if you one, I miss one plant which is very hot in nowadays because I don't want to talk because lot of cases in the Mumbai also. So cannabis is the now the hottest plant is in now in the world. Cannabis. You can imagine it. This is going to be substitute lot of medicines in the market. Okay. But again, they are in the same in the same I mean same lines. Only the few states in India are given the permission for growing, and with a lot of restrictions. So nobody is coming in the field. I'm every day I'm getting requests from uh, what are the charges of LCMS? Okay, uh, simply you, uh, Mr. Satish is asked one about LCMS and the HPLC. So I I, I put one thing, ma'am, uh, Mamta ji, uh, you reflect my mobile number as well as uh, mail ID. Okay. Any type of R and D activity, any type, any type of testing. any top up information related to medicinal plant where you can grow which crop is required and what are the prospects about that i have each and every information over there so they can directly contact to me for answering each and every question is i think little bit difficult i know there is a lot of problems in the testing of these drugs as well as availability of good quality drugs also so as for the guidelines of unesco versus science culture and religion god is a kind appreciated knowing all i don't know what is this what are the this is something there someone has asked satish tambe asks is what are the charges for hplc and ms phytochemical screening phyto yeah yeah actually you can you can directly call me and you can tell me that what plant is there and what type of activity is required you you just want to screen it what molecules are present in the essential oil we can identify also but in the lcms we can tell you what type what mass are present over there okay if we know that this uh, plant if we know the plant name then we can tell you which plant which molecules are present over there and the for the charges it depends upon that's a type of samples nothing to worry about it some more question is is raj kindly share sir phone number and the mail id ma'am yes, display in the screen the my separate yes, my yes, mail id as well as phone number mail id and phone number of dr ajay yes yes sir please we are sharing just now please bear with us we are just touching and uh, sharing here also and you you can ask us through emails also we will send you the details uh, uh, another thing is that the uh, scope is very good why why i, I think is the i think uh, in the last week the narin modi is in the amdavad everybody knows it not because of election is one of the part because he have uh, uh, narin modi always in the election mode that is a different thing but he inaugurated one of the who lab over there from the for the ius okay. so after coming uh, after me uh, you can uh, i have i think two three mails uh, you can give it other also you have there in the ppt what sir your phone number is I, No email ID. I have a two three mail IDs is written over there. I think I don't know. I can I can uh, I can uh, give it in the chat box. I write it in the chat box. Yes, sir. We have a Google okay. address. Uh, I am. No, no. I am. I am. I am typing in the uh, chat box. The chat box. Share the uh, phone number also. Yes, yes.
So till you can ask me anything, I'm typing. We have given you our number. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, our number is in the yes. chat, and his email ID is also. I think three email IDs is shared. Just screenshot for us also the email IDs. So one more number is shared. Sometimes because we are in uh, living in uh, JNK, so BSNL sometimes have a issue. I am said that uh, that geo number also. Yeah, grow in Uttarakhand. If you wants to go to Uttarakhand, there is a one uh, one of the uh, India's highest uh, biggest poly house is coming in the cannabis with the one lakh plant. So lot of scope in, in Uttarakhand. If you wants to go there, one of the director of CAF is uh, is my friend. You can go there. The buyback offer is also there in the medicinal and the aromatic plants. You can grow it and you can sell it to himself uh, in that that organization itself. So Uttarakhand has a very good scope. And not only this, Uttarakhand have a policy for the cannabis also. So who you can buy, you can grow cannabis over there also. Not in other state. Uh, another state is the Manipur. But before anybody who is going to be in this uh, this area, always remember first you this survey the uh, means uh, market and meet so many meet number of pupils, and then you can go for it. Uh, high performance liquid quantity based or scientific approach, separate model, look at different way, but same target is to the goal of the things. I don't understand this question, Professor Dr. Kamal Kisna Banik. Can he can explain me what he wants to say? Separate notes, uh, Mamta ji. The professor Dr. Kamal Krishna Banik asked something. Yeah, but he can write to you separately. If he is not able to ask, okay, notes. I will request him to email you or call you up and talk to you. I think that makes sense because I'm not. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know that uh, yeah, because yeah. I'm yeah. I, I, I lady late. So uh, again, Mamta yeah. ji, thank you very much. I am not related to this field, but I am trying to put my uh, more little bit more effort to uh, give uh, related to the environment because I the first time in the I think ten years back I called for that one of the environmental conference in Dalwa. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Gupta, that, if you are not yeah. related to environment, then none of us is related to environment. No, 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 not <laughs> like this because uh, actually uh, I tell you. Uh, uh, Actually, the question is that uh, we don't have actually the concrete plan for this. Yes. I will tell you one more thing, ma'am. You can, you, uh, Miss, your organization can make a group for this, for the yes. plantation, for the plantation in the certain area. We can go to village to village and explain the what are the importance of these plants. And I tell you, I can arrange uh, arrange a workshop on the how you can benefit from the dry flowers. Now the workshop is going on in Triple I. So that is a one floriculture mission is going on world of India. So uh, presently it is in the JN, uh, JNK and the Uttarakhand. So there is a there is a team from the NBRI Lucknow. They are giving their how to make a uh, means you can earn money from the dry flowers. They are giving all trainings over there. Uh, uh, without any cost, I mean, without charging any fee for there, they have uh, online courses over there, and I will show you if I will share it later. That the, these are looking very good, sir. They, their cards, their photo frames, they are using everything is natural from the plants only. And the flowers, basically. Doctor Gupta, after hearing your discussion and uh, your talk, which was so so interesting, and I was spellbound. Only two lines come to my mind. One is economy has taken over ecology, and second is uh, think globally and work locally. That cycle thing you have shown us, I really think in in and one day in a week can we have a uh, like we can we stop using a diesel or petrol driven vehicles and. Oh, the best, the best thing is that you can you can in yeah. your college you talk to your doctor Hukum Singh that he can say that everybody will come by the side bicycle if it is. Four to five, up to four to five, one day. Four to five kilometers far. If they are living, if more than that, I will never recommend. Otherwise, that professor will not reach to the office. <laughs> so no, no, you can come to fifty. I don't know, ten kilometers. You can come by the car and then you can use the cycle for that. So nice of you. That one I like. Okay, okay yeah. so that was so amazing session, Doctor Gupta. And uh, let me formally thank you. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for giving up your valuable time to talk in ISTTP two. The topic was environmental pollution, past, present, and future. You also touched upon the topic pesticide pollution and microbial drugs and protecting. Oh, no, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Ma I think the topic is. I think you're reading someone other topic. No, no, I environmental pollution, past, present, and future is your topic. No, 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 no. This is past, last one. Not on this time. This time topic is different. My my topic is different. Oh. Ma'am, one minute. What is <laughs> this is yeah. This is top. I saw this slide. I saw this. Slide. I don't know. Those you are you are taking slides of other one. <laughs> Now my topic is the environmental pollution, role of medicinal plant in human health. This time, okay. last time, okay. you are okay. uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So um, so you spoke about protecting effects of medicinal plants in humans. It was yeah. quite apparent that how every single person, including me, here was engulfed in your talk. Discussion se we pata lag raha. And trust me, there's so much more to learn from your knowledge and experience because the field you are working in, I'm also working on the same instrument, but my field is different. It's treat him yes. to tell you always, and everyone present at the occasion was not only the of your knowledge, but also greatly impressed by your presenting style. They've been asking your email IDs and phone numbers. It was great pleasure to listen to your wise words and learn so much out of it. Thank you so much on the behalf of entire organizing committee and delegates who are captivated by talk. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 before before closing up this, I can add it uh, only the one line more for the everyone. I think the 184 persons are already in the this the conference. Please search happiness in yourself rather than any other place. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ajay. Now it's time for a 20-second keynote address. Which is to be delivered by Dr. W. B. Gurnole. Let me introduce him to you all. Dr. W. B. Gurnole is presently working as professor in the Department of Chemistry, Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya, Nagpur, India. Dr. W. B. Gurnole obtained his uh, M.Sc. degree in Chemistry in 1989. He obtained his Ph.D. degree in 2000 on polymer chemistry from R.T.M. Nagpur University, Nagpur. During his research career, he has involved in the synthesis and characterization of nanomaterials, as well as development of SDR nano composite materials, semiconducting materials, ion exchange, resins, biodegradable polymers, conducting polymers, TLC, and exposure resins. Dr. Gurnole published more than 230 research papers in national and international journals. that is a very big number and presented more than 110 research papers in national and international conferences i must congratulate you dr gunnale for this he is a reviewer of 38 international journals of elsevier john wiley springer marcel decker bantam rsc publishers having impact factor of more than 2 he has received crsi best teacher award in 2011 for outstanding contribution in polymer material presented by chemical research society of india bangalore he also received distinguished scientist award 2016 for their contribution in research work at chennai the center for advanced research chennai he has also been received of wow international outstanding research award in 2016 by acs publication salem he is also received the best research award by Vishwa Shanti Society at MDI Singapore in 2017. His academic achievements include best research paper presentation award for seven research papers in conferences. He has published more than 360 science articles in daily newspapers for the people of society who aim to popularize the science. He has successfully guided 26 students for PhD degree and eight for eight are currently registered under him. He has successfully guided 21 AMPhil students for their dissertation work. He has successfully completed three research projects of UGC. He is author of 32 books, 11 book chapters, seven of which are international level published by Apple Academic Press, Canada, elsewhere. He is the secretary of Society for Promotion of Material Science, Nagpur. He is the secretary of West Zone of Association of Chemistry Teacher, Mumbai. He is a life member of more than twelve various academic societies. He is recently honored by Best Research Award by RTM Nagpur University, Nagpur, in 2018. Recently, ISCAS prestigious Silver Medal Award was awarded to him in the 11th ISCAS National Conference in Nagpur in 2019. He is also the chief editor. 
of National ACT Newsletter. He has uploaded more than 250 lectures of chemistry on YouTube. He has delivered more than 60 invited talks in national and international conferences. He has organized seven national, 14 international conferences, webinars for the researchers of India and abroad. He has visited countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, Nepal, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Bangladesh, etc. So now I would welcome Dr. Gurnule and request him to start with his keynote address. Dr. Gurnule, stage is all yours. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Okay, now am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay. Sir. Thank you, Mamta Madam, for inviting sir, me. Thank you for inviting me for this training program and also all the organizing team uh, of this college. Uh, before going to start, I am sharing the screen. Is the screen visible, madam? Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Yeah. And also changing now? Okay. Yes, sir. It is changing. Yes. Okay. So I have selected this today's topic uh, so that the teachers of researchers can do research also in this field. This is the new area. Uh, this is not new, but uh, there is a lot of scope to develop new material. That is the SBR nano composite material. And as we know, uh, this is the polymeric material. and uh, Polymers are one of the most important substance which have great impact on our modern life. And here in this slide show uh, applications of this polymeric material in our everyday life. As we know that the man-made fibers, which is the polymerized product, has brought revolution in the textile industry. And uh, nylon, resin, plastic, natural and synthetic rubber are the gift from scientists to our society. So for coating and for the, uh, the tire, uh, making the tire and these are the threads, uh, the uh, adhesive, paint and so many parts are there where we are in uh, contact with that and uh, these materials are very useful to us. And now as we know, uh, there is no doubt polymeric materials are really a part of our daily life and without them around, this world would be totally uh, different. So we can say that polymer is very recognized from simple back to the very complex and sophisticated material and the applications for the artificial muscles of blood vessels, fuel cell membrane, and producing the electricity. And there are some reinforced materials also there, which are used in a space shuttle. And so with this uh, here, uh, in addition to that, some advanced polymeric materials are also there. And these are also known as the smart polymers. And uh, these smart polymers have a number of applications and uh, in different fields, and the uh, advanced polymer composite also consists of two important parts of material. One is a matrix material, also known as the polymer materials. Second is a fiber, which is a high strength component. So these smart polymers have uh, a great impact uh, and have importance in a different field. Uh, for example, in sensor or artificial muscle, or as a separation and purification of water, uh, drinking water like that. So uh, how these polymers are useful to us and uh, how they, uh, how we can uh, enhance the properties are being shown here. So in this presentation, how can we synthesize the SBR nanocomposite material by adding different fillers and how we can enhance the properties, all these parts are given in this part. So nanomaterial, when we introduce in the polymeric science or polymeric matrix, then they show the enhancement in the uh, properties like size changes, degree of dispersion can change, shape, orientation of nanoscale, phase, because there is an interaction between polymer matrix and the rubber or the nanofiller. So here they show some enhancement after adding. Uh, we can say that also the reinforcement of the material. So nanomaterial, when we introduce in the polymer matrix, then they show high crystallinity, high mechanical strain, increase this scratching resistance, 
stability and therefore they show multi functionality so once we introduce the uh, fillers what is now it is also possible to synthesize nano composite material and uh, this nano composite once we prepare with the uh, polymers and with by using different fillers then they show the enhancement uh, of the properties like there is a increase in environmental stability increase the diffusion constant durability toughness strength enhancement in thermal stability and biodegradability so number of properties are there where we can enhance the properties of this nano composite now this these are the applications of this nano composite material where we can uh, use in different field and uh, this slide show uh, what are the area uh, of the nano composite can be used and uh, as we know uh, it can also be used for drug delivery nowadays in medical field uh, nano size medicines are injected to the uh, infected part of the body of the uh, patient and uh, this um, uh, nano size medicine uh, repair that part and get di digested because it is dna based so nowadays this uh, it is very useful for drug delivery in the similar manner uh, polymer have play an important role in the advancement of the uh, high performance material and uh, for biomedical material electrocatalyst so we can say that in case of high performance energy storage bio based polymers uh, are nowadays are using and in case of the biomedical materials bioactive glasses bioactive fibers biomedical and dental applications are also there in case of electrocatalyst is a catalyst that participate in electrochemical reactions and enhance the durability of the platinum based electrocatalyst so number of applications are there of this nano composite material now as we are going to discuss the uh, uh, sbr rubber now total rubber which is available in the whole world out of that 65% of the rubber are used in a tire industry and uh, here is the uh, this picture shows here what are the different articles of parts which are made by using this rubber so mainly 65% are used for making the tire industry and remaining are used for different purposes for rubber tubing rubber bands or whatever different parts are being shown here and now uh, it is possible to enhance the properties of synthetic rubber or the natural rubber by adding some nano size fillers which is also known as reinforcement of the rubber and addition of filler is necessary because to uh, uh, achieve or to enhance the properties or to improve the mechanical properties of that material and therefore it is necessary so uh, here now what are the different types of filler which can be used to enhance the properties and which can be added in the polymeric matrix so generally the carbon black uh, silica uh, and uh, some other carbonates can also be used here so addition of this carbon or silica tin oxide zinc oxide can also be used and uh, after adding this uh, filler in the polymer matrix they show enhancement in the mechanical properties thermal stability flame uh, retardance dielectric properties because it has a particular size and shape are very important and uh, so all these how they show enhancement that we are going to discuss in this part and before that now here silica can also be used as a, uh, a filler in the rubber matrix and as we know rubber is nothing but the elastomer elastomer have some important properties like elastic and therefore uh, in the japan uh, the scientists have uh, made a green tire which is uh, by using the silica particle uh, or silica as a reinforcement material so in this case now to improve the con uh, thermal conductivity to decrease the heat build up and enhance the addition metallic reinforcement now uh, this or uh, some tire are made by the uh, scientists of japanese and now uh, uh, the here this green tire concept now in future will come in uh, other countries also and this tire uh, have mainly the nano filler they have been used and uh, they have number of uh, uh, importance as compared to routine tire so this green tire which is made in the europe this to the decrease of greenhouse gas emission also so because of that this is very useful to the society in this case as a silica is added as a reinforced material so what is now this picture shows 
how the uniform dispersions of materials are there and how the filler aggregations are being shown here. So when we adding uh, this silica as a filler, then there should be a uniform aggregation, uh, uniform dispersion should be there in the matrix. As we know, there are two types of uh, elastoma, natural and synthetic. And elastoma is nothing but the rubber and in which the, uh, they, sh they show the elastic properties and therefore they are known as elastic, uh, elastic in nature. They can be stretched like a rubber. They have a weak intermolecular forces between chain and the cross band. So here this is the shown example is shown vulcanized rubber. This is the chain is shown. And here is the, uh, this is one chain, another chain. But now this is chain sulfur is added to cross-link these chains. And therefore this is the nature of the uh, chain is obtained. In case of fiber, fiber has strong intermolecular forces. So there is a difference between elastomer and the fiber. Fibers are real, terrible like that. So they have I, in strong intermolecular forces, either hydrogen bonds or dipole-dipole interaction. And here, uh, example of such type, these, because of these strong forces, these uh, fibers have high stable strength, uh, less electricity, and high melting point, and example is terrible. So uh, these are the, some terms which are used in this case. Elastomers are mainly two types, natural and synthetic. And uh, uh, natural uh, elastomers shown here, that is the natural, uh, uh, we can classify this elastomer based on the structure, uh, saturated elastomer and the unsaturated elastomer. And uh, uh, in case of saturated example is a silicon rubber. And uh, they show a superior stability against oxygen, radiation, heat and ozone. They are less reactive and the reactivity is li uh, limited uh, to certain uh, under certain condition and uh, up to limit is there. Polyacrylic rubber or silicon rubber are the example of the saturated rubber, and uh, uh, they show some stability as compared to unsaturated. In case of unsaturated elastomer, they can be cured with the sulfur uh, by using sulfur and a uh, butyl rubber or nature polyisoprene examples are the unsaturated. So many. And depending upon the structure, uh, saturated and unsaturated elastomers are there. And uh, classification on based on the sources, natural rubber and the synthetic. In case of natural rubber here, these are the plantation. And as we know, uh, this uh, uh, natural rubber, that is the, it is obtained from the rubber tree. Name is a heavier bacillinesis. And uh, when we cut it, and we can collect here uh, in this pot, the latex, white color latex, and this is the nature. Isoprene is the monomer, which is present in the natural rubber. And these are the plantation. And as we know, um, two countries are there, Thailand and Indonesia, which are the greatest producer of the rubber in the world. So these are the two countries, uh, Thailand and the Indonesia, which are the largest producer of rubber, natural rubber. And uh, in our India, uh, Kerala have some part where there is, and these are the trees of uh, rubber plantations. And uh, so uh, mainly the rubber came from the two countries. Monomer used in the, uh, is present in the uh, natural rubber is a uh, isoprene. And isoprene have these two types of structure. Uh, seed isomer, and this is the trans, depending upon the position of the groups. And there are three different types of grade. Different types of grades are there. Reef and smoke sheet is from here, tail tree shown brown type of so different types of natural rubber sheets are there of different grade so these are the natural rubber and these are the plantations shown in thailand and this is the collection of this latex and here in this pot is shown some uh, pieces of the natural vulcanized rubber now uh, synthetic rubber uh, which are synthesized in the uh, laboratory also known as the man-made and uh, uh, SBR is the well-known example in uh, ENBR, that is nitrile rubber is just another examples and SBR and BR, chloroprene rubber. So different types of rubber are there and it is possible to synthesize in the laboratory. For synthesis, emulsion polymerization process we have to use and also we require two machine. One is a two roll machine and second a compounding uh, compression machine. These two important instrument required for making the rubber sheet. So natural rubber is uh, synthesized, uh, a synthetic rubber is synthesized in the laboratory, which are also known as the man-made rubber. Examples have been shown here. 
NBR, BR, and SBR. So we have synthesized number of uh, rubbers by using different filler and by using different pigment for the color. And these are the slide show how automobile sector and biomedical sector uses this material. So this elastomer rubber are uh, mainly used for tire. In case of tire, there is a uh, different parts. Here, this is the thread is shown here. This is the side wall of the uh, tire. And here is the belt system type shown here. Tire casting is here. And this is the bead to fix it. So this is the uh, arrangement in the rubber. And uh, in this way, uh, this uh, rubber material or elastomer is huge. And this picture shows different parts where these uh, rubber tubing for nut and bolt are being shown here of the made by the uh, elastomers. Some biomedical, surgical hand gloves and also can be used and for dentistry also, these materials are useful. Uh, in footwear also, in making the slippers, uh, shoe sole, or uh, making such type of long boots, or these sandals, slippers are being shown. So all these are made by using these elastomers. Some main, main majority of the part of the uh, aerospace uh, have also been made by using this type of elastomers. Here is shown some part where this part can be made and, can, and these materials are useful material. And in case of household sector, toys can be made by using this material, rubber bands, and this is rubber tubing. And in case of advanced robotics, equators, equator rubber, diaphragm, artificial pacemaker now, scientists have been made this artificial heart and for pumping and work for two uh, days or for two hours and depending upon the battery, it works on the battery. So all these are the parts where we can use this material. Now how to synthesize this material? And this is the synthetic rubber uh, used in for different purposes, but rubber mainly used for the tire industry. And uh, there is a difference between natural and synthetic rubber. As we know, natural rubber is a high tensile, tear strength, have a resistance to wear, absorption, and fatigue. Water repellent also is show the resistance to alkalis and weak acids. But now here, uh, in case of synthetic rubber, they show more properties. They are solid, flexible, durable, uh, can be molded as required when we heat it, resistant to heat, light, and chemicals, better abrasion resistant, and showing the aging resistance, flame retardant, resistant to grease and oil. So we can say that synthetic rubber are more important as compared to natural because they have some more important properties. This is the flow chart for synthesis of styrene bitter and rubber. And in this case, in the flow chart diagram, uh, we have to take in you know, a monomer tank styrene and bitter. Bitter is very dangerous. Uh, we cannot inhale. It is available in the cylinder, like our cooking gas cylinder uh, uh, here. And uh, we one three bitter directly we have to pass through the cylinder in a reactor, a reactor and a styrene we have to add and the reaction is, uh, polymerization is taking place. After polymerization, some monomer is left, then again it is uh, uh, sent back to this uh, reactor or tank, monomer tank, and then we get the latex, which is get coagulated, and then we get the uh, SBR, uh, this uh, uh, compounding mixture. This mixture can be used for uh, uh, making the rubber sheets. Such type of sheet is obtained. These are the fine sheet of the rubber. This is the rough sheet. And depending upon the uh, sheet, uh, we can make, a diverse, it is possible to make the different colored, yellow, green, blue, whatever. We, for that, we have to use the pigment. During making the sheet, compounding, we have to add some pigments, colored pigments, so that we can get the colored rubber sheet. And this is the important procedure, uh, uh, method in emulsion polymerization. In this technique, uh, collider polymer particles are dispersed in a continuous medium and generally the uh, water can also be used and polymeric dispersion are the latexes. Uh, here is the shown and uh, uh, here we, uh, uh, micellar also formation can take place and here these are the arrangement. Here when we uh, uh, use this material and when we add uh, the support process is carried out then what is there is a formation of micelles uh, during the process of polymerization. So uh, this is the uniform distribution uh, of this uh, uh, polymerization process and formation of how the particles are distributed shown here in this slide. 
here is the one drop of monomer droplet dropper and this is the surfactant blue color is shown uh, here is the monomer droplet in the similar way one one procedure is shown micelle formation is there after that polymerization can take place so see the arrangement here of the drop of that and here is the micelle formation polymerization is taking place and we get a long chain of polymer so here in initiator molecule and surfactant and after polymerization we get this type of polymer so uh, it involves the polymerization and uh, monomer is an important in the former emulsion we have to use that is the collateral dispersion medium for emulsion polymerization so uh, during the process then it is possible to add the colored pigment and other sulfur so this shows the synthesis of sbr nano composite and here uh, we have taken this sbr rubber uh, uh, sbr is easily available also uh, readily or uh, it is also synthesized in the laboratory uh, laboratory what is sbr all the uh, directly you can purchase or you can synthesize and sbr is taken in a 1 ph or 2 ph or 3 ph like that and uh, this is the 100 gram uh, it made constant and nano filler here is zero in the first two six phr 10 phr 12 phr steric acid as a activator stabilizer can also be added and uh, this is the table shows compounding once we compound um, uh, make this uh, take this mixture for making the sheet then uh, we have to use this machine uh, here is shown so three important parts are there one is mixing then compounding and then vulcanization of rubber so this is the two roll mill this machine shows two roll mill here is a one uh, roll another roll on this side they are moving oppositely so here is shown the separate picture of this two roll this is the one roll smaller size this is the big roll larger size and this move clockwise this move anti clockwise and here we have to put the our samples compounding solution mixture and after adding what is these these two roll are moving oppositely so we get the sheet here uh, once it is uh, uh, pressing with a hydraulic press uh, five or six ton pressure we have to apply we have to fix the temperature also and then we have to uh, after starting after fixing all the parameters what is we get the sheet and sheet obtained from this is a rough sheet it is not fine this rough sheet then we have to use another machine what is here compression molding machine this is the compression molding machine our sheet obtained rough sheet we have to put here place here this is the again another pressure we have to keep it here this is the compression molding machine here we have to temperature we have to maintain the temperature 160 at 160 for two minutes after fixing this temperature and pressure and uh, here from this compound uh, compound compression molding machine we get the fine sheet and this fine sheet is used for different purpose. So these two machines are required to roll mill ball, to roll mill machine and second molding machine. These two machines are required for making different type of sheet and size. So uh, here vulcanization and during the uh, compounding, we have to add some sulfur to make the uh, elastomer hard. And main purpose of uh, sulfur to add here here is shown in the picture. What is this blue color is nothing but the sulfur. It is a cross linker. They join the chains and act as a cross linker. So this is the cross chemical cross linking, which is observed in the rubber chain. And in this way, uh, we can use the, uh, and there are some benefits of this rubber. Uh, they show good tensile strength and also excellent resistance uh, and uh, resilience and it also returned to the original shape when deforming load is remote. So like elastomer, uh, elasticity, they show uh, this resilience. They also show water absorption tendency. Also have a higher resistance to oxidation, wear and tear abrasion, and also a better electrical insulator. So all these are the benefits of this rubber nanocomposite material. And here, depending upon the particle size, uh, we can use, depending upon our applications, we can use different types of, uh, according to the color, we can use the filler to reinforce the material. Black fillers, carbon black like, white fillers are silica and choline, calcium silicate like that, according to the effect. 
we have to use different types of filler what is the color and all that things we have to observe here is shown how the particle size also show effect on the uh, reinforcing the effect as the particle size decreases reinforcing effect increases is shown here in this slide this is the general reaction of hbn carbon black and this uh, it is also possible to measure the percent of carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen sulfur which are present in the compo compound by using elementary analyzer and observe that uh, in case of this sbr and nano composite the percentage are match agree with the calculated values and based on that empirical formula and formula weight can be calculated this is the important table where mechanical testing is observed and this is the observation that tensile strength is shown here uh, in case of 1 phr 2 phr 3 phr 4 5 as tensile strength increases see now here if this is increases as the concentration of filler increases tear resistance also increases step by step with the increase of content of the filler abrasion resistance decreases and the cross link density also increases so all these other properties where we are uh, they show enhancement because once we introduce the uh, rubber mat uh, in the rubber matrix uh, nano filler uh, nano filler occupies some space and uh, then uh, because of that uh, after occupying that space what is there they show some filler filler interaction instead of uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, rubber matrix or polymer filler interaction and because of all that they show some enhancement in the properties so here uh, tensile strength uh, measurement uh, here it is shown that in case of tensile strength first of all we have to make a sheet after after making up our sheet what is now we require to we have to make the dumbbell shape now in this case dumbbell shape sheet we have to after making the dumbbell shape sheet mold is there and by keeping that mold we can cut the sheet into uh, dumbbell shape and this is the uh, machine where we can measure the elongation tear the uh, elong elongation and also the uh, mechanical st uh, here the and uh, it is observed that uh, tensile strength increases uh, with the increase of concentration of the nanofiller and this can be explained that there is a space or some holes in the polymer matrix where this nano size filler can be or get uh, placed in that case. And because of that, here it is graph shows how the enhancement is there. So rubber chain, uh, in case of rubber chain, uh, maybe patient in the layer increases the tensile strength. This graph shows when the uh, carbon black in PHR, here is stones tensile strength slightly increases with the increase of concentration of filler and uh, sometimes we can also use the antimony oxide carbon black or silica can also be used and this enhancement mainly is due to the higher polymer filler interactions as compared to the filler filler interaction and therefore they show enhancement in the uh, properties so second important property of this enhancement is the elongation property uh, in this case uh, of the elongation uh, at a break is there. What is now elongation property uh, increases with the addition of nano size fillers. And it is due to the uh, diffusion of very fine nano uh, particles uh, in the rubber chain. It supports the rubber chain to enhance the stretching and which reflect the elongation. So uh, elongation at break all uh, in all the systems increases with the increase in the weight of the percentage of filler and uh, the increase at higher loading is due to the enhancement of rigidity so at higher loading is there then what is there is a rigidity is there of the material so again now here this graph shows the enhancement or increase of elongation of this rubber sheet uh, next the clear resistance property in case of clear resistance uh, we can say that uh, here also there is a some enhancement uh, of the property and what as we know here resistance measure how the stress specimen raises the growth of any cuts when under tension it is measured by the instrument which is known as the uh, what is the uh, tensile strength or elongation and here is a 
different types of composition of nano filler uh, with the uh, polymer matrix have been used and here the, uh, this elongation tear registration property this property is also show enhancement and uh, here next uh, property is the abrasion resistance property is also shown in case of abrasion resistance uh, we can say that addition of nano filler uh, that is the two phr uh, weight loss of the rubber is constant but after uh, for 10 phr weight loss of the rubber decreases because a nano carbon black act as a filler which is in contact with the abrasion load at 12 phr weight loss of rubber again decreases until it reaches the 10 percent uh, and after that there is no any uh, weight loss but it decreases but uh, up to particular time and after that there is the rigidity is there and there is no uh, this nano size filler restrict the weight loss so we can say that uh, abrasion resistant property decreases up to certain and then after that it become constant and it uh, this nano filler uh, prevent or uh, restrict the weight loss of that material here is shown the graph initially it remain constant it is decreases and again become constant so this is the uh, uh, in case of the uh, effect of uh, nano filler on the resistance, uh, that is the abrasion resistant property. Uh, another important property is the swelling property. This polymer nano composite can also show some uh, swelling properties. And uh, in case of swelling property, uh, solvent, different organic solvent we have to use. And uh, where generally the low molecular weight liquids diffuse slowly into the polymer matrix and high molecular weight polymers include rubber and show some swelling. And uh, depending upon the uh, this property, what is now, we can say that there is a uh, enhancement of the filler polymer interaction. Uh, more is there as compared to filler filler and magnitude of swelling uh, in the solvent depends on the uh, solubility parameters of both the material and in this case swelling ratio for this elastomer can be measured and similarly the cross link density can also be measured and cross link density we are calculated by using the tooling as a solvent addition of this nano filler in the composite has a better cross link density uh, because uh, sulfur is also present and sub cross linker can also be we can also we have to use and therefore better cross-linking density is there uh, in the polymer. One more property is there, that is the, all these are the mechanical and uh, what is known as the ozone resistance. In case of ozone resistance property, uh, we have to uh, keep the chamber and uh, where uh, in the under control concentration of ozone and uh, we have to maintain some temperature and HDI sample we have to uh, introduce in that what is then uh, uh, simple without any filler it takes four hours for the cracking but uh, when we increase the concentration of the filler to 6 10 12 phr then it takes longer time for the cracking so here uh, shown here ozone cracking this is the nature uh, cracking is not here but now when we apply uh, when we go for the longer time then the cracks is there. So uh, in short, we can say that when we uh, use more quantity of the filler in the rubber matrix, what is then? It takes longer time for the cracking. If there is no any filler, then it takes lower time for cracking. So these are the cracks which are shown on the surface. So uh, SBI sample cracks uh, within a four hour of the irradiation with the ocean and propagation is also faster. HBI nano composite vulcanized show better resistant to ozone due to its polar nature. And uh, uh, we are for four hours, it said it, uh, this rubber cracks were formed on the surface of a rubber sample. Uh, it is also seen that after increasing the uh, uh, filler concentration, what is then? It takes longer time. Here is shown now figure. Uh, first figure uh, is shown and this is the b and c so in case of this is for 6 phr 10 ph and 12 so uh, the uh, the time uh, is a uh, longer uh, that is the it takes 
if the concentration is more, it takes longer time for the crack. So this is important property of uh, ozone resin cells. One more property is there uh, here, that is the spectral storage. In case of spectra also, it is possible to know the uh, structure, what are the uh, groups present in the rubber matrix. Uh, so in case of uh, SBR, carbon black, uh, what are the groups present, hydroxyl groups present, as some uh, SBR filler groups, maybe they are methylene groups are the present, which is confirmed by the spectral studies and particularly FTIR. This is the FTIR spectra for this SBR and uh, uh, carbon black filler and uh, different groups which are present can be confirmed by using FTIR. So, aromatic group may also be present, which is also confirmed. So, by using this FTIR structure, what are the groups present can be confirmed. By using Raman spectroscopy, also, it is possible to know some transition, glass transition, and also different transitions which are present uh, because of the different groups. And uh, here, methyl, methylene, carbon-carbon uh, double bonds, and uh, which are known by using this is the graph. Uh, uh, it takes only the one minute or two minutes to take this uh, Raman spectra after fixing all the parameters and different uh, peaks are observed. And we get uh, information from these uh, different transitions for that material. So this is important part for this. As we you know what is same, same also used to know the nature and uh, scanning electron microscopy mainly used to know the surface morphology of the material. Uh, here is the arrangement is shown and here is the specimen sample we have to place here. And in this way, electron one is also here, electron beam passing through this magnetic lens, the lens and all these things. After scanning, what is image is here. We get the uh, scanner is there and which give the image of different resolution as per the required. It also takes two, three minutes to give the image after setting all the parameters. So this is the uh, scanning electron microscopy, give the morphology on the surface of that material. With what is the particle size? What is the nature? What are the, that is the different types of uh, images we get. And from image, it, we can interpret them. And uh, similarly now, uh, another, uh, important uh, instrument is the TAME, transmission electron microscopy. These give the complete morphology of the material for on the surface, as well as it gives the morphology of the whole body of the material. So complete, what is the insights inside? What is the nature can also be known by using this type of uh, technique. And here is the picture is shown, images are being shown for this same scanning electron microscopy for this material. Uh, see the two different natures are there. In case of uh, nanomaterials, different types of morphology are there. Uh, foam like straw like, uh, like that. So different morphology are there. But now here we obtain what is the morphology, surface morphology of this rubber matrix. So here is shown some spirulates. Uh, here is shown. And this is the, at different resolution. And this is at 7,000. And this is at 6,000. So we can also magnify. Uh, it is possible to magnify this image also. So at different resolution, it is possible to take the image. And uh, so we can confirm the structure, we can confirm the material. These are the tame images for this SBR nanophilic and nanocomposite. And see here the uh, inside part of the nature of the inside part and also on the surface at different nano size, uh, we obtain this type of, and from this we get a lot of information, particular size and other, parameters obtained by using these images. Uh, thermogram, whether the sheet is uh, thermally stable or not, this is the one of the example of thermogram for this rubber chain. Uh, and uh, here, <coughs> different stages are there for the decomposition. Uh, here, initially, it start decomposing. See here, it remains slightly decreases. And then slight one of the breaks should be here, and then Sudden decrease is there. So there is a loss of some major group. And here, see now here, again remain constant. Again, here is a uh, decreases sudden here. So here is also another break. So different stages are there. Initially, there is a loss of water if it is there. 
all are soft solvent and then main polymer breaks and what is now here another break shown here so two three stages have been shown here so they see the nature of the thermogram so they show some breaks where there is a loss of some groups or compound and uh, breaking of this material can also be possible so tga give uh, so uh, what is the stability so you see here now there is no loss initially remain constant so it is stable up to 300 or here up to uh, 350 and after that there is a loss so there is a breaking so whether it is thermally stable or not can be decided on the basis of thermal stability thermogram and some additional parameter that is thermodynamic parameter can also be calculated so this is number of methods are there thermal methods are there this is the one method shaf wentworth method to calculate the activation energy and to know the order of reaction so here this method is used and here we have to plot the graph this is known as shaf wentworth plot and a straight line is obtained take the um, uh, find out the slope of this straight line and then slope is equals to ea upon 2.303 r minus ea upon 2.303 r i is a constant what is now here ea once we know the slope ea can be calculated by using this graph uh, given by sharp and wentworth another important uh, method is a freeman curl method this is the formula to find out the ea and the, when we plot a graph between here and again here straight line is obtained and here intercept on the y axis give the order of reaction and the slope from the slope activation energy equals to that is the uh, ea equal uh, slope is equals to minus ea upon 2.3 r uh, activation energy by using this method can also be calculated and it is observed that activation energy calculated by both the methods are agreement with each other here is shown as we are and here order of reaction 0.4 uh, nearly half and activation energy found to be a not very close but very close this is near about 3 and 3.7 so uh, the activation calculated by different method uh, deshpande method is also there um, uh, then uh, what is the uh, different methods are there uh, for rate form method is also there for calculation of thermodynamic parameter uh, entropy change free energy change apparent entropy change frequency factor can also be calculated by using these methods of thermal and this is another graph uh, which is used to know the kinetic parameters so in the last part that i have uh, here summary uh, i can say that so number of methods are there but here a uh, two role mill uh, that is the immersion polymerization uh, different polymerization process are there uh, free radical polymerization uh, condensation addition polymerization now in case of rubber we have to use immersion polymerization for the synthesis and after making the compounding we have to use the two roll mill for making the sheet after that uh, molding machine to make the fine sheet so uh, here i have given <coughs> number of fillers are there nowadays biological base biofillers can also be include uh, added during the compounding process so biofiller or silica like that number of fillers are there and depending upon the filler they show the enhancement in the properties so like green tire also uh, we can make some different types of tire also so uh, depending upon the fillers depending upon the polymeric matrix whether it is natural rubber or synthetic we can synthesize we can make the different sheet and after characterization different types of properties are there mechanical properties you can measure the environmental properties microscopic properties and also the environmental and also thermal properties so all these other properties we can study with this material and after for the characterization uh, ftr is there elemental analysis is there and also the uh, in case of michael same and tame is also there and uh, raman is also there so structural uh, characterization is also possible and uh, this is the applied part and uh, uh, one of my student dr rani mankar how Uh, working on this part and she has already uh, awarded the phd on the synthesis of sbr and their composite material and she has published all the total 12 papers she has published in or means we can say that complete thesis have been published and in elsewhere journals so this is the applied part we can use for different purposes tv cabinet 
all so many articles we have we know and we can make and so for this only we have to select the good quality or uh, selection of filler is very important whether it is bio base or other fillers we show some enhancement in the properties of the artificial or natural so if any uh, thank you for your kind attention and is there any doubt or any question and here you can ask freely over to you madam Hello. thank you sir that was just amazing presentation even it's not my field but i have been listening it very carefully and it's, i must congratulate you for having such a wonderful team with you people who are working with you i think kavi shankar has raised the hand he's around rashmi tyagi ma'am has raised hand please unmute your dr rashmi tyagi thank you very much sir uh, we recalled everything about polymers and uh, so many things we have told us preparations properties synthesis and uh, so many you know machines we have talked about and i like the integration between the polymers and uh, the nanotechnology that how you are strengthening these uh, you know polymers and maybe rubbers uh, with the uh, you know this uh, nanotechnology and uh, Uh, way back 10 years back we had a conference in bharti vidyapeeth pune that time i was uh, working with bharti vidyapeeth and uh, there i have presented a paper on uh, nanotechnology that the, how we can uh, reduce the uh, you know expiry dates of the medicines by grinding it so that was it so i really liked whatever you have presented today it was a total recall for me so i want to ask you very a good question because i am a lady and in india the ladies are wearing sarees and yeah. on princes we are wearing that uh, you are going uh, people are going to have the nano sarees so i am just asking you when those nano sarees will be out because you are working on the polymers and all that thank you uh, madam you are the your question is okay a uh, fine uh, related to the uh, women okay uh now uh, the nano materials we are uh, synthesizing also and uh, they have some uh, different properties that is uh, the tear resistant but because of the nano paint nano fabric when we use the nano fiber uh, which can be used for the soldier and for the our clothing also uh, the material is like that if any dirt or any color spot is there on our shirt or any our like that so it is it can be removed easily because the material is a dirt repellent color repellent okay so it is because of the nano fabrics and uh, our gloves uh, our in future it may come soon <laughs> okay sir no dry cleaning no washing okay right sir thank you very much sir uh, may come and soon I, yeah and i think it will save water and it will help with environmental conservation too dr gurnale because that what we are here for for the environmental conservation even and, I, uh, in the future na now electric car came na madam so now in yes. the future solar nano cells are there uh, trained all the vehicles may run on that solar cell nano that solar is so cell so wonderful to hear yeah that. yeah already the yeah. work is work done by the japanese and american scientists on that part and then sir yeah. flows of aeroplanes also that yeah, even yeah 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 i don't know but aeroplane is a few is a different but for those are moving na here cars they as two wheelers four wheelers or train or buses there is a possibility in the future may go without any uh, diesel or petrol or any uh, fuel okay and without electricity and dr gurule you can see lot of appreciation for you it is flooding in the chat box people want your ppt so please share with us if you approve we'll share with our delegates and uh, they are very happy to hear you so now it's time to formally thank dr gurule uh, dr gurule i would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the stirring speech you gave us you spoke on synthesis characterization morphology and mechanical properties of sbr nano composites derived from nano carbon black which is such an important topic in the present day and everyone present at the occasion was not only in the oak your knowledge 
but also greatly impressed by your presenting. So it was a pleasure as we are talking to each other. It was a great pleasure to listen to your wise words and learn so much out of it. I take this opportunity to thank you on the behalf of our entire organizing committee and delegates who were captivated by your talks. Slides were beautiful, self-explanatory, and I can see how much effort you have put in to make uh, these slides and all. And the, what charming was TEM images. I was really like to see those TEM images. So thank you so much, Dr. Gunnile. I hope that you'll join us again in our future events. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You, thank you, madam. So now it's time for our 23rd keynote address, which is to be delivered by Professor Dr. Ruchi Sharma. Dr. Sharma is currently working as a professor and director at Jagran Lake City University, Bhopal. He has a work experience of 20 years in the field of education, corporate and social work with national as well as international voluntary organization. Professor Sharma has completed her post-graduation in social work, sociology and psychology with PGDHRD, PGDDM, IMA, and Honors Diploma in Computers. She has done PhD in Sociology from Bhaktatula University, Bhopal. She has published research papers in reputed national and international journals and presented papers in conferences. Her research interest areas are sustainable development, social cohesion, sociology of youth, organization culture. Her recent publications include Strategic Framework, a Roadmap, for communities, adaptations, and resilience in constrained environment, a research paper published by Springer Nature in 2021. Shifting paradigms and human resource management while striving for the service excellence in the tourism industry, published by Springer Nature Switzerland in 2021. Dr. Sharma, Abhinandan. Swagat, Abhinanda. It's such a pleasure to see you. I would request you to start with your keynote address. Ma'am, stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Mamta. I'm thankful to RRC Alva team for calling me in this uh, training session. Uh, today, uh, uh, first I will uh, share my PPT. Just kindly let me know, are you able to see it? Okay, ma'am, sure. Uh, is my uh, slide, are my slides vi visible? Yes, ma'am, they are. Yes, you can see them. Can you let me know if in case uh, you are not able to, uh, you know, uh, see the movement of the slides? Okay, ma'am. Okay. So the topic on which I will be going to take the session is engagement of youth in promoting environmental sustainability. Ma'am, the presentation is no more visible. Okay. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am, it's come back. Yes, it's visible. So the key takeaways of the session will be understanding the present and future scenario because uh, when we are talking about the future, future depends on the present and why the role of youth is important. What are the building blocks of youth involvement process and education as a catalyst to empower the youth? So when we are talking about the present scenario, in the pursuit of achieving economic goals, the indulgence in commercialization has multiplied. And the United Nations 2021 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that is IPCC report, has stated that without meaningful decarb decarbonization, global temperatures will rise to at least 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels within the next two decades. 
when we talk about the climate hazards they are unevenly distributed on average lower income countries are more likely to be exposed to certain climate hazards compared with many upper income countries primarily due to their geographical location but also to the nature of their economies in the next slide you can see that even in the uh, by 2030 almost half of the world's population approximately 5.0 billion people could be exposed to a climate hazard related to heat stress drought flood or water stress in the next decade up from 43% that is 3.3 billion people which are facing now today so there is a comparison of what today the uh, climate hazards what the people are facing right now and by 2030 and later on by 2050 with the estimated of 1.5 degree centigrade above the temperature levels by uh, of the um, um, uh, the uh, and the estimate is there how the, it will be going to have an impact on our uh, environment as well as on the people in 2050 when we are estimating it about um, in 2.0 degree centigrade above pre industrial levels it will be going to increase more in the current slide you can see that the effects of climate change could affect the global population in a 2.0 degree centigrade warming scenario more than half of the world's total population could be exposed to at least one climate hazard and these all the figures which i am using here in this training session they are being taken by the report published by mckinsey uh, company based on that analysis they have estimated that that how in 2030 the scenario will be going to be there and how in 2040 2050 the scenario will be going to be there when we are talking about the uh, climate change in our uh, world the next slide talks about uh, the warming scenario one sixth of the total projected global population or about 1.6 billion people could be exposed to severe heat stress either acute which uh, acute is defined here as humid heat waves or chronic that is lost effective working hours by 2050 compared with less than 1% or about 0.1 billion people likely to be exposed today the next figure which you can see on the slide it is uh, talking about the Uh, by 2050 about 800 million additional people could be living in urban areas under severe water stress compared with today so by 2050 water stress is projected to increase as demand will be going to outer space supply and this could result in the lack of access to water supplies for drinking washing cleaning and maintaining industrial operations as a result the um, the people need to take the alternative methods that is investment in the infrastructure such as pipes and desalination plants to make up for the deficit again it will be going to have a greater impact on our environment the climate hazards as already i mentioned that it is unevenly distributed overall a greater proportion of people living in lower income countries are likely to be exposed to one or more climate hazards by 2050 it is estimated and which can be clearly seen in the image here uh, on the in the presentation that more than half the total projected global population could be affected on the other hand only 10% of the total population in high income countries is likely to be exposed so yes it is not like that the developed countries will not be going to uh, face any uh, crisis but the um, the crisis the uh, what they will they will be going the impact would be much lesser than the other countries that is the less developed or the developing countries there could also be a meaningful increases in overall exposure in over in throughout the world in the uh, in this particular uh, slide you can see that how the low vulnerability medium vulnerability and high vulnerability based on the uh presumptions of 2.0 degree centigrade above pre industrial levels uh it is being uh, shown and uh, the climate hazards could affect a large number of people especially the it is very clear from this figure that it will be going to have more impact on the lower 
um, that is the middle as well as the upper income uh, countries and the lower income countries when we are talking about so this was about the global scenario now coming uh, to india when we are talking about the india's vulnerability to climate hazards in an um, in present scenario if we talk about then india accounts for more than 17% of the world's population by 2050 nearly 70% of india's projected population or which could be around 1.2 billion people will be likely to be exposed to one of the four climate hazards compared with the current exposure of nearly half of india's population which is being estimated around right now around somewhere around 0.7 billion just as the absolute number of people likely to be exposed to hazards is increasing so too is the proportion of people likely to be exposed to a severe climate hazard today approximately 1 in 6 people in india are likely to be exposed to a severe climate hazard that puts lives and livelihoods at risk by 2050 this proportion could increase to nearly 1 in 2 people so a very is a large difference we can see that now in presently when we are talking about that 1 in 6 in future it is 1 in 2 people will be going to get affected severe heat stress is the primary culprit of climate hazard exposure potentially affecting approximately 650 million residents of india by 2050 compared with just under 10 million today now when we are talking about as how the um, the uh, net zero emission we are talking about as to reduce the uh, uh, environmental pollution or to counter the environmental pollution so the report it says that addressing climate change it requires yes it definitely requires big investment um, by the uh, companies by the organization by the countries but the countries the companies they need to spend on it and annual spending on low emission assets and the infrastructure to enable them carries a price tag of about dollar 3.5 trillion above what is currently being allocated and it can be uh, clearly seen from the image which is being portrayed here the new spending is uh, highlighted in light blue color whereas current spending is highlighted in dark uh, blue color or navy blue color so this particular uh, ngfs here it stands for network for greening the financial system and here we are projecting for the 2050 scenario so annual spending on physical assets for energy and land use systems will be going to rise about by about dollar 3.5 trillion more than what we are spending now there are with uh, 11 high potential value pools that have been identified and demand for uh, the green products and services is growing strongly in categories such as energy materials vehicles food and packaging as the net zero transition advances markets for zero emission offerings should expand further while markets for emission intensive offerings shrink it is estimated that the demand for net zero offerings could create unprecedented opportunities and here in the figure you can see 11 high potential value pool, uh, value pools that have been identified that would be going to generate up to more than dollar 12 trillion of annual sales by 2030 and these 11 high potential value pools uh, includes industrials hydrogen agriculture and land use water buildings carbon management waste oil gas and fuels consumer power and transport the global power industry is making strides towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions by switching from fossil fuel fired power generation to renewable energy sources such as wind and solar that shift also comes with its own set of challenges such as strains on existing distribution infrastructure one solution in this it could be to use long duration energy storage that is ldes technologies which can store energy for prolonged periods and provide the flexibility to manage fluctuations in supply and demand the report found that ldes which stands for long duration energy storage could deploy up to 2.5 terawatts of power capacity by 
a 15 fold increase from current energy storage capacity so yes the alternatives are there but also the alternatives they come with a price and we have to decide whether we are going to pay that price or not or do we have any other option while the rate of electric vehicle because nowadays more it is going for the electric vehicle uh, evs are uh, popular adoption has varied across the globe depending on regional regulatory pressure and consumer interest a transformation is underway china european union and the united states they could end new internal combustion engine escape sales and shift fully to evs by 2035 even in india the companies are coming up with the evs but not many successful stories uh, we are able to look up to there are due to the um, some um, uh, the you can say the, about the the, the road uh, or the uh, the components of the ev uh, they are not properly being uh, assembled and being uh, planted properly as a result uh, the especially when we are talking about the scooters and all we are seeing that they are catching the fire so when we are talking about uh, the evs when this particular figure majorly focuses on european union china and the united states and they need to make up 75% to of all passenger car sales within the next decade to help achieve net zero emission now coming to after going through how what is the present scenario and based on the present scenario we try to understand the future scenario based on the reports the researches which have been done so what is the role of youth and why the role of youth is important when we are talking about the role of youth especially uh, uh, when it comes to the climate change as uh, quoted by uh, the popular uh, young environmental activist greta thunberg that there is one thing we need more than hope and it's action but when we act hope is all around us and the time to act is now young people constitute the large part of the world's population and are often referred as the builder of the future world we have seen various examples um of the young leaders in uh, india as well as abroad also like uh, malala yousafzai uh, according to her when the whole world is silent even one voice becomes powerful so this is how the young people they think about they uh, they want to uh, they want to they want that their voices should be heard and in the recent years we are witnessing many youth led social actions advocating and campaigning for the right to safe and secure future as well as protesting against the decisions of powerful and self declared patrons or watchdogs of society these youth led social actions are not limited to any particular region or nation but we can observe the global wave of youth protests demanding action on the critical issues which can adversely affect our environment striving to reduce the growing challenges to the environment which is keeping the future generations existence at stake the youth are coming together to let their voice be heard and change the prevalent mindset they are not afraid of questioning the inability or short or short sightedness of policy makers to take meaningful action confronting and igniting the ignorant politicians adding the layer of urgency to the polluted world of greed and irrational efforts to seek people attention that are actively organizing demonstrations demanding and the change and creating awareness about issues which is affecting the global community for example greta thunberg's activism is sparked a worldwide movement forcing government and companies to adopt environment friendly policies other environmentalist activist youth activists which we have seen are autumn peltier lean namu garwa ridhima pande from uttarakhand zai bastida isra hirsi etc these all youth involved they, they were involved in raising their voice to protect the environment after framing and implementing the policies the policy makers never thought that the river sweeps from the youngsters can come in and there that is the policy makers they will be going they had this never asking attitude they can be challenged and smashed over 
the challenges faced by youth demonstrators are compounded by difficulties of as their act of raising voice is not always appreciated they are all well informed and seek empowerment as their future belongs to them they demand to be considered when the decisions regarding their future are made their demand for being the active contributor rather than just being the representative face is justifiable as they will be the one alive to face the consequences of the decisions which are being made today they they have their own self defined roles they have they have self engaged themselves in the actions to bring the positive change the various the, they have used the social media platforms very strategically and have started uh, initiated various uh, movements naming them like hashtag zero r hashtag fridays for future etc and this is helping to break the spiral of the silence embarking on ambitious mission breaking the stereotypes and dealing with outdated issues clearly indicates that the youth have the will power and determination to work passion, uh, passionately for the cause they firmly believe in another tool which they are using in addition to social media platforms is the support of the like minded youth so all like minded youth they round the world are coming together and supporting each other to deal with global challenges they are aware that if they build momentum then they will be going to initiate the change so youth led demonstrations it imply a total change which can be referred to a notion of transformation having impact on the nature of dominance power as well as social relation we should not undervalue their efforts rather we should encourage them and it they should not be criticized or they should not be seen or tagged as rebels or irrational but rather they uh, the society the especially the policy makers the decision makers they need to accept them as their efforts or their silence will be their uh, they need to take the effort because if they are not taking the effort their silence will be going to affect their own future it is true that if youth lacks in raising their voice then they have to suffer the deadly effects as policy makers will not be able to realize the blunders committed by them today towards the path paving the path, which is paving uh, towards the path of the destruction of the environment and adversely affecting our future generation as individuals and societies dealing the social or environmental issues we all can play our responsible part the social progress is gradual and it includes the environment also and in this we need the role of youth to be actively engaged in promoting the environmental sustainability so how to like uh, just now i mentioned that they are very energetic they are taking the initiative and um, they are organizing various demonstrations or the you can talk about the environment uh, movements uh, backed by some uh, cause and they are also getting the support from the their own uh, generation but at the same time these youth led movements or the youth led um, the initiatives if they are being uh, Uh, they are being uh, you know uh, directed uh, in a proper way then it will be going to have a more impact than what the impact which they are creating today so how the what are the various blocks the, through which we can involve the youth uh, in the process of um, the environmental sustainability so these blocks are identified as knowledge skills attitudes and values examining an environmental issue requires knowledge of the environmental issue the skills to transform this awareness into a deeper understanding and the attitudes and the values to reflect on the issue keeping in mind the interest of all the stakeholders involved so when we are talking about the especially the knowledge the the people need to examine the current issues that which the environment is facing that is the present scenario they should be able to understand and appreciate the emergency or the, the critical situations in which we are living now so the uh, uh, the skills when we are talking about it is more towards 
analyzing the present and based on that taking the decision so as to understand the future as what the future will be going to hold so in order to when we are talking about the skills related uh, component in uh, it more require more in uh, you know um, engagement in open appropriate and effective interaction uh, and also the analytical and the critical thinking skills in order to nurture environmental friendly behavior the focus should be on clear and manageable learning goals this means engaging all educators to reflect on the teaching topics which will help in uh, the building up the skills of the people of the youth that are environmentally significant and the types of skills that foster a deeper understanding of the world and facilitate respectful interactions coming to the attitude component the action that the uh, the need to act now it is very important and the attitude it should not be like just to be famous i want to be famous on uh, in media so i am going to support this particular cause or uh, i want to be in the limelight it, no it should not be the attitude should be more of the participatory where we are talking about the involvement of the other people also so the youth they should take action for collective well being and sustainable development they should understand that the pollution in one place affects the ozone layer somewhere else floods in agricultural areas not only ruin the local environment and economy but also affects markets worldwide and drive waves of migration so all these are interconnected and interlinked the local communities experience them in a very diverse ways and it is very essential when we talk about the values values are very significant and this need to be there when we are right from the childhood it is not only the um, the responsibility of the educational institution but the family also plays very important role so so at home when or they don't uh, they are their actions are toward are more environment friendly the in the same way the socialization of the younger uh, the young one it takes place and so there are the certain values which need to be there for the which need to be cultivated right from the childhood stage the some responsibility needs to be taken by the educational institutions also so the educational institutions when we are talking about it is uh, education act as a catalyst to empower youth to initiate and bring the change in the society especially related to the towards promoting towards the environmental sustainability the engagement of youth will generate the effective responses to environmental pollution thus it is necessary to create awareness right from the uh, primary level uh, at the school in the school and enable the young ones to actively participate in the prevention of environmental pollution by building a solid foundation in environmental issue the reformation of education system currently we are talking about nep 2020 in the same way it is required so as to the implementation is more important because the plans they are they are the plans very good plans are there but when we are talking about the implementation that is mostly required so as to understand the complex systems and policies to promote the critical thinking and analytical skill the younger generations need to be equipped not only to the process to uh, to process the available information but also to enquire the policy decisions and marketers promotional activities as to establish the link to ecological consequences and in all this education plays a crucial role in helping young people to promote environmental sustainability education institutions whether is schools colleges or universities they can provide opportunities for young people they can develop certain subjects based on the projects which make them uh, to think about the environment so as to critically examine global developments that are significant to both the world at large and to their own lives in the present technological era the educational institutions can teach students how to critically effectively and responsibly use digital information and social media platform they can encourage environmental sensitivity by allowing students to engage in field experiences 
that foster an appreciation for environment. In schools, the educational institutions are also uniquely positioned to enhance the youngsters people's ability to understand their place in the community and the world and to improve their ability to make judgments and take action. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development recognizes the critical role of education in reaching sustainability goals, calling on all countries to ensure by 2030 that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. Youth need a solid foundation in environmental issues in order to promote and support sustainability. Learning activities in the domain of environmental sustainability helps students understand the complex systems and the policies surrounding the demand for and use of natural resources. So lastly, to conclude, more youth continue to adopt both conventional and unconventional approach to contribute to environmental care and protection. Youth have already begun mobilizing their peers on social media. We can see it and uh, even in other online interactions to discuss, debate and advocate for better environmental protection. Youth efforts range from local initiatives to international campaigns, some influential enough to reach policy makers and national leaders. As more youth connect, they are also using virtual platforms to educate, raise awareness, expand outreach and share knowledge. Additionally, youth are taking advantage of the availability and accessibility of the information and technology to engage in all levels of environmental governance, especially towards implementing the sustainable development goals, that is SDGs. The youth from creating identity as environmentalist to devise a strategy for achieving environmental goals can initiate the social movement, environmentalism, in non-hierarchical and participatory way. The participation of youth is crucial, but supporting youth participation and engagement in environmental preservation requires a holistic and inclusive approach. As youth are willing to take the lead to meaningfully engage in platforms related to the protection of the environment at the local, national, or global level. However, to harness their talents and innovation there is need to ensure that youth are equal partners and torch bearers in creating and implementing the goals towards environmental sustainability. Youth perspective is critical in shaping the future of society and we should all understand it. As quoted by Nelson Mandela, the youth of today are the leaders of tomorrow. With this, I end my session. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Sharma. First of all, I must congratulate you for selecting such an amazing topic. And the quote with you ended touched everyone's heart. Of course, you are the leaders of tomorrow. And that is the beauty of ISTTP because uh, we have got keynote speakers from so diverse background and they are coming up with such new topics and such interesting things. Even I was spellbound when you were talking. And so the delegates are also, are also from so diverse backgrounds. And ma'am, uh, I will take your um, attention towards the chat box, which is flooded with um, the wonderful deliberations and all that. So I must congratulate you for such a wonderful talk. If any questions, please raise your hand so we can unmute you from here. It's indeed a special deliberation for which thanks a lot. There is a comment on the chat box, so I just spoke for you dr sharma everyone is saying great thank so, you participants uh, thank you so much for being uh, you know being active listener yeah we, everyone has been ma'am and like right now we have 22 countries are with us and it is 170 or 180 people connected to us right now so now if no questions it's time to formally thank dr sharma uh, Dr. Sharma, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for a wonderful speech you gave us. You spoke on engagement of youth in promoting environmental sustainability. Youth is the backbone of every country and if youth takes environmental conservation as a prime responsibility, then the whole scenario of environmental conservation practices will change and will become a better place to live. These slides were very beautiful and self-explanatory, building blocks of youth involvement 
like knowledge, skill, attitude, values. That was amazing, right? Trust me. You mentioned so rightly. Everyone present at the occasion was not only admiration of your knowledge, but also greatly impressed by your presenting style. It was a great pleasure to listen to your wise words and learn so much out of it. I take this opportunity to thank you on the behalf of our entire organizing committee and delegates who were captivated right off. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so we much. We appreciate your presence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now it's time for our 24th keynote address, which is to be delivered by Dr. Shashi Varma. Dr. Shashi Varma is MA, MPhil, and PhD in political science. She is currently working as an associate professor at Government Maharani Sudarshana College, Bikaner, Rajasthan, India. She has been awarded the State Level Teachers Award in 2020 by the Department of Higher Education, Government of Rajasthan, for her excellence in the academic world and social concern. One of her paper has been awarded the Best <laughs> Paper Award. She has authored the status of girl workers in a UGC project, Bikaner. Dr. Verma has published eight book chapters and 30 research papers in various international and national journals on contemporary topics. She has actively participated in 40th international conference, seminars, workshops, and has given many lectures in OTS, discussions in All India Radio, chaired in many educational and social programs as a chief guest. 34 students have written dissertation under her guidance and currently two research fellows are doing PhD under her guidance. She has played an active role in organizing three international conferences, two national seminars as a member of the organizing committee. She has been honored by many national and international social organizations for her academic achievement in social service. Thank you so much, Dr. Varma. Aapka bohat bohat swagat, abhinandan. Ab bohat achha lag raha aapka apne saath dekhkar. Ab main aapse request karti hoon ki kindly start with your keynote address, Dr. Shashi Varma from Bikaner, India. Thank you, Mamta. Aap sabhi ko mera sadhar namaskar. Abhi sabse pehle to main dhanyavad vyakt karna chahungi, Dr. Mamta Sharma ko. उच्च शिक्षा राजस्थान उच्च शिक्षा के कोहनूर कोहिनूर जिसकी चमक ने न केवल आर आर कॉलेज राजस्थान उच्च शिक्षा विभाग भारत भारत सर मतलब भारत को पूरे के अपने जो प्रकाशमान किया है पूरे अपने किरणों से जो प्रकाशित किया है पूरे विश्व के अंदर तो सबसे पहले आप बधाई के पात्र हैं कि आप न केवल एक कॉन्फ्रेंस न केवल एक वर्कशॉप बल्कि लगातार इस अथक प्रयास में लगी हुई है कि एनवायरमेंट की शुद्धता के लिए कार्य कर सके एनवायरमेंट के के लिए कार्य कर सके उच्च शिक्षा में शोध कार्य को बढ़ावा दे सके मैं धन्यवाद ज्ञापित करना चाहूंगी आर आर कॉलेज के यशस्वी ओजस्वी प्राचार्य डॉक्टर हुक्म सिंह जी का कि जो लगातार जिन्होंने एक अलग जगाई हुई है शोध कार्य को करने के लिए अपने कॉलेज का पूरे राजस्थान के उच्च शिक्षा विभाग का पूरे विश्व में नाम करने के लिए मैं आभार व्यक्त करना चाहूंगी प्रिय मुस्कान का भी जो लगातार लगी रहती है तक प्रयास प्रयत्न करती रहती है लगातार ये कार्य न केवल मानसिक है बल्कि शारीरिक रूप से भी थका देने वाला है मैं इसे अच्छी तरीके से जानती हूँ एक और एक कॉन्फ्रेंस करवाने में चाहे वो ऑनलाइन ही हो बहुत परिश्रम लगता है लेकिन आप लगातार लगी हुई है आप तीनों की टीम पूरा आर आर कॉलेज सभी साधुवाद के पात्र हैं धन्यवाद मैडम <laughs> मैं क्योंकि मैंने बताया डॉक्टर शशि वर्मा बताया कि मैं पॉलिटिकल साइंस की विद्यार्थी हूँ राजस्थान के बीकानेर में एम कॉलेज कन्या महाविद्यालय में पदस्थ हूँ राजनीति विज्ञान के विद्यार्थी होने के नाते मैं पॉलिटिकल एनवायरमेंट की बात करूंगी पॉलिटिकल पॉल्यूशन की बात करूंगी तो हम जो पॉलिटिकल एनवायरमेंट और पॉलिटिकल पॉल्यूशन की बात करते हैं क्योंकि अभी हम जो देख रहे हैं विश्व परिदृश्य के अंदर जो हम देख रहे हैं उसमें हम देख रहे हैं कि यूक्रेन की क्या हालत है क्या उसका एनवायरमेंट बचा वह हम प्रदूषण सेव की या एनवायरमेंट सेव की बात कर सकते हैं 
नहीं कर सकते हम वहां पे तो बहुत जरूरी है हमें अपने एनवायरमेंट की को क्लीन रखना है उसको सेव करना है उसकी सुरक्षा के लिए कार्य करना है लेकिन हमें अपने पॉलिटिकल एनवायरमेंट को भी शुद्ध करने का साफ करने का कार्य करते हैं क्योंकि जब पॉलिटिकल एनवायरमेंट बिगड़ता है तो युद्ध होते हैं और युद्ध में सब कुछ खोया जाता है दोनों ही देश हारते हैं ऐसा नहीं है कि कोई एक देश जीतता है जीतता तो सिर्फ अहम है और इसका जीता जागता उदाहरण अभी हम देख रहे हैं यूक्रेन और रूस का युद्ध देख रहे हैं यूक्रेन पूरी तरीके से समाप्त हो चुका है रूस का भी बहुत नुकसान हो रहा है लेकिन जीत सिर्फ दोनों देशों के नेताओं का अहम जीत रहा है और यूक्रेन की जनता जो है बहुत ही मानव मानवता बहुत ज्यादा एक तरीके से लहूलोहन हो चुकी है और उसको देख के जो पूरा विश्व जो उसको देख रहा है वो भी बहुत ज्यादा दुखी है मन दुखित होता है जब भी वहां की कोई न्यूज देखते हैं हम तो बहुत ज्यादा मन दुख होता है तो इसलिए हम आ, मैं जो बात करूंगी वो करूंगी पॉलिटिकल एनवायरमेंट की बात करूंगी हम दो साल से जो देख रहे हैं पॉलिटिकल एनवायरमेंट में जो सबसे दो साल पहले अभी तो यूक्रेन रूस का नाम आ रहा है लेकिन यदि हम दो साल पहले की बात करते हैं या दो साल के लग, लगातार बात करते हैं तो चीन देश का जो हमारे हमारे जो राजनीति में एक बड़ा देश है विकास विकसित राष्ट्र है वो हमारे सामने उभर कर आता है और उसमें सबसे बड़ी बात है भारत और चीन के रिश्तों की जब मैं स्टूडेंट थी तभी से मुझे पॉलिटिकल साइंस के अंदर अंतरराष्ट्रीय संबंधों को देखना उन पर चर्चा करना उनके बारे में बात करना बहुत पसंद था आज भी है उनके ऊपर पसंद राजनीति विज्ञान के विद्यार्थी होने के नाते तो और भी ज्यादा मैं ध्यान देती हूँ और उससे भी ज्यादा चीन के बारे में जो चीन और भारत के संबंधों के बारे में जानने का प्रयास चीन को जानने का प्रयास लगा मुझे रुचि पैदा हुई जो मेरी कि मेरी मीडिया है जो चीन के त्यांजिन सिटी जो चीन की राजधानी बीजिंग से एक से चौदह किलोमीटर दूर है वहां से एमबीबीएस कर रही है तो मुझे मैंने सोचा चूंकि अब बहुत सारी हमारे पास फैसिलिटी है हम डिजिटल के माध्यम से हम अपने नेट के माध्यम से हम बहुत सारे देशों की सच्चाई को वहां देख सकते हैं बहुत सारे लोग ब्लॉगिंग भी करते हैं और चीन के बारे में बहुत सारी न्यूज ही वैसे तो चीन के चीन अपने न्यूज नहीं देता वो ना व्हाट्सएप उनके यहाँ यूज होता है ना फेसबुक उनके ऊपर यूज होता है ना वहाँ गूगल यूज होता है लेकिन फिर भी जो बाहर जो भारत के कुछ जो बच्चे हैं मैं बहुत सारे लोगों को जानती हूँ जो भारत के हैं और चीन के अंदर रह रहे हैं वो ब्लॉगिंग करते हैं और ब्लॉगिंग करने से हमें वहां की वास्तविक स्थिति को जानने का मौका मिलता है तो मैं भी पिछले लगभग तीन सालों से चीन को नजदीक से जानने का प्रयास कर रही हूँ और उसमें मेरी रुचि का कारण तो एक है ही कि मैं राजनीति विज्ञान की विद्यार्थी हूँ अंतरराष्ट्रीय संबंधों में मेरी बहुत रुचि है और दूसरा बड़ा कारण यह है कि मेरी विद्या को मैंने वहां एमबीबीएस की शिक्षा के लिए भेजा था तो मैंने बहुत नजदीक से चीन को चीन को जानने का प्रयास किया भारत और चीन के संबंधों को जानने का प्रयास किया तो जो मेरा थोड़ा सा एनालिसिस है मैं उस एनालिसिस को आपके सामने प्रस्तुत करने का या उस विषय पर चर्चा करने का प्रयास करूंगी तो सबसे पहले मैं अपनी स्क्रीन शेयर करती हूँ मुझे आशा है मेरी स्क्रीन दिखाई दे रही होगी नो मैम नॉट येट अभी आपकी स्क्रीन नहीं दिख रही है नहीं दिख रही है अब नो मैम मैम वो जो नीचे एरो का बटन है स्क्रीन पे उसे क्लिक करिए तीन ऑप्शन आएंगे उसमें से योर इंटायर स्क्रीन सेलेक्ट करिए नहीं वो ही किया था मैंने अभी कर दिया है वो फिर स्क्रीन सेलेक्ट फिर स्क्रीन सेलेक्ट करके शेयर पे क्लिक करिए तब शेयर होगा मैम स्क्रीन सेलेक्ट कर चुकी हूँ मैं और शेयर पे क्लिक करिए नहीं आई अभी नो मैम शेयर जो स्क्रीन तो आ रही है एक 
पर मैम यहाँ पर शो नहीं हो रही है आप ऐसा करिए आप हमें मेल कर दीजिए हम आपके लिए प्रेजेंट कर देंगे मैम एक मिनट आप देखिए अब नो मैम ओके मैम एक बार आप वापस मेरे साथ स्टेप बाय स्टेप करिए आप नीचे जो एरो का बटन है हाँ वो वो हाँ उस पर क्लिक किया ऑप्शन आए यस योर इंटायर स्क्रीन सेलेक्ट करा यस एक बॉक्स आया होगा उसमें आपकी स्क्रीन दिख रही होगी उसे सेलेक्ट करिए यस और फिर क्लिक करिए शेयर ओके एक स्टेप नहीं हो पा रहा था अब अब आ गई मैम ओके एक स्टेप मिस हो रहा था ठीक है अभी भी नहीं दिख रहा अब मैम आप अपनी प्रेजेंट अब आपकी स्क्रीन शो हो रही है अब आप अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन सेलेक्ट कर लीजिए नीचे से इसको मिनिमाइज करिए ऊपर से और अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन स्टार्ट कर दीजिए प्रेजेंटेशन मैम आप ओपन कर सकते हैं आराम से ओपन करिए मैम नीचे अपनी पीपीटी ओपन कर लीजिए अपने डॉक्यूमेंट्स में से दिख ही नहीं रही है मुझे तो मैम ये तो आपकी स्क्रीन है मैम ये तो आपकी स्क्रीन है स्क्रीन है आप अपने आप अपने नीचे येलो वाला जो फोल्डर है अपने डॉक्यूमेंट्स में से अपनी पीडीएफ को ढूंढ लीजिए आपकी जो भी पीडीएफ हाँ भारत चीन संबंध में सबसे ऊपर यस मैम यस इसको डबल क्लिक करके से ओपन कर लीजिए मैम वरना राइट क्लिक करके ओपन कर लीजिए यस मैम अब हमें दिख रही है दिख रही है यस मैम अब इसका ना मैम थोड़ा सा साइज स्मॉल कर लीजिए इट्स वेरी ऊपर माइनस वाले पे थोड़ा एक बार क्लिक करिए यस मैम ठीक है यस मैम ओके ठीक है अब आवाज भी आ रही है मेरी और स्क्रीन भी दिख रही है जहां तक मुझे पता yes, है यस 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 ओके तो अब हम बात करते हैं जैसे भारत चीन संबंधों के ऊपर अपन बात करते हैं एक मिनट सबसे पहले जब हम भारत चीन संबंधों के ऊपर जाते हैं उनके हम इतिहास को देखते हैं तो हम इतिहास को देखते हैं कि उसके आ, देखते हैं कि भारत और चीन ने लगभग एक साथ साम्राज्यवादी जो शासन थी उससे मुक्ति पाई थी भारत जो ब्रिटेन का भारत पे ब्रिटेन का आधिपत्य था और चीन के ऊपर था जापान का आधिपत्य भारत ने जो मुक्ति पाई थी भारत ने जो तो स्वतंत्रता प्राप्त करी थी वो 1947 में करी थी और चीन ने 1949 में यानी कि हमसे दो साल बाद भारत आजाद हुआ था भारत नहीं दो साल बाद सॉरी चीन आजाद हुआ था भारत ने आजाद होने के बाद भारत ने लोकतंत्र को अपनाया और चीन ने साम्यवादी व्यवस्था को अपनाया यदि हम भारत चीन सीमा की क्योंकि सबसे ज्यादा जो विवाद है उनके वो है सीमा विवाद उनका तो सीमा विवाद की जब हम बात करते हैं तो देखते हैं कि हजारों वर्षों तक तिब्बत जो एक छोटा राज्य था वो दोनों के बीच एक बफर स्टेट का रूप कार्य करता था दोनों के बीच में भौगोलिक रूप से था दोनों को अलग रखे हुए था उन्नीस के अंदर चीन ने तिब्बत पर आक्रमण कर दिया और उसे अपने कब्जे में ले लिया तब से भारत और चीन की सीमाएं मिलने लगी दोनों पड़ोसी हो गए उसके बावजूद भी 94, 1954 में दोनों ने पंचशील सिद्धांत के ऊपर हस्ताक्षर किए जिसका उद्देश्य था शांतिपूर्ण सह अस्तित्व की नीति पांच साल दोनों के जो रिश्ते थे वो भाई वाले भाई भाई वाले रहे दोनों के जो रिश्ते थे बहुत ही सौहार्दपूर्ण थे दोनों ही बहुत प्यार से रह रहे थे लेकिन 1959 में भारत के uh, 1959 में तिब्बत के जो आध्यात्मिक गुरु थे दलाई लामा और उनके अनुयायियों ने तिब्बत छोड़ दिया और वो भारत में आ गए उन्होंने भारत से शरण मांगी भारत ने भी भारत के हिमाचल प्रदेश के धर्मशाला में उन्हें रहने की अनुमति दे दी 
तभी से दोनों के रिश्ते बिगड़ने लगे आरोप प्रत्यारोप का जो दौर प्रारंभ हुआ दोनों एक दूसरे के खून के प्यासे हो गए और जिसकी परिणति हुई 1962 का युद्ध हुआ उन दोनों की परिणति दोनों में और ज्यादा सीमा विवाद उभरने लगे 1962 में चीन ने भारत के बहुत बड़े भाग्य पर जिसमें अक्साई चीन विशेष तौर से है उस पर अपना कब्जा कर लिया लेकिन वो युद्ध समाप्त हो गया बहुत जल्दी ही कब्जा करने के बाद लेकिन एक शीत युद्ध की स्थिति दोनों एक दूसरे के दुश्मन हो गए और भी चूंकि भारत और चीन दोनों एक पड़ोसी राज्य हैं दोनों की सीमाएं मिलती हैं तो दोनों के सीमा विवाद को लेकर बहुत सारे मुद्दे उभरने लगे जिसमें सबसे पहला है फिंगर एरिया दूसरा है सड़क निर्माण कार्य तीसरा है अक्साई चीन चौथा है अरुणाचल प्रदेश और पांचवा है डोक डोकलाम मतलब ये पांचों जो क्षेत्र हैं, इन क्षेत्रों के अंदर भारत और चीन के सीमा विवाद हमेशा होते ही रहते हैं इन सीमा विवादों को हम और थोड़ा सा अच्छे से जानने का प्रयास करेंगे ये आप एक नक्शे के माध्यम से मैं आपको बता रही हूँ कि भारत और अब चीन में आप देखेंगे तो भारत और चीन की जो सीमा है भारत के पांच राज्यों से मिलती है जम्मू कश्मीर से हिमाचल प्रदेश से उत्तराखंड से सिक्किम से और अरुणाचल प्रदेश से ये चीन है और ये भारत है तो भारत के पांच राज्य जो हैं पांच राज्यों से चीन की सीमा मिलती है लेकिन मेन जो विवाद है वो है फिंगर फिंगर एरिया विवाद फिंगर एरिया का जैसे आप समझ सकते समझ सकते हैं कि उंगली फिंगर का मतलब है उंगली मैं इसको आपको नक्शे के माध्यम से या एक चित्र के माध्यम से बताने का प्रयास करूंगी कि जो फिंगर एरिया है वो ये है आप इसमें देखें कि इसमें कुछ निकोली पहाड़ियां बनी हुई हैं। ये इन निकोली पहाड़ियों के ऊपर हमेशा विवाद रहता है नीचे भी आप देखेंगे तो निकोली पहाड़ियां बनी हुई हैं। यदि हम अपनी फिंगर को ऐसे करते हैं तो हमें भी अपनी फिंगर इस तरीके से दिखाई देंगी तो ये जो फिंगर एरिया है वो एरिया चीन और भारत के बीच में विशेष विवाद का विषय बना हुआ है ये फिंगर इसको और क्लियर माध्यम से समझाने का प्रयास करूंगी कि ये जो फिंगर एरिया है ये एक दो तीन चार पांच छह सात आठ ये आठ फिंगर एरिया का हमें देता है आभास देता है आठ फिंगर एरिया का अब इसके ऊपर ये जो फिंगर एरिया है ये लद्दाख में स्थित है लद्दाख के ऊपर स्थित है तो इसमें और ये नीचे जो आप नीली देख रहे हैं ये ये पोगोत्सव झील है जिस झील को आपने थ्री गेट में देखा होगा बहुत ही सुंदर बहुत ही साफ इसका पानी है ये हिमालय की पर्वतमालाओं से ही बनती है ये झील है इसके अंदर और इसके ऊपर ये आठ फिंगर हैं इन फिंगर के ऊपर उनका विवाद है विवाद है कि भारत ये कहता है कि इन आठों फिंगर पर भारत का आधिपत्य है भारत की है ये आठो फिंगर जबकि चीन कहता है कि चार फिंगर भारत की हैं और चार फिंगर चीन की हैं यानी कि वो ये छोटी सी आपको ये लाइन दिखाई दे रही है चीन इसको एल मतलब भारत और चीन में कोई वास्तविक नियंत्रण रेखा नहीं है हम इसलिए एल नहीं कहते एल कहते हैं एल के तात्पर्य है कि भारत के भारत और चीन के बीच में अभी तक तो कोई तारबंदी नहीं है कोई निश्चित सीमा नहीं है कि कहाँ तक चीन है और कहाँ तक भारत है ये वास्तविकता है और ये पूरी जो रेखा है ये पोगोत्सव झील के ऊपर भी जाती है तो यही कारण है कि आज तक किसी भी आ, नेता ने जितने भी सरकार आई है किसी ने भी चीन और भारत के बीच में एक निश्चित जो सीमा रेखा तय करने का प्रयास ही नहीं किया है चीन इसको मानता है कि बीच में और भारत जो मानता है वो इसको ये अगर आपको मेरा एरो दिखाई दे रहा है मेरा एरो दिखाई दे रहा है स्क्रीन पे हेलो मेरी आवाज सुनाई दे रही है यस मैम आपके प्रेजेंटेशन विजिबल है यस मैम अच्छा एरो भी दिखाई दे रहा है वी कैन सी एवरीथिंग मैम ओके तो ये जो भारत ये मानता है भारत यहाँ पे मानता है आपको दिख रहा है और जो चीन मानता है वो इस जगह मानता है अपनी आ, सीमा रेखा जो मानता है ये मानता है और इसी जगह अभी जो तो युद्ध हुआ था गलवान जो युद्ध हुआ था वो इसी जगह हुआ था उसमें ये था कि यहाँ पर जो हमेशा है तीन जो टुकड़िया है बीस बीस की तीन टुकड़िया अपने क्षेत्र की रक्षा करती है अभी तक चीन जो यहाँ पे था लेकिन जब हम जब कोविड फैला तो भारत ने भी जो अपने सैनिक थे उनको यहाँ से हटा लिया था एक के बाहर पहुंचा दिया क्योंकि आप आप और हम सभी जानते हैं कि जो कोविड फैला था वो 
चीन से ही आया था उन्होंने अपने जो सैनिकों को हटा लिया था उसका फायदा उठाते जो चीनी सैनिक थे वो इस जगह पांच और छह फिंगर के बीच में यहाँ पर अपने टेंट तंबू बना के रहने लगे क्योंकि ये बर्फ से ढका हुआ पूरा एरिया है पता ही नहीं चलता है कहाँ क्या है तो इस तरीके से जो टेंट तंबू चीन के यहाँ पे थे आठ फिंगर आठ फिंगर के बाद थे उन्होंने पांच और छह फिंगर के बीच में अपने टेंट तंबुओं को आ, लगा लिया था यानी कि यहाँ तक वो पहुंच गए थे जब भारत की एक टुकड़ी जब इसके निरीक्षण के लिए आई उन्होंने यहाँ देखा 20 लोगों की एक टुकड़ी आती है जब उन्होंने देखा कि यहाँ पर चीनी सैनिक आ चुके हैं उन्होंने उन पर आक्रमण किया चीनी सैनिकों ने भी आक्रमण किया क्योंकि चीन के पास चीन के सैनिकों के पास ये एक आ, आ, समझौता है कि नियंत्रण रेखा के बाद कोई भी एक दूसरे के ऊपर गोलीबारी नहीं चलाएगा आक्रमण नहीं करेगा लेकिन चीनी सैनिकों के पास जो थे वो लकड़ डंडे थे उन डंडों के ऊपर लोहे की तार बंधे हुए थे उसके उससे उन्होंने भारतीय सैनिकों पर आक्रमण किया जो न्यूज की तो पता नहीं क्योंकि न्यूज जो चैनल देते हैं न्यूज को उनके पास बहुत सारी बाध्यताएं होती हैं सरकार का उनके ऊपर बाध्यता होती है अपनी टीआरपी बढ़ाने की बाध्यता होती है लेकिन कुछ कुछ न्यूज जो है विशेष सूत्रों से आई जाती है वो कितनी सही है ये मैं दावा नहीं करती लेकिन यही है कि उस युद्ध के दौरान केवल चार सैनिक भारतीय मारे गए थे और उन भारतीय सैनिकों ने जो पीछे से आ रही टुकड़ी उसको उन्होंने बताया पीछे से जो टुकड़ी आई थी सैनिकों की वो सैनिकों की टुकड़ी इस ये जो यहाँ पे क्योंकि पहाड़ पे नहीं चढ़ सकती इस नदी के किनारे इस पगत झील के किनारे आई थी ट्रक के अंदर आ रही थी और वो ट्रक ऊपर से जो चीनी सैनिक थे उन्होंने बर्फ के जो गोले थे बर्फ के जो बने हुए थे चट्टाने उनको गिराया वो ट्रक से टकराए और वो ट्रक इस पोगोत्सव झील में जाके गिर गई वहां पे पोगोत्सव झील में वो 20 के लगभग सैनिक मारे गए अब हमारे 24 सैनिक मारे गए थे लेकिन यहाँ पे तीन टुकड़ियां चीन की आ चुकी थी लगभग 60 से 90 लोग यहाँ पे थे उसके बाद फिर तीसरी जो टुकड़ी 20 सैनिकों के आई उस सैनिकों की टुकड़ी ने यहाँ पे मौजूद सभी सैनिकों को मार गिराया तो ये गलवान के टाइम पे जो झड़प हुई थी वो इस तरीके से झड़प हुई थी और इस तरीके से युद्ध हुआ था उसके बाद जो थी चीनी सैनिक जो थे वो अपने पीछे अपने आठ से पीछे चले गए थे तो इस तरीके से यहाँ पर जो पुनी झड़प हुई थी अभी हम देखते हैं 2020 के अंदर जो हुई थी वो यहीं पर हुई थी पुनी झड़प ये हमारा जो फिंगर एरिया है भारत और चीन के बीच में विशेष सीमा विवाद के रूप में उभर कर आता है इसके बाद यदि हम बात करते हैं सड़क निर्माण कार्य भारत और चीन के बीच में एक सड़क निर्माण कार्य चल रहा है जैसे कि मैं आपको बता चुकी हूँ कि अक्साई चीन अक्साई चीन की मैं आपको फोटो अभी दिखाऊंगी अक्साई चीन पहले भारत के कब्जे में था 1962 के युद्ध में चीन ने भारत से उसको अपना अधिपत्य ले लिया अपने कब्जे में ले लिया उसको उसमें भारत जो है उसके किनारे किनारे अपना सड़क का निर्माण का कार्य कर रहा है सड़क निर्माण की ये फोटो देखिए देखिए ये पर्वतमाला है और यहाँ अक्सर चीन के बगल में भारत अपना सड़क निर्माण कार्य कर रहा है तो इस सड़क निर्माण कार्य के लिए चीन नहीं चाहता ये सड़क निर्माण कार्य भारत करे अगर वो सड़क निर्माण कार्य नहीं करता है और चूंकि अक्सर चीन पर चीन का कब्जा है तो चीन वहां पर अपनी सैनिक गतिविधियों को स्टार्ट कर सकता है वहां से अपने सैनिक की कोई भी गतिविधि कर सकता है भारत के ऊपर आक्रमण कर सकता है यदि भारत सड़क का निर्माण नहीं करता है तो उसे अक्सर चीन तक पहुंचने में पूरा दिन लग जाएगा और यदि वो सड़क का निर्माण करता है तो अक्सर चीन तक पहुंचने में मात्र उसे आधा घंटा लगेगा तो ये जो सड़क निर्माण कार्य है ये बहुत अत्यंत आवश्यक है भारत की सुरक्षा के लिए बहुत जरूरी है और भारत इस पर सड़क निर्माण कर रहा है जो चीन को बिल्कुल पसंद नहीं आ रहा है अभी तो आप जानते हैं पूरे भारत के अंदर भारत माला नाम से सड़क निर्माण कार्य किया जा रहा है जितना मुझे पता है पहले से मैं कोई दावा तो नहीं करती लेकिन इस निर्माण सड़क निर्माण कार्य का भी जो जिम्मा था वो भी एक चीन की कंपनी को था और अब मैंने कोशिश करी प्रयास किए देखने का नेट पर कि अब किसको मिला है ये कौन कर रहा है सड़क निर्माण कार्य कौन सी कंपनी कर रही है तो मुझे नहीं मिला हो सकता है बहुत ढूंढने पर मिल जाए लेकिन मुझे नहीं मिला कि आज कौन सी जो कंपनी है वो भारत के अंदर भारत माला सड़क निर्माण कार्य का कर रही है जिससे पूरा भारत एक माला में बन जाएगा हम कहीं भी सीधी सड़क के आधार पर भारत के एक एक मतलब छोर से दूसरे छोर तक पहुंच सकते हैं तो जो ये सड़क निर्माण कार्य कर रहा है चीन भारत इससे चीन बहुत खफा है
उसके बाद यदि हम आते हैं तो अक्साइड चीन जो मेन अक्साइड चीन है जिसके ऊपर हमारा बहुत बड़ा विवाद है अक्साइड चीन जो है वो 1962 में चीन ने भारत से ले लिया था अपना आधिपत्य स्थापित कर लिया था अक्साइड चीन में जो बर्फ से ढकी खूबसूरत पहाड़िया है और भारत उसके ऊपर अब कोई सवाल नहीं उठाता क्योंकि वह एक पौधा भी नहीं उठता भारत नहीं कहता कि चीन से कि वो हमें वापस दे दिया जाए यदि भारत अपना दावा पेश करता है और भारत को मिलता है वो तो भारत उसको विकसित करता है तो उसे एक मिनी स्विट्जरलैंड का वहां आवास मिल सकता है वो इतनी सुंदर जगह है कि भारत अपने भारत अपने देश में भारत में एक मिनी स्विट्जरलैंड बना सकता है लेकिन भारत दावा नहीं करता उसके ऊपर कोई अपना हक नहीं जमाता क्योंकि उसे पता है कि यदि उसने उसके ऊपर करने की कोशिश करी तो निश्चित ही चीन से उसका युद्ध हो जाएगा आप ये देखिए कि ये जो भारत है जम्मू कश्मीर से ये अक्साई चीन है ये चाइना है और ये पाकिस्तान है और ये जो हिस्सा है लाल और हरी लाइनों का है ये पाकिस्तान ने चाइना को दे रखा है ये पाकिस्तान जब भारत और पाकिस्तान अलग हुए थे ये पाकिस्तान का हिस्सा था लेकिन भारत ने लेकिन सॉरी पा, पाकिस्तान ने ये ये चीन को दे दिया है क्योंकि चीन उसका मित्र राष्ट्र और हमेशा उसके साथ खड़ा रहता है तो ये हिस्सा पाकिस्तान ने चीन को दे दिया है अक्साई चीन में अभी आप तस्वीर देखेंगे अक्साई चीन की तो चीन ने जो वहां व्यवस्था कर रखी है इस तरीके से उसने बर्फ के घर बना रखे हैं लगातार वहां लोग काम करते रहते हैं सुंदर उसने इमारतें भी बना रखी हैं अक्साई चीन के अंदर और पूरी तरीके से जो आधिपत्य स्थापित कर रखा है जबकि हिस्सा भारत का था उसके बाद जब हम देखते हैं तो अरुणाचल प्रदेश के ऊपर उसका जो आता है अरुणाचल प्रदेश के ऊपर आता है कभी अरुणाचल प्रदेश जो था तिब्बत का हिस्सा था और तिब्बत पहले एक अलग से राष्ट्र था 1914 में अंग्रेजों के जमाने में उसके ऊपर एक उसके ऊपर समझौता हुआ भारत और अंग्रेजों के बीच में यह है भारत और तिब्बत के बीच में एक मेघ मोहन रेखा सीमा रेखा से समझौता सिद्धांत हुआ था उसमें अंग्रेजों ने अरुणाचल प्रदेश को भारत को सौंप दिया था भारत को सौंप दिया था उस टाइम चीन भी आया था लेकिन चीन ने कुछ नहीं कहा जब चीन ने अरुणाचल जब चीन ने तिब्बत के ऊपर आक्रमण करके उसको अपने आधिपत्य में ले लिया तभी से चीन कहता है कि ये अरुणाचल प्रदेश की जो है चूंकि वो तिब्बत का हिस्सा है इसलिए वो चीन का हिस्सा है और आज भी चीन ने अरुणाचल प्रदेश का लगभग नब्बे किलोमीटर जमीन को अपने कब्जे में कर रखा है अगर आप इसमें देखें तो ये जो लाल रंग की जा रही है ये मेघ मोहन रेखा जा रही है और चाइना ने अरुणाचल प्रदेश के बिल्कुल पास से जाती है अरुणाचल प्रदेश ये है और ये मेघ मोहन रेखा जो है जाती है जिसे चीन नहीं मानता है वो कहता है अरुणाचल प्रदेश हमारा है और उसमें अरुणाचल प्रदेश में यहाँ तक कि वो कहता है कि अरुणाचल प्रदेश का कोई भी यदि नागरिक चीन जाता है तो वो उसको वीजा नहीं देता है मैं इसके बारे में आगे आपको बताऊंगी तो ये उस इसके ऊपर मतलब युद्ध है मेघ मोहन रेखा है जो इसके ऊपर उनमें विवाद है उसका दूसरा है डोकलाम डोकलाम के ऊपर भी उनका विवाद है डोकलाम के ऊपर यदि हम इसे नक्शे से समझने का प्रयास करते हैं तो ये एक मुर्गी की गर्दन जैसी जगह है जो भूटान के पास है ये डोकलाम क्षेत्र ये भूटान का है जो एक मुर्गी जैसी गर्दन है इससे पहले जब हम अतीत में जाते हैं तो हम देखते हैं कि भारत से पंद्रह राज्य अलग हुए जिसमें नेपाल भूटान ये सारे इंडोनेशिया थाईलैंड ये सारे देश भारत का ही क्षेत्र हुआ करते थे जो भारत से अलग हुए हैं और यहाँ एक छोटी सी मुर्गी जैसी गर्दन का जो हिस्सा है ये भूटान का है चीन चूंकि भूटान का भूटान का है ये ये हिस्सा जो है भूटान का है चीन का यहाँ तक हिस्सा है और ये लाल रंग का जो दिख रहा है ये भूटान का हिस्सा है चीन ये चाहता है कि ये डोकलाम का क्षेत्र है वो भूटान चीन को दे दे एक बार ऐसा हो भी चुका है कि चीन और भूटान ने चीन को ये देने का फायदा कर दिया लेकिन यहाँ पे भारत और भूटान के बीच में एक समझौता है कि जब भी भूटान अपनी कोई विदेश नीति की बात करेगा या विदेश कोई संधि या समझौता करेगा किसी दूसरे देश के साथ उसे उसकी भारत को बताना पड़ेगा उसे भारत से परामर्श लेना पड़ेगा और उसके बदले में भारत उसकी सुरक्षा के लिए हमेशा ही तत्पर रहेगा जब इंडिया को ये बात चल पता चली कि भूटान ये हिस्सा चीन को देने वाला है डोकलाम का तो इंडिया ने उसको मना कर दिया इस बात को देने के लिए क्योंकि यहाँ पे आने के बाद यहाँ पे आने के बाद चीन भारत के और नजदीक आ जाता मना कर दिया तो ये भी चीन और भारत के बीच में एक विवाद का विषय बना हुआ है 
उसके बाद हम जैसे कि मैं आपको बता रहे थे स्टेपल बीजा विवाद उनके बीच में है कि कश्मीर और जो अरुणाचल के यात्री हैं कश्मीर पर के बहुत बड़े हिस्से पर चीन अपना आधिपत्य मानता है अरुणाचल को तो वो अपना मानता ही है तो अरुणाचल और कश्मीर के हिस्से के जो लोग चीन जाना चाहते हैं चीन उनको बीजा नहीं देता उनको वो एक स्टेपल बीजा देता है और भारत उस स्टेबल भी जाके ऊपर अपनी मोहर नहीं लगाता यहाँ तक कि 2007 में जब अरुणाचल के अरुणाचल प्रदेश के मुख्यमंत्री चीन जाना चाहते थे तब उन्होंने वीजा देने से ही मना कर दिया भारत को तो उनके मुख्यमंत्री को कहा कि आपको अपने देश में आने के लिए वीजा की कोई जरूरत नहीं है तो ये स्टेबल वीजा विवाद भी हमेशा भारत और चीन के बीच में चलता रहता है उसके बाद में एक और विवाद जैसे कि आपको पता है कि सभी देशों के लिए जो जीवन है वो नदियां हैं सब बाकी की सारी नदियां अगर भारत की देखोगे तो सारी स्त्रीलिंग है यानी कि महिलाओं के नाम पे है लेकिन एक ऐसी नदी है जिसका पुरुष के नाम पे नामकरण है ब्रह्मपुत्र अर्थात ब्रह्मा का पुत्र और ये जो नदी है सबसे बड़ा भाग इसका तिब्बत में बहता है फिर भारत में आती है और बांग्लादेश के अंदर आती है ये तो चीन इसके ऊपर अपना आधिपत्य पूरी तरीके से मानता है भारत को इसमें बहुत बड़े सबसे बड़े विश्व के जो बांध का निर्माण हुआ है वो ब्रह्मपुत्र नदी के किनारे तिब्बत में ही हुआ है भारत ने भी इसके ऊपर कई बांध बना रखे हैं बांग्लादेश को बड़ी परेशानी होती है कि पहले तिब्बत पानी रोक लेता है मतलब चीन चूंकि तिब्बत के ऊपर चीन का कब्जा है फिर भारत पानी रोक लेता है और बांग्लादेश के लिए बहुत बड़ी समस्या आ जाती है लेकिन चीन भारत को तंग करने के लिए बहुत सारा मलबा जो आपको दिखाई दे रहा है नेट से लिया हुआ ये फोटो है आपको दिख रहा होगा चीन ने रोका ब्रह्मपुत्र का पानी यानी कि वो बहुत सारा मलबा गंदगी अपना ऐसा बहुत सारी चीजें इस ब्रह्मपुत्र में डालता रहता है जिससे वहां का पानी प्रदूषित होता है और प्रदूषित होकर वो इंडिया के अंदर आता है भारत के अंदर आता है जो बहुत गलत है तो इस ब्रह्मपुत्र नदी के ऊपर भी भारत और चीन में हमेशा विवाद बना रहता है अब एक और जो इसके इसके बाद ये तो हो गई सीमा विवाद इन सीमा विवादों के बाद एक बहुत बड़ा जो विवाद है वो मालदीप जो हम सभी जानते हैं कि मालदीप बहुत सुंदर जगह है उसके अंदर 1200 छोटे द्वीप हैं जिसमें से 16 द्वीपों को चीन ने 2006 में लीज पर लिया हुआ है और प्रत्येक द्वीप के ऊपर उन्होंने 30 करोड़ की राशि खर्च की हुई है उन्होंने उनका कहना है चीन का यानी चीन का कहना है कि वो अपना वहां व्यवसाय विकसित कर रहे हैं यानी टूरिज्म का वहां व्यवसाय है और टूरिज्म के जो व्यवसाय को विकसित कर रहे हैं आप यदि मालदीप की फोटो देखोगे तो छोटे छोटे ये यहाँ पे इस तरीके से द्वीप बने हुए हैं जैसे एक अगर इसको कहेंगे ये इस तरीके से छोटे छोटे द्वीप बने हुए हैं ये इस तरीके से बारह सौ द्वीप है और उन द्वीपों में सोलह द्वीप चीन के आदि अधिकार में है और वहां पे और कृत्रिम द्वीप भी चीन बना रहा है इसके ऊपर तो भारत को अब भारत को क्या परेशानी है कि भारत को अगर चीन ने खरीद रखी है वहां पे चीन उसको विकसित करना चाहता है तो ठीक है लेकिन भारत की परेशानी ये है कि जो मालदीप है वो केरल से मात्र छह से चौरासी किलोमीटर दूर है और यदि चीन भारत के ऊपर आक्रमण करता है तो उसे पहुंचने में मात्र पच्चीस मिनट लगेंगे हो सकता है कि भारत को बिना बताए वो चीन भारत का आक्रमण कर दे चीन और 25 मिनट तो जानने में ही लग जाएंगे कि कोई आक्रमण हमारे ऊपर हो रहा है तो ये बहुत खतरनाक स्थिति है हमेशा भारत को इससे डर लगा रहता है भारत हमेशा इसको ध्यान में रखता है हमेशा निगरानी में रहती है भारत की कि कहीं यहाँ पर किसी भी तरीके की युद्ध से संबंधित गतिविधियां ना हो तो मालदीप जो है उनके लिए एक मालदीप पे, पे जो चीन का कब्जा है वो भी दोनों के बीच तनाव का बिंदु है उसके बाद अनुच्छेद तीन सौ सत्तर आपने अभी ये तीन सौ सत्तर को कश्मीर के अंदर से खत्म किया था और जम्मू कश्मीर और लद्दाख को दोनों को केंद्र शासित देश बना दिया था भारत ने चूंकि कश्मीर के अंदर लद्दाख के अंदर पाकिस्तान और उसके मित्र राष्ट्र चीन दोनों ही अपनी आतंकवादी गतिविधियों को चलाते रहते थे भारत के ऊपर बना हमेशा ही आंतरिक जो आंतरिक आतंकवाद फैलाते रहते थे वहां पर तीन से सात तीन से सत्तर को खत्म करने के बाद चीन की जो दखल अंदाजी थी वो भी बहुत खत्म हो गई है और चीन इससे भी बौखलाया हुआ है चीन इससे भी परेशान है चीन और पाकिस्तान दोनों ही क्योंकि उनके अस्त्र और शस्त्र भी वहां नहीं बिक रहे हैं तो इसके कारण भी ये एक मुद्दा है दोनों के बीच में विवाद का और बहुराष्ट्रीय कंपनियां 
अभी तक जो हम जानते हैं कि बहुत सारी बहुराष्ट्रीय कंपनियां चीन के अंदर स्थापित थी क्योंकि चीन चीन की जो सरकार में है उन्होंने उन बहुराष्ट्रीय कंपनियों के लिए बहुत सारी सुविधाएं दी हुई थी चूंकि चीन के अंदर जनसंख्या भी ज्यादा है तो इस कारण से ये बहुराष्ट्रीय कंपनियों ने चीन में अपना बहुत सारी कंपनियों को खोल रखा है लेकिन चीन ने अब अपनी तानाशाही प्रवृत्ति प्रारंभ कर दी है उस तानाशाही प्रवृत्ति से वो कंपनियां परेशान हो गई और उन कंपनियों ने भारत को प्रस्ताव रखा कि हम भारत को रखा कि हम आपके देश में आना चाहते हैं क्योंकि भारत के पास भी बहुत बड़ी जनसंख्या है और इन कंपनियों में काम करने के लिए जनसंख्या की अत्यंत आवश्यकता होती है लोगों की आवश्यकता होती है जनमानस की आवश्यकता होती है और भारत ने भी समस्त सुविधाएं देने का और स्वायत्तता देने का उन कंपनियों से वायदा किया अब चूंकि अभी तक उनका तानाशाही चलती थी यदि वो कंपनियां ही चली जाएंगी तो चीन जिस तरीके से कमा रहा है जिस तरीके से मध्यम वर्ग उसका ग्राहक है वो खत्म हो जाएगा तो ये मेन जो बिंदु थे भारत और चीन के बीच में विवाद के बिंदु हैं लेकिन इससे भी हम परे हट के जब बात करते हैं भारत और चीन के संबंधों के बारे में क्योंकि जिस तरीके से भारत और चीन पड़ोसी राज्य है और एक टाइम ये नारा भी था कि भारत भारत और चीनी भाई भाई और उन दोनों के बीच में जो वास्तविक संबंध है वो कैसे हैं कि जैसे बताया इनके दोनों के सांस्कृतिक और आर्थिक संबंध हमेशा से ही रहे हैं दोनों के दोनों के 1962 का युद्ध हुआ लेकिन वो युद्ध खत्म हो गया उनके जो संबंध थे वो बराबर चलते रहे भारत ने प, चलते रहे उनके संबंध तो हम पहले राजनीतिक संबंधों के ऊपर बात करते हैं उन्नीस से पचास से लेकर उन्नीस सौ नाइनटीन फिफ्टी से लेकर नाइनटीन फिफ्टी नाइन तक भारत और चीन के जो संबंध थे बहुत मधुर थे जैसे आपको बताया कि दलाई लामा धर्मशाला में आके बस गए उसके बाद दोनों के बीच में तनाव उत्पन्न हुआ और नाइनटीन में युद्ध हुआ और युद्ध होने के बाद वो दोनों कट्टर दुश्मन हो गए 1962 से लेकर 1966 तक यानी चार साल जो थे दोनों के बीच में कट्टर दुश्मनी रही 1966 में चीन के राष्ट्रपति जियांग जोमिन ने सबसे पहली पहल करी और वो भारत की तीन दिवसीय यात्रा पर आए उन्होंने ग्यारह सूत्री समझौता किया दोनों के संबंध सुधरने लगे उन संबंधों को सुधरने में उन्नीस तक उन दोनों के बहुत अच्छे संबंध हो गए इन दोनों के विशेष जो इनमें चेंज आया वो आया 1988 में जब भारत के प्रधानमंत्री राजीव गांधी थे उन्होंने द्विपक्षीय वार्ता करने का संबंधों को अच्छे से विकसित करने का प्रयास किया उन्होंने और 1990 1992 में राष्ट्रपति वेंकट रमन और 9, 2003 में भारतीय प्रधानमंत्री वाजपेयी जी चीन दौरे पे गए डॉक्टर मनमोहन सिंह जी भी दो आठ और 2013 में चीन यात्रा पर गए 2011 को चीन भारत विनियम वर्ष और 2012 को चीन भारत मैत्री एवं सहयोग वर्ष के रूप में मनाया गया यानी कि 2012 तक आते आते हमारे संबंध बहुत अच्छे हो गए चीन के साथ 2015 में भारतीय प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी ने भी चीन का दौरा किया उसके बाद चीन ने भारतीय तीर्थ यात्रियों के लिए नाथूला दर्रा खोल दिया अक्टूबर 2019 को चीनी राष्ट्रपति सी जिनपिंग भारत आए और चेन्नई में दूसरा शिखर सम्मेलन हुआ अर्थात उन्नीस से लेकर उन्नीस सौ से लेकर 2019 तक भारत और चीन के बीच में बहुत सारे संधि और समझौते हुए उसके सांस्कृतिक संबंध उसके आर्थिक संबंध उसके रक्षा संबंधी विज्ञान और सभी तरीके के जो संबंध थे बहुत अच्छे हो गए लेकिन तभी कोरोना चीन की तरफ से आ गया अब चीन ने चीन में चीन ने फैलाया ये चीन की से फैला ये दोनों एक अलग अलग शब्द है कि ये कोरोना चीन ने फैलाया ये चीन से फैला हम इसके ऊपर विवाद नहीं करते हैं क्योंकि इन दोनों में बहुत इन दो एक लाइन के अंदर बहुत बड़ा अंतर है और जिसके ऊपर हमारा विश्व के नेता आज भी शांत है वो कोई भी नहीं कहते हैं कि अमेरिका के अलावा कि चीन चीन ने फैलाया या चीन से फैला आज तक भी स्पष्ट नहीं है तो ये जो संबंध थे 2019 में जब 2020 में जब गलवान घाटी में सैन्य झड़प हुई तो भारत और चीन के संबंध बहुत निचले स्तर के हो गए यानी कड़वाहट जो है वो दोबारा स्टार्ट हो गई उसके बाद से लेकर आज तक पांच बार सैन्य कमांडर स्तरीय वार्ता हो चुकी है 
लेकिन तनाव की स्थिति अभी बनी हुई है अभी हाल में 24 मार्च 2022 को चीन के जो विदेश मंत्री थे यान वांग यी वो बिना किसी आधिकारिक घोषणा के भारत पहुंचे उन्होंने 25 मार्च को अजीत डोवाल जो राष्ट्रीय सुरक्षा सलाहकार हैं और हमारे विदेश मंत्री एस जयशंकर से मुलाकात की और दोनों देशों के बीच में शांति बहाल करने के लिए अच्छे संबंध स्थापित करने के लिए पहल प्रारंभ हुई ये थे भारत और चीन के राजनीतिक संबंध जो मैन अभी आप 25 मार्च और 2022 के जो फोटो देखेंगे वो अजीत डोभाल के साथ और मंत्री जय एस जयशंकर के साथ जो विदेश मंत्री आए हुए थे उनके ये उनके टाइम की फोटो है जो मेन हमारे संबंध है भारत और चीन के वो है आर्थिक संबंध हम सभी जानते हैं कि चीन और चीन से बहुत सारा सामान भारत आता है लेकिन आप ये मानिए कि जो सामान भारत आता है उसका रॉ मेटेरियल उसका कच्चा माल भारत से चीन के जाता है तो चीन जब उस रॉ मेटेरियल से सामान बना के भारत ही भेजता है तो निश्चित ही वो पैसा ज्यादा कमाता है यदि हम उसको देखें यदि उनके देखें कि उनके आर्थिक संबंध क्या है तो 2002 में थे जो 2.9 बिलियन अमेरिकन डॉलर थे उनका जो व्यापार था जो 2001 में 31.85 पॉइंट पिछासी बिलियन अमेरिकी डॉलर हो गया दो में और बढ़ा अट्ठावन उनतीस बिलियन अमेरिकी डॉलर हो गया और इन 2019 में तो भारत और जो चीन के बीच संबंध था जो व्यापारिक संबंध था या व्यापार था वो 92.68 बिलियन डॉलर का हो गया तभी कोरोना संकट आ गया और कोरोना संकट के तहत के तहत 2020 में भारत और चीन जो व्यापार था वो घट गया और वो घट के 87.6 बिलियन डॉलर हो गया जो उन्नीस से सत्रह के बाद सबसे कम था यानी 5.6 प्रतिशत ही घटा केवल उसके बाद जब हम दोबारा देखते हैं उसी दौरान 2020 में ही भारत ने उसके दो हिस्से से अधिक चीनी ऐप्स बंद कर दिए प्रतिबंधित कर दिया जिसे बीच तो टिकटॉक मेन थे उनको बंद कर दिया उसके बावजूद यदि हम 2021 का आंकलन करते हैं तो देखते हैं कि दोनों के बीच में जो व्यापार है वो एक बिलियन डॉलर का है यानी अब का सबसे ज्यादा है जो 43.3 प्रतिशत अधिक है तो हम देख रहे हैं कि सीना सीमा पर तो जानी दुश्मन है लेकिन व्यापार जो है दोनों के बीच में और ज्यादा बढ़ रहा है क्योंकि दोनों एक दूसरे के ऊपर आश्रित हैं दोनों का ही व्यापार एक दूसरे से चलता है इसलिए व्यापार मतलब चीज दुश्मनी अपनी जगह है लेकिन व्यापार अपनी जगह संबंध अपनी जगह पैसा अपनी जगह तो ये देखते हैं हम तो यदि आप, आप देखिए कि किसी के बीच में अगर दुकानदार और ग्राहक का संबंध होता है तो क्या वो खत्म हो सकता है कभी नहीं हो सकता जब मैं भारत और चीन के बारे में सोचती हूँ तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि दो भाई भाई हैं दोनों लड़ लिए हैं और दोनों अपने स्वार्थ के लिए एक हो जाते हैं भारत में जो चीनी मोबाइल का मार्केट बहुत बड़ा है यहाँ तक कि दिल्ली जो मेट्रो है वहां चीन की कंपनी है एस यू जी सी नाम की कंपनी है वो कंपनी संभालती है सोलर मार्केट जो है वो चीनी उत्पादों पर बहुत निर्भर है जो अभी सोलर जो हमारे यहाँ आ रही है सोलर सारे प्लांट लग रहे हैं वहां के जो सारे प्रोडक्ट या आ रहे हैं वो सारे चीन से आ रहे हैं भारत का जो थर्मल पावर है वो चीनियों पर निर्भर है पावर सेक्टर में भी सत्तर से अस्सी फीसदी उत्पाद जो चीन से आते हैं भारत की एक हजार भारत की जो एक हजार कंपनी है भारत के अंदर चीनी कंपनियों ने एक हजार से अधिक निवेश कर रखा है यहाँ तक कि जब हम बात करते हैं दिवाली की जब हम बात करते हैं तो दिवाली भारत में मनाई जाती है पटाखे चीन से आते हैं होली भारत में मनाई जाती है रंग चीन से आता है पतंग भारत में उड़ाई जाती है पतंग का माजा चीन से आता है 2020 में जो दवाइयां बनी दवाइयों का जो मेटर जो रॉ मेटेरियल था वो भी चीन से आया था तो इस तरीके से और भारत ने उसकी दवाइयां तैयार करे के पूरे देश में भेजी थी यहाँ तक कि 2020 के अंदर ही मैं एक शादी में जा रही थी और मैं एक प्योर जॉर्जेट की पोशाक लेने गई मैंने दुकानदार से कहा कि ये पोशाक आप थोड़े दिन पहले तो आप बहुत कम रेट में दे रही थी अभी अभी मतलब पंद्रह दिन के अंदर आपने इसकी रेट जो है तीन चार आज तीन चार हजार रुपए बढ़ा दी तो उस दुकानदार ने कहा कि मैडम उस जो जॉर्जेट का रेशो आता है वो भी चीन से आता है क्योंकि वो चीन से आना बंद हो गया है इसलिए यहाँ पे जो जॉर्जेट है वो महंगी हो गई है यहाँ पे तो आप देखिए कि भारत कितनी चीजें जो चीन से हमारे यहाँ आती है 
तो भारत का जो आर्थिक जो संबंध है वो कभी खत्म नहीं हो सकते वैसे भी हम मानते हैं कि चीन का जो है दुनिया की तरह है चीन वो सिर्फ पैसे कमाने के लिए पैसे कमाना चाहता है उसका ना कोई मित्र है और ना कोई शत्रु है जहां से उसको पैसा प्राप्त होता है वो ही उसका मित्र है मेरे को मैं ऐसा सोचती हूँ कि तो भारत और चीन के जो संबंध है वो इतने खराब कभी नहीं हो सकते क्योंकि भारत चीन के संबंध केवल सीमा विवाद नहीं है भारत चीन का जो मेन संबंध है वो आर्थिक संबंध है और आर्थिक संबंध जो है अर्थ जो है पैसा बहुत कुछ करा देता है तो और भारत अगर चीन को भी भारत से अच्छा बाजार कहीं नहीं मिल सकता तो चीन कभी भी प्रयास नहीं करेगा कि भारत के साथ उसके संबंध खराब हो हाँ भारत प्रयास कर सकता है कि वो आत्मनिर्भर हो सकता है अपने लघु उद्योगों को बढ़ा सकता है भारत जो भारत की जो निर्भरता है चीन के ऊपर वो उसको खत्म कर सकता है अपने लघु उद्योगों को बढ़ाकर तो चीन को उससे नुकसान होगा तो चीन कभी नहीं चाहेगा कि भारत के उससे संबंध खराब हो और उसका मैं, मैं, मतलब जो भी जो आता है जो उसका उत्पादन आता है वो भारत के अंदर ना बिके यही कारण है कि चीनी विदेश मंत्री ने पहल करी और वो भारत आए उसके बाद विज्ञान और औद्योगिक क्षेत्र की बात करते हैं तो भारतीय कंपनियों ने चीन में तीन सूचना प्रौद्योगिकी कॉरिडोर स्थापित किए हुए हैं रक्षा संबंधी बात करते हैं तो भारत और चीन के बीच में एक आतंकवादी विरोधी अभ्यास है जो जिसे हम हेड इन हेड के नाम से बुलाते हैं अभी तो बंद है उसके ऊपर कार्य क्योंकि आतंकवादी नहीं है अभी तो अभी तो युद्ध युद्ध हो रहे हैं कोरोना फैला हुआ है तो आठ दौर उसके स्थापित हो चुके हैं पीपल टू पीपल कनेक्ट प्रोग्राम की अगर बात करते हैं तो भारत और चीन के बीच में उन्होंने पीपल टू पीपल टू पीपल कनेक्ट के कई प्रोग्राम बनाए हैं जिसमें उन्होंने चौदह प्रांतों को सिस्टर के रूप में जोड़ा है और फुजियन प्रांत और तमिलनाडु को सिस्टर स्टेट के रूप में जोड़ा है यानी कि वहां के कल्चर का आदान प्रदान किया जाएगा उसी तरीके से चिंजो एवं चेन्नई नगर को सिस्टर सिटी के रूप में विकसित करने का उनका प्रोग्राम था अब आता है शैक्षणिक जो संबंध है भारत और चीन के बीच में शैक्षणिक संबंध है 2006 के बीच में ही भारत और चीन के बीच में ई पर समझौता हुआ जिसके तहत भारत और चीन भारत 25 देशों को चीन में भेजेगा जिसकी छात्रवृत्ति भारत देगा और चीन अपने 25 देश बच्चों को भारत में भेजेगा जिसकी छात्रवृत्ति चीन देगा और भारत के जो भारत के बच्चे हैं तो लगभग भारत से कहे तो चौबीस हजार पच्चीस ही नहीं चौबीस हजार बच्चे चीन के अंदर पढ़ रहे हैं जिसमें मेडिकल के छात्र हैं इसमें मेरी बिटिया भी है जो चीन के अंदर मेडिकल में पढ़ रही है और 25 जो स्टूडेंट चीन के आते हैं बहुत ज्यादा नहीं आते लेकिन पच्चीस स्टूडेंट जो आते हैं वो आगरा यूनिवर्सिटी के अंदर पढ़ रहे हैं और वहां पे जो शैक्षणिक संबंध है बहुत अच्छे हैं मैंने भी अपनी बच्ची को वहां पे एडमिशन दिलाया उसका बहुत बड़ा कारण यही था कि राजनीति विज्ञान का विद्यार्थी होने के नाते मैं इन दोनों के संबंध को जानने का मैंने प्रयास किया मुझे महसूस हुआ कि भारत और चीन जो है वो परंपरागत शत्रु होने के साथ साथ परंपरागत मित्र भी है जिस तरीके से दो भाई लड़ते हैं लेकिन एक दूसरे का बहुत ज्यादा अहित नहीं करते एक दूसरे को अंदर ही अंदर काटने का तो प्रयास करते हैं लेकिन एक दूसरे का अहित नहीं करते मुझे ऐसा ही प्रयास ऐसा ही महसूस हुआ और चीनी मैं चीन के अंदर सात दिन रह के आई हूँ उन सात दिनों में भी मुझे ऐसा ही लगा कि वहां का जिस तरीके का सुरक्षा व्यवस्था है मुझे महसूस हुआ कि मेरी बिटिया वहां पूर्ण रूप से सुरक्षित है तभी मैंने वहां छोड़ने का प्रयास किया उसको कि वहां की जो सुरक्षा व्यवस्था है बच्चों के लिए या वहां पे जिस तरीके का हम देखते हैं कि भारत के अंदर भारत में जब हम मैं चूंकि जब वहां गई तो मैंने वहां के लोगों से मैं चाइनीज नहीं जानती थी क्योंकि वहां इंग्लिश भी बहुत कम बोली जाती है हिंदी तो कोई जानता ही नहीं है यहाँ तक कि हिंदुस्तान के बारे में लोग नहीं जानते क्योंकि जो चीनी लोग हैं हम हम यहाँ पे राजनीति की किसी पान की दुकान पे किसी चौराहे पे हर जगह राजनीति की बात करते हैं लेकिन चीन के अंदर वहां के जो नागरिक हैं आम नागरिक हैं उन्हें राजनीति के ऊपर चर्चा करने का ना तो टाइम है और ना ही उनका आवश्यकता महसूस होती है और ना ही उनके पास मेटेरियल है क्योंकि पूरे विश्व की न्यूज उनके पास आती ही नहीं है सारे जो विश्व की न्यूज के चैनल है वो उन्होंने बंद कर रखे हैं तो वो नहीं जानते ज्यादा की भारत के बारे में तो भारत के जो लोग थे भारत में जो जो बच्चे जो सीनियर हो चुके पांच साल से पढ़ रहे थे उन्हीं से मैंने इसके बारे में जानने का प्रयास किया राजनीति विज्ञान के विद्यार्थी होने के नाते अभी मैं बहुत सारे ब्लॉग भी देखती हूँ तो जानने का प्रयास करती हूँ कि भारत के लोगों के लिए चीन चीन के जो आम नागरिक है वो क्या सोचता है 
तो चीन का जो आम नागरिक है वो नहीं जानता भारत और चीन की शत्रुता को वो इंडिया भी नहीं बोलता वो हिंदू बोलता है और हिंदू मतलब के आप हिंदू का मतलब के चूंकि वहां का जो बौद्ध धर्म वहां के मानने वाले हैं और गौतम बुद्ध इंडिया से हुए हैं तो वो यहाँ के लोगों की बहुत रेस्पेक्ट करते हैं वहां के लोगों को बहुत आदर की दृष्टि से देखते हैं उनका मानना है कि यहाँ के योगा जो है यहाँ का योगा है वो इसको बहुत पॉपुलर है योगा चीन के अंदर भारत का जो बॉलीवुड है वो बहुत पॉपुलर है और बॉलीवुड के कहने के चीन के लोग ये जानते हैं कि भारत के अंदर बहुत सुंदर महिलाएं हैं तो भारत के अंदर बहुत सुंदर पुरुष हैं वो कहते हैं कि बहुत सुंदर लोग भारत के अंदर रहते हैं पूरे भारत को वो नहीं जानते केवल बॉलीवुड को जानते और हम सब जानते हैं कि हमारी हीरोइन है हमारी हीरो कितने स्मार्ट इतने खूबसूरत है तो वो जानते हैं बहुत सारे गाने मतलब वहां पे पॉपुलर है हिंदी गाने जबकि हिंदी हिंदी उनको नहीं आती है लेकिन गाने बहुत पॉपुलर हैं उनके वहां पे हिंदी मतलब हिंदी मूवीज के गाने बहुत पॉपुलर हैं वो ये जानते हैं बहुत सुंदर मानते हैं यहाँ को और वो साथ में ये भी मानते हैं कि हमारे भारत में और वास्तविकता है भी कि भारत में भारत की महिलाएं सुरक्षित नहीं है उनके जो जनरल ओपिनियन है वो है कि भारत में भारत की महिलाएं सुरक्षित नहीं है उनके साथ रेप किया जाता है उनको मार दिया जाता है और भारत की महिलाओं का कोई स्थान नहीं है जबकि चीन के अंदर मैंने देखा कि जिस तरीके का लगभग पहनावा पुरुष पहनते हैं वैसे ही महिलाएं पहनती हैं जितना अधिकार पुरुषों को है उतना ही महिलाओं को है तो वहां पर बहुत ज्यादा महिला और पुरुष वाला नहीं है वहां पर लिंग भेद नहीं है बहुत ज्यादा जितना मैंने जाना कि वहां लिंग भेद बहुत ज्यादा नहीं है तो भारत और चीन के संबंधों के बारे में जब हम देखते हैं वहां के तो जानते ही नहीं है वो लोग हिंदुस्तान को ज्यादा ज्यादा जानते ही नहीं है तो अतः मैं तो जो भी है भारत और चीन के राष्ट्राध्यक्ष हैं किसी भी देश के राष्ट्राध्यक्ष हैं उनसे यही कहना चाहूंगी कि वो वो किसी भी राष्ट्र जो भक्ति है जो भावना है उसको तो मन में रखे ही रखें साथ ही मानवता के प्रति जो प्रेम है उसको जागृत रखें क्योंकि कोई भी राज्य जो है मनुष्य का ब्रद रूप होता है जब भी सीमा पर कोई एक सैनिक मरता है तो मरता तो एक मानव ही है ना तो हमें निश्चित ही अपने देश की सीमाओं की सुरक्षा करनी चाहिए लेकिन उससे पहले मानव जाति की सुरक्षा करनी चाहिए और उसको सम्मान देना चाहिए इस अंतरराष्ट्रीय मंच से से सभी राष्ट्रों के राष्ट्राध्यक्षों से मेरा तो यही निवेदन है लेकिन अभी जो यूक्रेन युद्ध के टाइम पे मैं देख रही हूँ मुझे बहुत दुख हो रहा है कि मानवता को सबसे ज्यादा चोट पहुंच रही है दोनों ही देशों का सिर्फ अहम जीत रहा है यदि हम भारत चीन के संबंधों की बात करते हैं तो मैं ये मानती हूँ कि हमें उन संबंधों पर कुछ ध्यान देना पड़ेगा कि जिस तरीके से भारत जो है चीन के ऊपर निर्भर है उसे अपनी निर्भरता को कम करनी पड़ेगी कि जिस तरीके से मैंने आपको बताया कि दिवाली पे पटाखे दिवाली पे पटाखे इंडिया में चलते हैं लेकिन आते चीन से है लाइट चीन से आती है होली के रंग चीन से आते हैं पतंगबाजी का माजा चीन से आता है तो क्या हम इन सबके बिना नहीं रह सकते या हम अपने देश में निर्माण नहीं कर सकते मैं दिवाली के टाइम पे चीन में थी विश्वविद्यालय प्रशासन ने वहां पे हमें दिवाली पूजा करने का तो परमिशन दी लेकिन पटाखे छोड़ने की परमिशन नहीं दी उन्होंने कहा पटाखों पटाखे से बहुत ज्यादा शोर होता है और प्रदूषण फैलता है तो क्या प्रदूषण वो भारत में फैलाते हैं तो अपने यहाँ नहीं फैलाते निर्माण वहां होता है तो क्या हम इन पटाखों को या जो भी प्रदूषित करने वाली चीजें उनको खत्म नहीं कर सकते तो हमें अगर उन पर रोक लगाते हैं और जो छोटी छोटी चीजें जो चीन से हमारे यहाँ आती हैं उन हम चीजों को अपने यहाँ के जो लघु और कुटीर उद्योग है उनको हम विकसित करके हमारी जो निर्भरता है चीन के ऊपर हम उसको खत्म कर सकते हैं जब हम निर्भरता को खत्म कर देंगे तो हम चीन से डरना भी बंद कर देंगे तो सबसे पहले तो हमें इसके ऊपर कार्य करना होगा निष्कर्ष और जो सुझाव वो है मेरे यही है कि भारत और चीन की सीमा बहुत लंबी है जो अभी तक कोई भी उसके ऊपर तारबंदी नहीं है उस तारबंदी को तारबंदी को करना चाहिए उसका सीमांकन और परिसीमन उसके करी जाने की आवश्यकता है उसके सीमा निश्चित करने की आवश्यकता है उसके बाद से जो भारत की निर्भरता बढ़ रही है चीन के ऊपर उसे कम करने की आवश्यकता है भारत को अपने लघु और कुटीर उद्योगों को विकसित करना चाहिए दोनों को महत्वपूर्ण चूंकि बहुत विश्व के दो बड़े राष्ट्र हैं तो उनको अपने मतभेदों को दूर करना चाहिए 
चीन को भी चाहिए कि पाकिस्तान का वो भारत विरोधी मुद्दों पर साथ ना दे आतंकवाद को खत्म करने का प्रयास करे भारत को भी बिना डरे हुए सड़क निर्माण कर रहे करना चाहिए क्योंकि वो भारत की सुरक्षा के लिए बहुत आवश्यक है भारत को भारत को भी किसी भी महाशक्ति या किसी भी और देश के बहतांबे में आकर अपने जो चीन के साथ संबंध जो है वो खत्म खराब नहीं करने चाहिए क्योंकि जैसा भी यूक्रेन के मामले में आप देख ही रहे हैं कि यूक्रेन समाप्त हो चुका है बोलने वाले तो यही कहते हैं कि रूस ने सॉरी अमेरिका ने उसको उकसाया और आज पूरी तरीके से यूक्रेन समाप्त हो चुका है तो भारत को किसी भी अन्य राष्ट्रीय महाशक्ति के बहकावे में नहीं आना चाहिए क्योंकि युद्ध में सब कुछ खोया जा सकता है पाया कुछ नहीं जा सकता यदि हम देखते हैं तो आज जो है पूरा विश्व जो है बारूद के ढेर पर बैठा हुआ है इतना बारूद है पूरे विश्व के अंदर कि इस पृथ्वी को सात बार नष्ट किया जा सकता है तो युद्ध को हमें नहीं लाना है युद्ध से सब कुछ खोया जा सकता है चीन से भी हमारी यही रिक्वेस्ट है कि जो भारत को स्थायी सदस्यता प्राप्त होनी है उसके वो प्रतिकूल रुख अपनाए और सहयोग करें कि भारत को स्थायी सदस्यता प्राप्त हो सके और अंत में मैं यही कहना चाहूंगी कि प्रत्येक राष्ट्र को भारत हो या चीन हो मानवता को सर्वोपरि रखना चाहिए मानवता मानव जाति के उत्थान और विकास के लिए कार्य करें विश्व समाज विश्व राज्य और विश्व जो गांव की जो कल्पना है उसको साकार करने का प्रयास किया जाए करना चाहिए हमें उम्मीद है अभी जो जिस तरीके का चल रहा है हमें उम्मीद है कि 2020 में चीन और भारत के जो संबंध होंगे वो उज्जवल होंगे मैं कुछ एक एक मिनट में आपको अपनी चीन यात्रा के दौरान की फोटो में आपको दिखाना चाहूंगी ये चीन के त्यंजिन सिटी के है जो मेन चौक है ये एक है उसके अंदर ये मैं आपको कुछ जल्दी जल्दी मुझे जो सबसे अच्छा लगा वहां देखिए कि वहां हमेशा ऐसा लगता है दिवाली है प्रत्येक पेड़ पे ये ऐसा नहीं है दिवाली के टाइम पे प्रत्येक पेड़ के ऊपर हमेशा इतनी लाइटनिंग रहती है कि हमेशा ऐसा लगता है दिवाली है और कलरफुल लाइट होती है आप देखिए एक एक पेड़ के ऊपर लाइट लगी हुई है अब ये देखिए घास के ऊपर लाइट है पेड़ के ऊपर लाइट है और ये चौबीसों घंटे जलती है वहां पर जो सोलर जो ऊर्जा से बनाई जा रही है बिजली वो बहुत उन्नत स्थिति में है आ, ये देखिए पेड़ के ऊपर बिजली ये हमारी खींची हुई फोटो है वहां पे हमेशा रात दिन मतलब पूरी रात ऐसा लगता ही नहीं है रात हो गई है हमेशा पूरी लाइट में ऐसे ही जगमगाता रहता है पूरा चीन जगमगाता रहता है और दूसरी सबसे अच्छी बात देखिए लगी मुझे कि आप देखिए कि हम सभी एक ग्रुप में हैं और आसपास कोई चीनी नहीं खड़ा हुआ ना हमें देख रहा है यदि भारत में इस तरीके से भारतीय लोग जो आए चूंकि हम सकल सूरत से तो अलग लगते हैं तो यदि चीनी लोग इस तरीके से झुंड बना के आ जाए तो आसपास के लोग जो है उनको देखने के लिए खड़े हो जाएंगे लेकिन चीनी लोगों को कोई मतलब नहीं है कोई आए कोई जाए ये हम जब निकल रहे थे हम बाजार में घूम रहे थे तो एक पुलिस हमारे पीछे जरूर हमें स्पॉट कर रही थी देख रही थी कि हम क्या गतिविधियां कर रहे हैं बाकी के कोई भी चीनी हमें देख नहीं रहा ना हमें ढेर के खड़ा है यदि आप वहां की सिटी बसों की भी बात करें तो हर एक सिटी बस में भी ऐसी है वहां के विकास की बात करें जब मैं चीन गई तो निश्चित जो सोच के गई थी मैं चीन मुझे दूसरा ही रूप दी चीन बहुत विकसित कंट्री है चीन की टेक्नोलॉजी बहुत विकसित है बहुत क्लीन और नीट कंट्री है जितना मैंने देखा सात दिनों के अंदर बहुत अनुशासन है कानून का पालन होता है बहुत ज्यादा बहुत सुरक्षा का ध्यान रखा जाता है एक और जो बड़ी बात लगी वहां की दुकानें देखिए हमारी दुकानों के आगे बाहर बाहर और गेट निकाल लेंगे तख्ते लगा देंगे बाहर तक भीड़ जमा होगी ये एक दुकान है इसमें यहाँ से जाने का रास्ता है यहाँ पे देखिए ये दो लोग खरीदारी कर रहे हैं ये दुकान का बोर्ड लगा हुआ है और ये इस तरीके से दुकान के अंदर जाते हैं यानी कि आपको सड़क के ऊपर कहीं भी कोई भीड़ नजर नहीं आएगी निश्चित ही हमारा जो कंट्री है वो भारत और चीन शत्रु कंट्री है लेकिन फिर भी मैं उसकी बहुत मुरीद हुई वहां का जो विकास है उसको मैंने देखा तो मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा कि हमें भी चाहे शत्रु ही सही हमें उससे सीखना चाहिए जो स्वच्छता का जो क्लीननेस का आ, हमारी सरकार ने एक मुहिम चला रखी है वो जरूर करनी चाहिए जब से मैं चीन से आई हूँ तब से मुझे वास्तव में ऐसा लगता है कि भारत में हर जगह बहुत गंदगी है और उसके लिए हम सब जिम्मेदार हैं उसके लिए हम सबको कार्य करना पड़ेगा तो हमें ये जरूर करना चाहिए और उसके बाद में ये कहूंगी कि दोनों को अपने संबंध अच्छे रखने चाहिए मानवता की रक्षा करनी चाहिए जो व्यक्ति और जो देश मानवता की रक्षा नहीं कर सकता उसे ईश्वर की आराधना करना है का भी कोई हक नहीं है वो ईश्वर की आराधना करने के भी लायक नहीं है मैं इतना ही
कहना चाहूंगी इस चर्चा को विराम देना चाहूंगी धन्यवाद थैंक यू That was amazing, uh, Dr. Verma. Let me congratulate you for selecting such an amazing topic. But the yehi hamari IISTT ki two ka success hai ki hamare paas itne diverse discipline ke log hai jo itne alag alag tarikhe ki topic leke aate jo shayad ham do log baithke to soch nahi sakte. So aap itna shanda topic leke aaye ki bahut acha lag raha aur main chat box ke andar dekh rahi hu ki log aapki photographs ki, aapki presentation ki. आपकी बोलने की स्टाइल की बहुत तारीफ कर रहे हैं और आई वुड लाइक टू टेल ऑल द ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स हियर दैट वी हैव आवर पेट्रन एंड प्रिंसिपल डॉक्टर हुकम सिंह जी विद अस सर आपका यहां पर बहुत-बहुत स्वागत है अभिनंदन है सो डॉक्टर इफ एनी क्वेश्चंस काइंडली रेज योर हेड इफ एनी क्वेश्चंस अभी मैं देख रही हूं बड़ी संख्या में लोग जुड़े हुए हैं आज सुबह से जुड़ी हुई हूं अभी सबसे ज्यादा 2 से 20 जुड़े हुए लोग हैं मैडम ये 220 लोग 28 कंट्रीज से हैं मैं आपको ये भी बताना चाहूंगी मुझे बहुत हाँ गर्व फील हो रहा है और हमें भी आपको अपने बीच पाकर बहुत गर्व फील हो रहा है फील हो रहा है हां और एनी क्वेश्चंस इफ एनी क्वेश्चंस प्लीज लेट मी नो अश डॉक्टर वर्मा देयर इज लॉट ऑफ प्रेज फॉर यू एनीवेज सो नाउ इट्स टाइम टू फॉर्मली थैंक डॉक्टर वर्मा Dear Dr. Verma, let me congratulate you for the amazing topic you have chosen: politic and political environmental pollution. As when politics get polluted, the wars happen. You spoke about Ukraine and Russia war because of this war, humanity is bleeding, as it is boosting the ego of two political leaders. Absolutely, true. Only one side is losing. Both sides are losing. You you made us understand so well about the finger area dispute. of indo china border you spoke about indo china relations are very strong on cultural and economic basis but after covid 19 it has fallen down badly and as if now the relations are strained between indo china and i really hope that we are not going to be russia and ukraine i really pray to god so i would like to take this opportunity to thank you for giving us your valuable time at uh, to talk in ISTTP2 it was quite apparent that how every single person including me was engrossed in your talk and trust me there's so much more to learn from your knowledge and experience it was treat here in you i thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time to be a keynote speaker at ISTTP2 your presence and wise words helped me to understand other people also understand the main cause we are here for the environmental conservation in the best possible way all thanks to your enlightening words that inspired so many people out there including me dr verma aapka bahut bahut dhanyawad bahut bahut dhanyawad aur hum aisa mante hain aur aise aise aap se aasha karte hain ki jab bhi hum is tarah ke programs karenge aap hamare sath hamesha judengi aur hamare isi tarah se hausla afzai karengi aur hamare delegates ko acche 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 cheeze batayengi aur dikhayengi आपने जो बीड़ा उठाया है आपने जो अलग जगाई है उस उसक में हम सब साथ हैं थैंक यू सो मच सो एज आई हैव टोल्ड यू दैट वी हैव आर पेट्रन एंड प्रिंसिपल विद अस so uh, as i always introduce him to you all that followers think and talk about problems and leaders think and talk about solutions so i would like to call upon the patron and the principal uh, dr hukam singh ji for a few words on the stage so the stage is all yours sir aapka stage pe bahut bahut swagat abhinandan hum bahut khush hain aapko apne beech pa kar aap sabhi ko मेरा यथा योग्य आज वैसा प्रश्न दसम विक्रम संबत दो हजार आधा आधा कर लो यार यूज कॉमन श्रवण नक्षत्र सात योग में आयोजित 
आई एस टी टी पी सेकेंड के डे ऑफ सिक्स छठा दिन है ना के अवसर पर मैं महाविद्यालय परिवार की ओर से आप सभी का अभिनंदन करता हूं आज की हमारी इस व्याख्यान माला में जिन विद्वानों ने हमारे मंच को अलंकृत किया डॉक्टर मीरा श्रीवास्तव जी पूर्व प्रिंसिपल बीकानेर राजस्थान इंडिया डॉक्टर अजय प्रकाश गुप्ता जी सी एस आई आर इंडिया जम्मू इंडिया डॉक्टर वासुदेव गुरु मिले एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर कमला नेहरू कॉलेज महाराष्ट्र डॉक्टर रुचि शर्मा प्रोफेसर एंड डीन जागरण लेक सिटी यूनिवर्सिटी भोपाल और डॉक्टर शशि वर्मा जी एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज बीकानेर राजस्थान इंडिया डॉक्टर रितु श्रीवास्तव मुंबई और डॉक्टर अभिषेक मेहता पारुल यूनिवर्सिटी वडोदरा गुजरात इंडिया आप सभी का इस मंच से मैं हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं और आपने इस पर्यावरण जागरूकता के इस महायज्ञ में अपने उद्बोधन की आहुति से इसे सिंचित किया है अलंकृत किया है परिवर्धित किया है मैं मानता हूं कि आप जैसे विद्वानों के विचारों से इस मंच से जुड़े हुए समस्त प्रतिभागी निश्चित रूप से लाभान्वित हुए हैं हो रहे हैं और होंगे मैं अभी पहुंचा था यहाँ डॉक्टर शशि वर्मा जी का भाषण चल रहा तो धन्यवाद शशि जी पॉलिटिकल साइंस की प्रोफेसर है तो जाहिर है वक्ता तो है ही आप और वक्तव्य भी सुंदर था आपके लिए बहुत बहुत बधाई कि आप सभी ने हमारे लिए समय निकाल रहे हैं और निकालोगे आगे ऐसी मैं उम्मीद करता हूँ उन्हें आप सभी को मेरी और मेरे महाविद्यालय परिवार की ओर से हार्दिक शुभकामनाएं जय हिंद जय भारत Thank you so much, sir, for your support. We value the insight and guidance you provide to all of us, and your words of encouragement keeps us motivated throughout. And your presence is very, very important to us. Adani Principal Sahab, I want to tell you that our college, you are the first one to get the Ojaswi, Bodhi, and Dynamic Principal. Thank you. आपका ज्ञान और अनुभव हमारा मार्गदर्शन करता है और हमें आगे और कुछ बेहतर करने के लिए और अच्छा बनने के लिए बहुत प्रेरित करता है आप एक फिलॉसफी पे चलते हैं आप ये कहते हैं 
कि मेरा अनुसरण मत करिए पर और अच्छे बनिए और मेरे जैसे बनिए हम आपको इस चीज के लिए प्रॉमिस करते हैं कि हम ऐसा ही कर रहे हैं और आगे भी हम करते रहेंगे और आपके बिना ये प्रशिक्षण कभी भी नहीं हो सकता था हम आपका आशीर्वाद मानते हैं और हम आशा करते हैं आप हमेशा हमेशा हमारे साथ रहेंगे सो नाउ इट्स टाइम फॉर अनदर की नोट एड्रेस विच इज टू बी डिलीवर्ड बाय डॉक्टर रितु श्रीवास्तव which is the 24 uh, 25th keynote address of the ISTPP2 Dr Shivastav is currently working as an assistant professor of economics international business and deputy director of teaching and learning at SP Jain School of Global Management Mumbai Dubai Singapore Sydney she is an academician with a teaching and research experience of 19 years in management education with leading b schools like villa institute of management technology lal bahadur shastri institute of management and development asia pacific institute of management and currently employed with sp jain school of global management she is the deputy director of teaching and learning quality uh, and learning quality department in her current role she is also handling the responsibility of training faculty for online delivery across the programs being offered at by spj she act as a personalized learning champion to improve the student engagement for undergraduate courses she has completed her phd from department of management studies university of lucknow in 2015 and a masters in international business management from department of applied economics university of lucknow in 2003 she is net qualified and uh, in management studied and has a rank holder all through her academic life she has been trained in port operations in international business by port authorities of colombo she has gone for a faculty exchange to university of poitiers france in the year 2013 she has been the recipient of um, eremus mobility grant in 2018 and attended internationalization programs at university of Kozmanski Poland she has authored several publications in national and international peer reviewed journals her main areas of academic interest are international economics public policy and international trade she has presented her research at several international conferences organized by iim ahmedabad iim kozhikode iimt ghaziabad etc thank you so much uh, dr shivastav aapka bahut bahut swagat hai abhinandan hai With lot of gratitude and respect, I would request you to start with your keynote address. So it's Dr. Shivastav. Thank you, Dr. Mamta. Am I audible clearly? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Thank you for all the details that you told about me, and uh, I feel honored to be invited by you and your esteemed college and this great initiative uh, that you are taking. Uh, so i will just share a few things which i would like to kind of highlight in this conference uh, may i just share my presentation now yes ma'am so is it clearly visible can you see uh, right now we can't ma'am okay i've already shared Ma'am, it's not visible to us. Okay, I'll just stop sharing and share again. Okay. Yes, okay. it's showing an error occurred. I'll just share again. Is it now visible? No, ma'am, it's not. Yes, ma'am, now it is. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Thank you for telling me. okay so today uh, i think i have this burden of being the last speaker and uh, people have had an interesting day so i would just like to highlight few points and possibly you can end the day with these thoughts uh, my field is international economics i come from the area of economics and uh, there's a growing field in the economics domain which is environmental economics wherein uh, a lot of focus is being given to economic growth and uh, you know preserving the environment or uh, focusing on sustainability so today i am just going to share a few things uh, a few areas 
which are being studied and researched upon. And possibly it is the link between uh, the zoology, biodiversity, sustainability, and economics. So going forward, I think you know there is uh, there is a breed of economists called as ecological economists, which regard the human economic systems as subsystems of the biosphere. So we are also introducing a new system here, which is the economic system as a subsystem of the biosphere, considering it integral to how the biosphere, uh, you know, uh, survives, blossoms and sustains. If I'll just give a background of what economics is. I'm sure everybody knows about it. But economics is concerned about production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services, which are to satisfy the needs and demands of people. They talk about markets, wherein buyers and sellers meet, price is determined, and there is a supply and demand force, which uh, leads to this kind of interaction. So when we are going to talk about economic subsystems in the biosphere, we are going to talk about inputs and outputs, which are finally consumed by uh, the people, right? And inputs would require something from the biosphere. And then economics will make it possible that, you know, there is production and then there is distribution for onward consumption. Now, so to, you know, to go back to the same logic, in an economic system, inputs are required, as I said, for production and consumption, onward consumption. And these resources are coming from the biosphere. So the first one is, uh, so these resources are supporting the economic system. The first one is the natural capital. The na so in, uh, you know, let's not get, uh, bogged down by the word capital, right? So capital, I'm looking at it as a resource. So capital is not uh, money or, you know, those things, funding, no. I'm looking at capital as a resource, as an input. So when I look at natural capital, it is all things raw material, natural environment based, which is being used by the economic system. Second is the human capital, which is, uh, you know, our skills, our experience, our efforts. And then, of course, there is a manufactured capital also, which means the machinery and the infrastructure, which is required by the economic systems. And the last, which can also be clubbed with human capital, is the social capital, right? So this is about networks, ties. So I think the last speaker, uh, Dr. Sharma, was talking about how, you know, uh, there is this network between China and India, and there is trade. So there is a huge, you know, there is a economic system, not only within a country, but across countries. And that is how, you know, it is, uh, it is part of the biosphere, right? So we have natural capital, human capital, plus social capital, and manufactured capital, which is supporting these economic systems. This is just a diagrammatic representation of the same. We have the uh, manuf the natural capital coming from Mother Earth. Then we have the manufactured capital, which I said was plant and machinery. We have our skills, networks, communities. And as a result of it, we produce uh, goods and services which are distributed and then ultimately consumed. So the, the biosphere is intricately linked to the economic systems in nations, across nations. And if I look at the throughput of an economy, I mean, you know, what comes in and what goes out, the IO kind of a table, input output table, and specifically when I look from the environment, what comes and what goes, I would say that a very high quality energy uh, comes into the economic systems, whether it is, you know, in terms of power, in terms of fuel, then there's a high quality matter that comes. Like I said, there can be natural inputs, natural resources. And when the system, the economic system, and it processes it, and the system is based on not conservation, it is, you know, a high waste economy.
kind of a system, what it leads to is waste and pollution as output into the environment and other emissions which are low quality forms of energy like you know heat ozone particulate matter so on and so forth so somewhere if we look at you know the 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 blue box it has to improve so that you know the system of input and output is handled better and leads to a more sustainable kind of a economy now of course uh, when we talk about environmental economics it's going to take the middle ground it is not entirely saying that you know economic growth is not required and it is not totally on the side of the ecologists that kind of uh, say that economic growth is bad or the uh, economics who say that uh, conserving environment is not important no environmental economics takes some middle ground and when it takes a middle ground it discourages some form of economic growth which are not environmentally sustainable so the key goal is to make an environmental sustainable economy which we are going to call as the eco economy and hence we are recognizing that there is an economic importance of natural resources and environment as well moving forward so you know just to put everything down here some of the things which might be uh, which might which we might have to tackle if you want to move from a high waste economy into a sustainable eco economy is the fact that out of this economic system that we see here we are just getting goods and services which will be consumed but there are other things which are also emerging as outputs which are the cause of concern and rightfully so we are all deliberating today on them and uh, we are all adding our view points on to how it as to how it can be better managed so if we see there's heat there's depletion there's degradation there's waste which is very difficult to recycle so of course the importance of this cannot be over emphasized as of now and i come back to uh, some uh, you know some relationships in economic theory that can uh, that have uh, also established this problem so there is this environmental kuznets curve which describes the relationship between the economic uh, you know growth which we measure as gdp per capita this is the rate of economic growth simply put you can look at it like that and then on the other axis if you see this is the environmental damage so this is something which has been kuznets was uh, an economist and uh, you know when this uh, most of you might have heard about gdp uh, so when gdp as an economic indicator was being developed as to how we measure whether economic growth is happening whether nations are progressing or not so then gdp was being developed as a measure at that time kuznet was also in the same team and then he was uh, you know also investigating whether economic growth will damage environment will have a bad effect on environmental quality but at that point of time it did not uh, you know materialize and his work came out much later than gdp and gdp became very very popular as a measure of economic growth and gdp doesn't take into account any kind of environmental damage which economic growth does to nations and to the earth so uh, when kuznets started working on this relationship economic growth and you know nations getting rich wealthy uh, your previous speaker was talking about international trade so all of that is part of economic growth right and he he found out that this relationship is is of inverted u shape which means that you know as economic growth you know if we move along the x axis the environmental damage increases right and it increases it it increases and reaches a maxima after that when you progress as a nation which means you become richer as a nation your average income increases as a nation the environmental damage starts coming down right it increases environmental quality increases 
So I'll just explain this shape in a bit more detail because post that we are going to discuss, you know, what economists propose in, you know, as an eco economy. So when I when I look at this inverted U shape, uh, it says that you know at low incomes, you know, so when we are at the starting of the x-axis, and we as we are progressing in economic growth, the environmental damage is also increasing. So what happens, you know, when nations have limited income, limited means? We can take our own examples, right? So when we there is a struggle to survive. There's a struggle to below to rise above the poverty line. I don't think any nation, any individual, any firm would uh, look at pollution abatement, right? They would not bother about environmental damage. So that's something which is neglected, ignored, even undesirable. So you know we are looking at satisfying our basic consumption needs, and that is ignored totally. As our level of income increases. Then, of course, you know, and uh, we start becoming better off as individuals, as households, as nations. We realize that there is a trade-off between consumption and quality. Now, what does this trade-off mean? It means if you want to consume more, there will be, you know, uh, some some harm, something which you're doing to the environment, right? So you become, you develop an awareness. As a firm, as a nation, as a as a policymaker, and then you start taking measures which results in uh, lowering the rate of environmental damage, and of course you grow on in terms of economic income. We will see that you start spending. You the government forces the firm to adopt cleaner technologies to spend on pollution abatement. And environmental quality begins to improve alongside economic growth, and so if we see alongside, uh, you know, several nations which differ in terms of, uh, you know, uh, economic prosperity, you will see that more prosperous nations or uh, highly developed nations would be spending definitely more on pollution abatement. Their consciousness will be high, and they would want to, uh, you know. There will be a better effort to improve environmental quality alongside economic growth. Now, this is a purely economic viewpoint. I am discounting the politics and all of the other things that go alongside it. But this is how we can explain the environmental Kuznets curve. So, this is what we should be expecting of nations as we grow in terms of as we make economic progress. We should try and reach that point after which. We start taking measures that environmental quality increases or environmental damage is reduced. Now, based on this, based on this Kuznets curve, there are these three views on how the economy and the environment relationship exists. Because I'm think I, I, I'm sure you're all are scholars and you know that any work is uh, researched and then there are extensions of it. There are people who Kind of uh, try and modify it, adapt it. So there are three very popular, uh, you know, uh, views on this economic progress and environmental damage relationship. So I'll just present quickly three. The first is the limits theory. Now, what does this limits theory tell us? It tells us that, uh, you know. There's a possibility of breaching environmental thresholds before the economy reaches the EKC turning point. Now, what is this EKC turning point? This is the point, the EKC, the environmental Kuznets curve, that is EKC, and it turns after it reaches a maxima, and there is a GDP per capita, which is the which is the related turning point. So once you reach that level of prosperity, after that, uh, you will no longer do more of environmental damage but the limits theory says that it may actually you know um, it may be very catastrophic because uh, are we going to wait till that point that the nations become so prosperous that now they start looking at increasing environmental quality and you know reducing environmental damage we might have breached several environmental thresholds still that point. 
so for example you know uh, it might it might be for example what is mentioned here in the red it says that in the context of biodiversity uh, maybe you know you might after you've reached a certain level of economic progress you might spend more on maintaining species diversity but the species that have become extinct before it can you actually recreate them you've already breached that environmental threshold you have solely focused on economic growth up till a point and you have risked certain environmental outcomes which are very very counterproductive so how do we decide you know we know economic progress has a limit there's an ekc turning point but how do we decide how much damage is sustainable right so this is this is a problem with this curve as has been uh, pointed out by many scholars most famously by arrow et al in 1996 the second uh, the second view point is of uh, the new toxic views which now if you see this diagram it says nothing like this happens uh, you know it is totally against what kuznet says that you know once the gdp grows the environmental damage also grows so this is pop this this view point was popularized by davidson and he says that you know there might be you know in order to explain what kuznet said he said there might be a, a reduction in emissions of existing pollutants but you are becoming prosperous you are using new technologies you are doing new types of manufacturing new gadgets are coming up so what is happening new pollutants will substitute the previous pollutants and the overall environmental damage will not come down it will continue to grow so this is another very you know uh, antithetical view of the economic theory as proposed by kuznet now the third one as stern says he says that yes uh, there will be a plateauing of environmental damage as economic growth happens and that is because you know uh, we will start he believes what kuznet says he says that it might not come down drastically but it will plateau down and there will be a reduction uh, in terms of pollutants there will be reduction in terms of damage and then the, what he points out is something which is very very uh, practical he says you going to outsource polluting activities to poorer nations so the rich nations will outsource polluting um air production uh, and you know harmful effluent waste treatments all of those kind of uh, production activities to poorer countries and the net effect is uh, actually a non improving situation this is what he says because uh, collectively it might not yield as much uh, you know uh, result as it should because you have made economic progress so it may plateau down or actually it is, he says it will be a race to bottom which means that uh, we are not going to improve in terms of environmental uh, quality air quality water quality and all of those indicators so these are three important view points and uh, any questions by the way any questions okay right so i will just proceed now so when i look at the drivers of the economy environment relationship uh, these are you know the three generic drivers which are proposed number one is of course we have discussed the first one in great detail which is economic progress and environmental damage so most of the scholars now believe that as the economic progress is going ahead this is the scale effect scale effect means you produce more you consume more there's more of industrial activity the environmental damage increases the second effect is the composition effect this is very interesting this this effect says that as we move from you know uh, delivering as we move from production based economy to services based economy if you look at india we are actually a quite a services based economy because that is what we export to the rest of the world now we are trying to become more atmanirbhar establish more production facilities as china and so on so this view point says as we move from production to services probably we might uh, lessen the damage to the environment but if we are 
uh, now with india we are going the other way around we might not uh, actually reduce any kind of damage the third one is the technical effect now this is supposed to reduce environmental damage so we are assuming that with more uh, gdp per capita we'll be we'll acquire more skills with a lot of innovation and r and d we will come up with technologies which will reduce the environmental damage so economic growth will have a scale effect will have a composition effect and will have a technical effect and that will also they will all come together and have an impact on the environmental uh, damage and uh, i would just like to now uh, you know talk about a very uh, important publication that comes from oecd which is organization of economic cooperation and development so they 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 have a center and they do continuous research on this how increasing economic activity leads to increased energy demand and with this in a increased energy demand what is the impact on pollution and i would like to talk here just as a case study as an example i have picked up uh, outdoor air pollution so uh, this is a small part of the 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 reports that they publish continuously and uh, here is an example as to how outdoor air pollution caused by increased economic activity or unsustainable economic activity is you know is responsible for uh, premature deaths a uh, lot of hospital expenses health risks and all of this are cost to the nations so the annual global welfare cost associated with premature deaths from outdoor air pollution so it is you know what we are trying to measure is how is the air pollution increasing from economic activities and what impact it has on certain things like health risks premature deaths and uh, if we wanted to prevent it then how much money we would have to pay for it so that is the welfare cost associated to prevent actually the premature deaths and we can see actually it's a sad state of affairs because um, in 2015 it was just 3 trillion and we are projecting it to reach 18 to 25 trillion by 2060 given the current pace of increase in air pollution similarly if we look at the figures for uh, welfare associated with reducing health risks it's going to go up from 2.2 trillion to almost sorry 3 300 billion to 2.2 uh, trillion so what is happening is that these uh, bad impacts you know say air pollution that we have picked up it's got an economic costs if we want to reduce it it's going to cost us this much if we want to reduce the mortality associated with it it's going to cost us 18 to 25 trillion by 2060 if we want to reduce the health impact health risks it's going to cost us 2.2 trillion so actually what is happening is there's a cost associated to whatever we are doing and that cost is being paid by the society by the governments by people who are not actually responsible for these kind of air pollutions so this is this is the flow chart that i'm talking about economic activity leads to emissions concentrations biophysical impact and there is an economic uh, cost associated with it right so there's a biophysical impact i'm not going into it they have measured into many things you know ozones loss working days uh, impact on agricultural productivity labor productivity migrations and so on so all of it results in an economic cost and this organization is continuously measuring these economic costs to tell the speak you know to to voice it as a major concern to all the policy global policy makers and they have a model which they you know they they use to create and these are some of the costs as i am talking about for outdoor air pollution um, these are non market costs these are market costs so probably you might not understand the distinction but it's okay these are just costs only so mortality is a big cost uh, i think it's very difficult to put it in compensatory words but mortality is there uh, health expenditures labor productivity 
uh, agricultural yields, uh, illnesses, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of costs associated, and uh, these these are certain data uh, which are uh, because these are premature deaths on account of exposure to particulate matter and ozone. You can see India. Uh, this is the projection. The red ones are the projections for 2060. The green ones are uh, again projections, but they are non-linear, and these are linear. So the difference between linear and non-linear are that if we just extrapolate uh, using unitary method, or we look at different scenarios, but in any case, they are really high, right? So same is the case for China, same is the case for India. And so we are sitting at a big problem, which we need to solve. My last section of presentation is on uh, what kind of, so we know, we understand the problem, but then what about the solutions? Well, how we can use economic tools to deal with these environmental problems? And uh, of course, the first step is to use the resources more sustainably. So that, you know, how do you use the resource more sustainably? When you ask the consumer and the supplier to pay for these costs, right? While they are transacting for the products. And of course, subsidizing environmentally beneficial and removing subsidies from those processes that are non-environmentally beneficial, taxing pollution, waste, and very important to reduce poverty. So once we do economic progress, then we have surplus resources to think about how to deal with environmental damage. So as I told you, we have to use these costs, the costs that I was talking about, the costs for hospital expenses, the health risks, the reduced labor productivity, all of these hidden costs should be incorporated in the price of the products because people should pay for what they're doing to the environment. And so this is, this is actually very difficult because companies might lose clients, but then this is something which has to be managed by the government to some extent they should go for cleaner technologies or pass on the hidden costs to the consumers or bear them themselves. Then, of course, is the second method in which nations should not look at their progress only in terms of GDP, but also in terms of other green indicators like genuine progress indicator. So this is a new indicator. Kuznets and Clifford later worked on it and they came up with genuine progress indicator which measures environmental well-being. I'm not going into much details because many of you might not be interested, but G G genuine progress indicator is actually, you know, trying to uh, look at the harmful environmental and social costs also. Imagine if we have a national income and we try to reduce all those, uh, the environmental harmful social costs, this number is going to come down. So nations have to be ready for it. They have to be more, uh, you know, we, we need to look at that beyond GDP. And, you know, these are many other things. So uh, I'll just highlight, say, so for example, S is uh, negatively impacting social capital. N is something which negatively impacts natural capital. So these are the things that we started with in our presentation, social capital, natural capital, manufactured capital. So those things, if they are getting harmed, we need to include them and then we need to subtract all of them for, from the GDP, right? And then arrive at a genuine progress indicator. And then, of course, uh, it has to be environmentally honest kind of a market system. Uh, it should not be that, you know, we have no ethics in businesses and uh, we are, harm we are you know, we, are, we, we turn out to be a harmful producer for the environment. So those things have to be built in. And then, of course, harmful subsidies have to be phased out environmental beneficial subsidies have to be brought in. And uh, of course, uh, you know, before we end, I would just like to talk about few trade-offs that we face. So if you put a tax and say it's an environmental tax, what happens is uh, we actually uh, make the lower income groups out of the, you know, out of the consumer basket. So they can't, they can't consume that product because it becomes costly, right? And then, of course, businesses uh, should be encouraged actually to develop technologies rather than put the tax on the consumer. So there are varying viewpoints, right, 
on environmental taxes and fees. Generally, people think it is government's responsibility to use the revenue to kind of uh, improve the quality of the environment, but it is not fairly used. And uh, even if we tax people and take that tax money, that will not exactly be uh, targeted and allocated to uh, you know improving environmental quality. So there are many ifs and buts there. And so green taxes are always, there's a lot of uh, discussion on that. And then of course we can have command and control telling companies, okay, you cannot operate unless and until you have clean technology. Or what we have, you know, is uh, ask them to buy uh, carbon credits from, uh, you know, different countries. Uh, like we have tradable pollution permits in UK and US. So they might be polluting more, but they buy this right to pollution from those companies that are polluting less. So they buy these rights and they manage uh, the company laws. So that is how it is. And uh, I would just, I think uh, these are more details on tradable environmental permits, which if you are interested, you can read through it. And with this, I think uh, I'd like to come to a close of my presentation. And we can, one last bit of point is that, you know, we can move from material flow economy to a service flow economy. So we can go for eco leasings and many other things rather than actually, uh, you know, wastefully use the uh, inputs. I think I'll just close with that. And uh, any questions would be happy to take them. If any questions, please raise your hand so we can unmute you from here. If any questions. There are no questions, but a lot of appreciation. So now, if no questions, it's time to formally thank Dr. Shivastav. On the behalf of our entire team of ISTTP2, I would like to express our gratitude to you for such an elaborated talk. Your talk was not only extremely informative, but also kept everyone entertained in their seats. The size of participation during your, during your talk is testimony to how thrilled everyone was to listen to your speech, ma'am. We sincerely appreciate you for taking out time from your busy schedule to provide us with such a valuable information. All thanks to your support, ma'am. I wish you a great luck with all your future projects and look forward to meeting you again. We really Thank appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Mamta, for inviting me. And uh, uh, thank you all the participants for being such a patient listener. This being the last session, I can understand. Uh, but I hopefully have added some value and uh, yes, you you know, have. generated some thoughts in the participants' mind. Thank you once again for calling me. Thank you so much. Man, still we have nearly 210 people while you were talking from 26 countries. So uh, your talk was definitely informative and it has added value to our knowledge. No wonder. Thank so, you. So uh, I'll, I'll take your leave. Yeah, ma'am. Please, yeah, please. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. So with this, we come to an end of uh, sixth day of uh, ISTTP2. Muskan, I would request if you can circulate the feedback link. One of the first condition of happiness is that the link between men and nature shall not be broken. Leo Tolstoy said this, and um, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the speakers who all were very learned and knowledgeable scientists of their field, and they have spared their valuable time to be with us here in this training program. I would like to tell all the speakers that we, the organizers, and all the participants are very happy and delighted to have you here with us. And I hope you all had a wonderful time too. The feedback link has already been circulated, and I request everyone to please fill it because your critical views are very, very important to us for improving our training program. With this, this is Dr. Mamta Sharma, Organizing Secretary of ISTTP2, along with my team, Muskan Data and Sheetal Gupta. Along with my patron and principal, Dr. Hukam Singh Ji, is signing off from the campus of RRC Alwar. And we will see you tomorrow. That is the last day of our program, the seventh one, again at 11 a.m. Indian Standard Time, with new speakers, with new bouquet of knowledge. So stay tuned. 
I see you tomorrow sharp at 11. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. And you all have been a wonderful.